Talmud, Mos Bekorot, A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R, I Mishnah, an Israelite who buys an embryo of an ass belonging to a heathen or who sells one to him although this is not permitted or who forms a partnership with him or who receives an animal from him to look after or who gives his ass to him to look after is exempt from the law of the firstling for it says I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel but not in Gentiles Gemara what need is there for all these cases mentioned in the Mishnah. It is necessary to state all these cases for if it taught only the case of he who buys etc. I might have thought the reason was because he brings it the animal into the state of holiness but where he sells to a heathen since he releases it from holiness he should be punished he accordingly states the second case who sells etc. What need is there for the statement or who forms a partnership with him it is to exclude the ruling of our Judah who said a partnership with a heathen is subject to. The law of the firstborn the mission accordingly informs us that a partnership with a heathen exempts the Israelite from the duty of the firstborn what need is there for the case or an Israelite who receives etc. It is necessary because the mission which is to teach the next case or an Israelite who gives his ass to him to look after and what need is there to state the latter case itself or an Israelite who gives etc. It is necessary you might be inclined to assume that since. The animal itself belongs to the Israelite we should punish him lest one come to confuse this with another animal the mission accordingly informs us that we have no such fear we have learned elsewhere our Judah permits the selling to a heathen of a maimed animal band but there are permits the selling of a horse the question was asked what is our Judah's ruling on selling an embryo to a heathen is the reason of our Judah for allowing in that case because the animal is maimed and therefore an embryo also. Being incapable of work is on a PAR with a maimed animal or is the reason perhaps because a maimed animal is not a frequent occurrence but a case of an embryo being a frequent occurrence is unlike the case of a maimed animal come and here or who sells an embryo to him although he is not permitted and our Judah does not contest this but according to your argument in the cases mentioned in the Mishnah or who forms a partnership or who receives from him or who gives him where the Mishnah does not expressly state that our Judah differs is it really the fact that he does not differ you must admit that he does differ without the Mishnah saying so similarly here also he differs without the Mishnah saying so come and here our Judah says if one received an animal from a heathen to look after and it gave birth to a firstling we settle with the Gentile partner for what it is worth and half of its value is given to the priest or if an Israelite gives an animal to him a heathen to look after although he is not permitted we punish him by compelling him to redeem the animal even up to ten times its value and he gives its whole value to the priest Talmud Mos Bekorot now does this not refer to the case of an embryo no it refers to the animal but it does not say damn its value redeem ha but does it not say and he gives its whole value to the priest now if the words its value refer to the animal what has the priest to do with it no we are dealing here with a case where E.G. and Israelite gave him a pregnant animal to fatten since we punish him for selling the animal to a Gentile we also punish him for selling an embryo said Arashi come and here our Judah permits the selling of a maimed animal because it cannot be cured but if it could be cured it would be forbidden now is not an embryo also like an animal which can be cured deduce therefore from this that it is forbidden to sell an embryo to a heathen according to our Judah some there are who referred our Judah's ruling on an embryo to our Mishnah and who sells an embryo to him even although he is not permitted may we say that the Mishnah is not in agreement with our Judah for we have learned our Judah permits the selling of a maimed animal you can even say that the Mishnah agrees with our Judah for the case of a maimed animal is not a frequent occurrence whereas the case of an embryo is a frequent occurrence come and here our Judah says if one received an animal from a even to look after and it gave birth to a firstling we settle with the Gentile partner for what it is worth and half of its value is given to the priest or if an Israelite gives an animal to him to look after although he is not permitted to do so we punish him by making him redeem the animal even up to ten times its value and he gives its whole value to the priest now does this not refer to the case of an embryo no it refers to the animal but does it not say damn its value redeem ha but does it not say and he gives its whole value to the priest now if the words its value refer to the animal what has the priest to do with it we are dealing here with a case where e.g. an Israelite gave him a pregnant animal to fatten and since we punish him for selling the animal to a Gentile we also punish him for selling an embryo said our come and here our Judah permits the selling of a maimed animal because it cannot be cured but if it could be cured it would be Forbidden and an embryo is on a PAR with an animal that can be cured deduce therefore from this that according to our Judah it is not allowed to sell an embryo to a heathen the following query was put forward if one sold an animal for its future offspring to a Gentile what is the ruling you can put this question to our Judah and you can put this query to the rabbis you can put the query to our Judah thus are we to say that our Judah only permits the case of a maimed animal because he did. Israelite will not come to confuse it with another animal and sell it to a heathen but in the case of a whole animal where he may confuse it with another he will say that it is forbidden or are we to say that perhaps if in the case of a maimed animal where he severs all connection with it it is allowed how much more so in the case of a whole animal where he has not severed all connection with it you can put this query to the rabbis thus are we to say that the rabbis only prohibit in the case of a maimed animal because he severs all connection with it but in the case of a whole animal where he does not sever his connection from the animal it is permissible or are we perhaps to say that if in the case of a maimed animal where he will not come to confuse it with another animal they forbid the selling to a heathen how much more so in the case of a whole animal is there the fear of confusion but is the reason of the rabbis because of what is stated here has it not been taught that the rabbi said to our Judah is it not possible to couple an animal with a broken foot so that it gives birth consequently the reason is on account of the future offspring this is what the rabbi said to our Judah our reason why we forbid the selling of a maimed animal is because he may come to confuse it with another animal but as for you why do you permit a maimed animal it is because it cannot be cured and therefore it is as if he had sold it to be slaughtered but do we not couple it and it gives birth and since we couple it and it gives birth he will detain it and thereupon he replied to them when it gives birth for in fact it cannot take a male for coupling purposes come and here or an Israelite who gives his ass to him a heathen to look after and it does not say although he is not permitted but according to your argument when it says or who forms a partnership with him since it does not say it is forbidden are we to infer that it is allowed as not the father of Samuel said one must not form a partnership with a heathen lest he the heathen will be bound to take an oath to him and he will swear in the name of his idol and the Torah says and make no mention of the name of other gods neither let it be heard out of thy mouth you must therefore admit that when the mission lays down that selling to a heathen is forbidden the same ruling applies to a partnership with a heathen likewise here also when the mission lays down that selling is prohibited the same ruling applies to Kabbalah why then does the mission cite the prohibition specifically in connection with selling because the main prohibition refers to the selling come and here our Judah said if one receives an animal from a heathen to look after and it gives birth to a firstborn we settle with the Gentile partner for what it is worth and half of its value is given to the priest if again an Israelite gives an animal to a heathen to look after although he knows that this is not permitted we find him even up to ten times its value and he gives its whole value to the priest but the sages say so long a Gentile has a share in it it is exempt from the law of the firstborn Talmud Mos Bekorot and now does not this statement deal with the case of the animal no it deals with the case of an embryo I can also prove this from the wording for it says we find him up to ten times its value from which you may deduce that it refers to the embryo the ruling that we punish him for selling to a Gentile supports the view of Resh Lakish for Resh Lakish said if one sells large cattle to a heathen we punish him by forcing him to redeem the animal even up to ten times its value does Resh Lakish mean exactly ten times or not come and here for our Joshua B. Levi said if one sells a slave to a heathen we punish him by forcing him to redeem the slave even up to a hundred times his value the case of a slave is different for every day he is Gentile master prevents him from carrying out religious duties another version of this argument is said Resh Lakish if one sells large cattle to a heathen we punish him by forcing him to redeem the animal even up to one hundred times its value but we have learned in a mission or if an Israelite gives an animal to him a heathen to look after although he is not permitted we punish him by forcing him to redeem the animal even up to ten times its
whatsoever of the firstborn belongs to the Israelite it is subject to the law of the firstling or if you prefer I may say that all the authorities understand that the word firstborn denotes a larger part of the animal one master however holds that the purport of the word all is to add while the other master holds that it is to diminish and how much must a Gentile share be to exempt the animal from the law of the firstborn said Arhu not even if it is no more than a bit. Firstlings ears are nom and demurred. let him the priest say to him the Gentile take your portion of the ear and go it was stated Arhista said that even share in the animal must be something which renders an animal nibble Rabbah said that even share in the animal must be something which renders it trifle what is the point at issue between them whether a trifle can live he who says that the Gentile share in the animal must be something which renders it trifle would maintain. That a trifle cannot live whereas he who says the Gentile share must be something which renders the animal nibble but a trifle he would maintain that it is able to live the Rabbi said in the presence of our Papa the ruling of Arhuna on the one hand and the rulings of Arhista and Rabbah on the other do not differ the one Arhunas relates to it the firstborn the other the rulings of Arhista and Rabbah relate to the mother said our Papa to them the Rabbis why is there this ruling in? Connection with the firstborn presumably because we require the condition of all of the firstborn and it is not found here in connection with its mother also we require the condition specified in the verse and of all that cattle thou shalt sanctify the males which is not found here but there is in fact no difference mar the son of our ashi demurred why should this be different from the premature first births of animals which although they are not viable are sacred for a master said it. Words and every firstling that is a male which thou hast coming from an animal shall be the lord's denote the photos which dwells in the animal there since there is no mixture of an unconsecrated part of the animal we apply to it the words in the animal all the firstborn here however since there is a mixture of the unconsecrated part of the animal we do not read concerning it the words all the firstborn our Eliezer once did not attend the house of study he came across our sea and asked. And what did the rabbi say in the house of study? He replied, Talmud, Mosbek or Opibus did our Yohanan say, even if the heathen share in the firstling was only something constituting a slight blemish, and as to what we have learned, a you which gave birth to a species of a goat, or a goat which gave birth to a species of a you is exempt from the duty of the firstling, but if the offspring possessed some feature similar to the mother, it is subject to the law of the firstling thereon. Are. Yohanan commented that this means that it is like a firstling with a permanent blemish on account of which it is slaughtered. We well understand our Yohanan laying down a ruling with reference to a slight blemish, for this informs us that the law is according to our Huna and excludes the rulings of our Hista and Rabba, but his ruling regarding a permanent blemish, what new thing does he teach us there with? Is it to inform us that since it the animal is abnormal, this is regarded as a blemish, surely? We have already learned this ruling in a mission or if the firstling's mouth is like a pig it is a blemish and should you argue that in the mission just cited the firstling has changed into a species of animal in which the sanctity of the firstling does not exist but here the firstling has changed into a species of animal in which the sanctity of the firstling does exist this too we have learned if one of its eyes is large and one is small it is a blemish and a tan taught that large means large like a calf's and small small like that of a goose now we may giant your argument as far as the case of the firstling with a small eye like a goose is concerned this being a species in which the sanctity of the firstling does not exist but in the case of a large eye like a calf's this is a species in which the sanctity of the firstling does exist must you not therefore admit that the reason is that we say since the animal is abnormal it is regarded as a blemish no the reason is because it is a sarah this really also stands to reason for we have learned the above mentioned blemishes whether permanent or transitory make also human beings unfit for the priesthood to these must be added in the case of blemishes of human beings too large eyes or too small eyes because with reference only to human beings it is written whatsoever man of the seed of Aaron requiring man among the seed of Aaron to be with normal human features but the case of an animal too large or too small eyes is not also regarded as a blemish now in the case of an animal with one large or one small eye what is the reason why it is a blemish if because of the abnormality then the same should apply to an animal with two large eyes or two small eyes then must you not admit that the reason in the former case is because of sarah no i can indeed still say that the reason why an animal with one large and one small eye is blemished is because of the abnormality and as for your question that the same ruling should apply to the case of an animal with two large and two small eyes the answer is that there in the latter instance if the change is because of the animal's extra obesity the two eyes need to be large and if because of its unusual leanness then both eyes have to be lean small there was a woman proselyte to whom the Aki gave an animal to fatten she came before Rabbah he said to her there is no authority that pays any attention to the ruling of our Judah who said the partnership of a heathen in an animal is subject to the law of the firstling our Mari Birahel possessed a herd of animals he used to transfer to a heathen possession of the ears of the firstlings while still in the womb he nevertheless forbade the shearing and the working of the animals and gave them to the priests the herd of our Mari Birahel died now since he forbade the shearing and the working of the animals and gave them to the priests why did he give a heathen possession of the ears of the firstlings it was lest he should be led to commit an offensive so why did the herd of Armari die because he deprived them of their holiness but has not Rab Judah said one is permitted to make a blemish in a firstling before it comes into the world there in the latter case he deprives the animal of the holiness of being sacrificed on the altar but he does not deprive it of the holiness of belonging to the priests but in the former case he even deprives it of it. Holiness of belonging to the priests or if you prefer I may say that Armari Birahel knew how to make a valid transfer to a heathen but we are afraid that another man may see this and go and do likewise thinking that Armari did nothing significant when transferring to a heathen and thus he will be led to commit an offense mission of priests and Levites are exempt of Forshiori if they exempted the firstborn belonging to the Israelites in the wilderness it follows of Forshiori that they should. Exempt their own Talmud, Mosbek or Gemara did they themselves exempt surely a man a Levite exempted a man a firstborn Israelite an animal of a Levite exempted an animal an Israelite's firstborn as for it is written take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle said Abbe the Mishnah means this as for priests and Levites their animals are exempt of Forshiori if the animal the sheep of it. Levites release the animal of the Israelites in the wilderness it follows a Forshiori that it should release their own said Rabbah to him but does not the Mishnah say they exempt meaning the Levites themselves and further if it is as you state that the Levites should be exempted even from liabilities for a clean animal why have we learned that the Levites are not exempted from the law of the firstling of a clean animal only from the redemption of the firstborn male and the first birth of and as no said Rabbah the mission must be read thus priests and levites exempt themselves from the redemption of the firstborn of Forshiori if the holiness of the non-firstborn levites cancelled the holiness of the firstborn Israelite in the wilderness should it not cancel that of their own firstborn we thus find that man the Levite firstborn is exempt whence do we know that this also applies to an unclean animal the text says how be it the firstborn of man shalt thou surely redeem and the firstling of unclean beasts shalt thou redeem whosoever is required to redeem the firstborn of a man is required to redeem the firstling of an unclean animal but whosoever is not required to redeem the firstborn of a man is not required to redeem the firstling of an unclean animal said our Safra to Abbe according to your interpretation which is that the Forshiori argument also refers to their the levites animals a Levite who had a sheep in the wilderness to release a Firstborn of an Israelite ask could ipso facto release his own but he who did not possess a sheep to release a firstborn of an Israelite ask could not release his own further both according to your interpretation and Rob is a Levite of a month old who released an Israelite firstborn of a month old in the wilderness should therefore release himself from the necessity of redemption while a Levite firstborn less than a month old who did not release a firstborn Israelite of it. Same age should not therefore be able to release himself also a Levite's daughter who gave birth to a firstborn should not be exempt from redemption why then did our Adabi Ahab say if a Levite's daughter married to an Israelite gave birth her son is exempt from the five cells that is no objection as Mar the son of our Joseph explained in the name of Rabbah who said scripture says Peter Rehem the opening of the womb the divine law makes the duty of the firstborn depend on the opening. Of the womb, but what of Aaron,
Wilderness, but it may be objected that the case of money is different because with it we also redeem consecrated objects and the second year's tithing rather we deduce from the following scripture said nevertheless the firstborn of man thou shalt surely redeem and the firstling of unclean beasts shalt thou redeem just as in the case of the firstborn of a man you make no distinction between all time and that particular time in the wilderness the redemption in each case being with money. So in the case of an unclean animal you shall not make a distinction between for all time and that particular time the redemption in each case being with a sheep Arhanan has said one sheep of a Levite exempted many firstborn of the asses of the Israelites said Abay the proof is that scripture numbers the surplus of men over the Levites but does not number the surplus of Israelite animals over the Levites animals but what proof is this perhaps that the Israelites in the wilderness did not possess many animals asses to redeem that cannot enter your mind for it is written now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle perhaps even so the ordinary non firstborn animals of the Levites just corresponded with the number of the firstborn of the Israelite scripture says and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle one Levite animal instead of many Israelite animals firstlings of asses but why can we not say that the Word cattle also implies many animals if so let scripture write either cattle instead of cattle or their cattle instead of their cattle why does scripture write cattle of instead of their cattle deduce from this that one Levite animal exempted many Israelite animals said Rabbah we have also learned our Hannah's ruling and he can redeem with it the sheep many times the firstborn of asses and our Hannah he explains the reason of the mission and what he means is this what is the reason that he can redeem with it the sheep many times the firstborn of asses because one sheep of a Levite exempted many firstborn of asses belonging to an Israelite it was stated our Yohanan said the firstborn in the wilderness were sanctified Rush Lakish said the firstborn in the wilderness were not sanctified our Yohanan said that the firstborn were sanctified in the wilderness for the divine law said that they should be sanctified as it is written sanctify unto me all the firstborn Rush Lakish said that the firstborn were not sanctified in the wilderness since it is written and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and it says subsequently that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the womb from this you can infer that previously to their entering the land that the firstborn was not sanctified or Yohanan raised an objection to Rush Lakish's view before the sanctuary was erected the high places were permitted and the service was performed by the firstborn he replied to him the service was performed by those firstborn who departed from Egypt it also stands to reason for if you will not say so is a one-year-old capable of performing the service and Yohanan how could he raise such a question at all this was his Yohanan's objection to Rush Lakish's view you would be right if you said that the holiness of the firstborn did not cease in the wilderness because then those firstborn also originally born in Egypt did not have their holiness cancelled but if you say that their holiness ceased then those firstborn originally born in Egypt should also have had their holiness cancelled and what says the other to this those who were holy the firstborn of Egypt remained holy and those who were not hitherto holy did not become holy here Yohanan raised an objection on the day on which the sanctuary was erected votive offerings free will offerings sin offerings trespass offerings firstlings and the tithe of cattle were sacrificed in Israel here also it refers to those firstborn who departed from Egypt and from the Beretha itself we can deduce this on that day firstlings were sacrificed but after that in the wilderness there was no sacrifice of firstlings some there are who say Rush Lakish sided against our Yohanan the following that day on which the sanctuary was erected votive offerings free will offerings sin offerings trespass offerings firstlings Tithe of cattle were sacrificed in Israel as much as to say on that day but after that in the wilderness there was no sacrifice of firstlings or Yohanan replied amend the very thus from that day and onward and what does he tell us here that from that day these sacrifices were permitted but not at first from which we are to infer that obligatory sacrifices were not sacrificed on a high place come and here consequently in three places were the firstborn sanctified for Israel in Egypt. In the wilderness and when they entered the land with reference to the firstborn in Egypt what does scripture say sanctify unto me all the firstling with reference to the firstling in the wilderness scripture says for the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine with reference to the firstborn when they entered the land scripture says and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites that thou shalt set apart set Arnam and be Isaac this passage means. That in three places the Israelites were commanded concerning the sanctification of the firstborn, but they were not actually sanctified and were not also the firstborn in Egypt sanctified. Did we not say that they were holy? This is what the passage means. In some of the three places referred to the firstborn were sanctified, and in some they were not sanctified. Our Papa demurred and were not the firstborn sanctified in the wilderness. Behold, it is written, Number all the firstborn. Males of the children of Israel, rather, if the above dispute was stated, it was stated as follows. Our Yohanan said they the firstborn were sanctified and did not cease from their holiness, but Rush Lakish said that they were sanctified temporarily. Talmud, Mos Bekor and then ceased from their holiness as to Rush Lakish it is well for the reason stated above. But what is the reason of our Yohanan said? Our Eliezer, our Yohanan appeared to me in a dream telling me that I said an excellent. Think the scripture said mine shall they be denoting that they the firstborn shall remain in their status and what does our Yohanan do with the verses which follow and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee unto the land that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord that textual proximity is required to deduce what the school of our Ishmael taught perform this divine command on account of which you will be worthy to enter the land said our Mordecai to our Ashi you reported it in this matter we reverse the names our Yohanan said firstlings were not sanctified in the wilderness but Rush Lakish said firstlings were sanctified in the wilderness he thereupon asked him and do you also propose to reverse the name of the author of the refutation together with our Eliezer's statement he replied to him the words they were not sanctified of our Yohanan mean there was no need for the firstlings to be sanctified in the wilderness if so then it is identical with our version of it. Dispute between our Yohanan and Rush Lakish it teaches us that a man must cite a ruling in the exact language of his master a Roman general Kontrokos questioned our Yohanan Bizakai in the detailed record of the numbering of the Levites you find the total is 22,300 whereas in the sum total you only find 22,000 where are the remaining 300 he replied to him the remaining 300 were Levi firstborn and a firstborn cannot cancel it. Holiness of the firstborn what is the reason said Abbe because it is sufficient for a Levi firstborn to cancel his own holiness and again he questioned him with reference to the collection of the money you count 201 kicker and 11 mana for scripture writes a becca for every man that is half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary whereas when the money was given you find only 100 kicker for it is written and the 100 talents of silver were for casting etc. Was Moses your teacher either a thief or a swindler or else a bad arithmetician? He gave a half, took a half, and did not even return a complete half. He replied to him, Moses, our teacher, was a trustworthy treasurer and a good arithmetician. Only the sacred mano was double the common. Ara, he argued, what is his the general's difficulty? It says, and the hundred talents that were for casting, etc. These were used for casting, and those others, the two hundred and one kicker, were for the treasury. Scripture wrote another verse, and the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents, etc. And as to his reply, that the sacred mano was double the common, whence did he derive this? If you say from it, this very verse for here, we have seventy one mana, and scripture writes, and of the thousand seven hundred seventy and five shekels, he made hooks for the pillars and recorded them only in units of shekels. Now, if the value of a sacred mana is not higher. Scripture ought to have written 101 kicker and 11 mana, but since scripture does not record them except in units of shekels, you may deduce from here that the sacred mana was double the common, but perhaps it is only the sum total of 100 kicker that scripture records, but the odd amount of only one kicker or so it does not record, rather deduce then from here and the brass of the offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels for here are 96 mana and scripture does not record them except in units of shekels, deduce from here therefore that the sacred mana was double the common, perhaps however a large odd number of kicker scripture records, but a small odd number it does not record, rather said Arhista, deduce from here and the shekel shall be 20 gears, 20 shekels, 5 and 20 shekels, 15 shekels shall be your mana Talmud, Mos Bekorot now
children for refined feebleness of hand and I asked him further what is the meaning of the word Shittim and he told me Shittim was the name of the place here to Tanaim Tifer our Elizer says Shittim was the name of the place whereas our Joshua says it means that they gave themselves up to lust and they called to the people unto the sacrifices of their gods our Elizer says this verse means that they, the Israelites came into contact with naked bodies but our Joshua says they all became polluted. Mishnah if a cow gave birth to a species of ass or an ass gave birth to a species of horse it is exempt from the law of the firstling for it is said firstling Peter of an ass firstling Peter of an ass twice to teach that the law of the firstborn does not apply until that which gives birth is an ass and that which is born is an ass and what is the law with reference to eating them if a clean animal gave birth to a species of unclean animal it is permitted to be eaten but if an unclean Animal gave birth to a species of a clean animal it is forbidden to be eaten for that which goes forth from the unclean is unclean and that which goes forth from the clean is clean tomorrow we have learned elsewhere if you gave birth to a species of goat or a goat gave birth to a species of you it is exempt from the law of the firstling but if the offspring possesses some marks resembling the mother it is subject to the law of the firstling whence is this proof said Rab Judah scripture says but the firstling of an ox meaning that if the animal should be an ox and its firstling must be an ox firstling of a sheep indicating that the animal should be a sheep and its firstling must be a sheep firstling of a goat indicating that the animal firstling of a goat indicating that the animal should be a goat and its firstling must be a goat you might think that even if the offspring possesses some mark similar to the mother there the text stated AK but intimating that there is a distinction, but does not the Tana of our mission derive the ruling for the exemption of a cow which gave birth to a species of ass from Peter firstling? Peter firstling here, Judah follows the view of our Jose the Galilean, for it was taught our Jose the Galilean said, But the firstling of an ox, the law of the firstling does not apply until it the animal is an ox, and its firstling is an ox, firstling of a sheep, the law of the firstling does not apply until it the animal is a sheep, and its firstling is a sheep, firstling of a goat, the law of the firstling does not apply until it the animal is a goat, and its firstling is a goat. You might think that even if it the offspring possesses some mark similar to its mother, the text states AK intimating that there is a distinction wherein do they differ. Our Tana in the mission holds that the divine law informs us in that case of that which is consecrated for its value that a change in the offspring exempts it. From the law of the firstling and the same applies to an object consecrated as such but our Jose the Galilean maintains that the divine law informs us in connection with an object consecrated as such that a change in the offspring exempts it from the law of the firstling and the same principle applies in connection with an object which is consecrated for its value and we derive an object which is consecrated for its value from an object which is consecrated as such and our tana, what does he make a better firstling better firstling he requires it for our Jose Behanna's explanation for our Jose Behanna said why does scripture mention Imurim in connection with the firstling of an ox Imurim in connection with the firstling of a sheep Imurim in connection with the firstling of a goat it is necessary for if the divine law had written Imurim in connection with the firstling of an ox only I might have said the reason for the Imurim was because there was an increased drink. Offering and if the divine law had written Imurim in connection with the firstling of a sheep only I might have said the reason for the Imurim was because of the fat tail which was included to be sacrificed together with the Imurim and if the divine law had written Imurim in connection with the firstling of a goat only I might have said the reason for the Imurim was because a goat was included as a suitable offering in the case of the sin of idolatry committed by an individual. You could not have derived Imurim in connection with any single case of a firstling of an ox firstling of a sheep or firstling of a goat from any other single case perhaps you could derive however Imurim in a single case of a firstling mentioned from the remaining two cases in connection with what case should the divine law have omitted to write Imurim should the divine law not have written Imurim in connection with the firstling of an ox and should we have proceeded to derive this from the remaining two cases, the firstling of a sheep and the firstling of a goat, quoted above, I might have raised the objection that the two cases mentioned where Imurim was written were different for a sheep and a goat are included as suitable to be brought as Passover sacrifices, or should the divine law have omitted Imurim in connection with the firstling of a sheep, and should we then have derived this from the remaining two cases of the firstling of an ox and the firstling of a goat? I might have raised the objection that the cases of an ox and a goat were different for they are included as suitable offerings for the sin of idolatry committed communally, or should the divine law have omitted Imurim in connection with the firstling of a goat, and should we then have derived this from the remaining two cases of the firstling of an ox and the firstling of a sheep? I might have raised the objection that the cases of an ox and a sheep were different for they have it. Common point of an increased offering upon the altar therefore all the three cases to which the verse refers are necessary and our Jose the Galilean his answer is if so let the divine law write but the firstling of an ox sheep and goat what need is there for the words becker becker hence you must deduce from here the teaching also that both the animal and its firstling must be an ox and our Jose the Galilean what does he do with the text Peter Hammer Peter Hammer he requires this for what was taught our Jose the Galilean says because it is said in the scriptures how be it the firstborn of man shalt thou surely redeem and the firstling of unclean beasts shalt thou redeem I might infer from the text that even the firstborn of horses and camels are liable to the law of the firstborn therefore there the text stated Peter Hammer I have only spoken to you says scripture of firstlings of asses but not of the firstlings of horses and camels I can still maintain however that the Firstlings of asses are to be redeemed with a sheep, but the firstlings of horses and camels may be redeemed with any object. Talmud, Mosbek wrote of the text, therefore states Peter Hammer, Peter Hammer twice to intimate. I have only spoken of the firstling of asses, but not at all of the firstlings of horses and camels are aha raised an objection. There is need for the repetition of Peter Hammer, for if the divine law had written only one Peter Hammer, I might have said that at the law of it. Firstling of an ass requiring redemption is a thing which was included in the general proposition and then made the subject of a special statement so that the specification is not limited to itself alone but is to be applied to the whole class of unclean animals, and so in all cases the redemption is indeed with a sheep, therefore the divine law wrote in another text Peter Hammer to intimate that only firstlings of asses are redeemed with a sheep, but not the firstlings of horses and camels, but one might say that the limitation with reference to horses etc. only refers to redemption with a sheep but elsewhere they may indeed be redeemed with any object if so let the divine law write the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a sheep and an ass thou shalt redeem with a sheep why this repetition the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a sheep the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a sheep it is to intimate I have only spoken to you of the firstlings of asses as requiring redemption but not of the firstlings of horses and camels and our tana of the mission whence does he derive a limitation of horses and camels as being altogether exempt from the law of the firstling said our papa scripture says and of all the cattle thou shalt sanctify the males this is a general proposition the firstling of an ox and sheep and the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem is a specification and with a general proposition complemented by a specification it General proposition includes only the specification thus teaching that an ox sheep and an ass are liable to the law of the firstling but not any other animal and our Jose the Galilean his answer is that the word Peter interrupts the subject and the rabbis the letter Bob joins it again to the previous verse and our Jose the Galilean let not scripture write neither the Bob which joins it with the previous verse nor write the word Peter which interrupts the subject and the rabbis since the one part deals with objects consecrated in respect of their value and the other part with objects consecrated as such scripture therefore at first interrupts the subject and subsequently connects it again with the previous verse the question was asked if a cow gave birth to a species of ass and it possesses some marks similar to its mother what is the ruling if a goat gave birth to a species of you and a you gave birth to a species of goat the ruling is that when it possesses some marks Similar to its mother, it is subject to the law of the firstling. The reason being that this one, the mother, is a clean animal, and this one, the offspring, is a clean animal. This one, the mother, is an object consecrated as such, and this one, the offspring, is also an object consecrated as such. But here, where this one, the offspring, is an unclean animal, and this one, the mother, is a clean animal. This one, the mother, is an object consecrated as such, and
This one the cow is a clean animal whereas this one the offspring is an unclean animal this one the cow belongs to a category of animals which possess the sanctity of the firstling whereas this one the horse does not belong to the category of animals which have the sanctity of the firstling or are we perhaps to say that marks similar to the mother are the decisive factor come and here a clean animal which gave birth to a species of unclean animal is exempted from the law of it. Firstling if it possesses however some mark similar to the parent it is liable to the law of the firstling what does this mean does it not refer even to the case of a cow which gave birth to a species of horse no it refers to the case of a cow which gave birth to a species of ass come and here if a cow gave birth to a species of ass or an ass gave birth to a species of horse it is exempt from the law of the firstling if it possesses however some mark similar to the mother it is liable. To the law of the firstling, what does this mean? Does this the last clause not refer to both cases mentioned? No, it refers only to the case of a cow which gave birth to a species of ass, but the case of an ass which gave birth to a species of horse. Why does it state this? Is it to exempt it from the law of the firstborn? Is this not obvious? Since in the case of a cow which gave birth to a species of an ass, where both the mother and its offspring belong to a category of animals which have the sanctity of the firstling, you say if the ass has some mark similar to its mother, it is sanctified, but if not, it is not sanctified. Is there any question in the case of an ass which gave birth to a species of horse? It is necessary to state this. You might be inclined to assume that there in the case of a cow which gave birth to a species of ass, the reason is because the cow has horns, but here the ass has no horns. Here the cow its hooves are cloven, but there the ass its hooves are. Close, but here in the case where an ass gave birth to a species of horse, since in both instances they have no horns and the hoofs of both are closed, I might have said that the offspring of species of horse was merely a red ass. We are therefore informed that this is not so. What is the law with reference to eating them, etc.? What need is there for the mission to lay down for that which goes forth, etc.? It is a mere mnemonical sign so that you should not change the version of the mission. And that you should not say decide according to the offspring, and this is a perfectly clean animal, and this is a perfectly unclean animal, but we rather say follow the mother once is this proved because our rabbis taught, nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cut or of them that divide the hoof. You have the case of an animal which chews the cut and has divided hoofs, which you are nevertheless forbidden to eat, and what is it? This is a case of a clean animal born from an unclean animal, perhaps it is not so, but the verse refers to the case of an unclean animal born from a clean animal, and what is the interpretation of the verse of them that chew the cut or of them that divide the hoof Talmud, Mosbek or it means this an object which proceeds from them which chew the cut and of them that divide the hoof, ye shall not eat the text therefore states the camel he is unclean, intimating that he is unclean, but an unclean animal born from a clean animal is not unclean, but clean, our Simeon says the word camel occurs twice once referring to a camel born from a camel as forbidden and the other to a camel born from a cow, and as to the rabbis who differ from our Simeon, what do they do with the repetition camel camel one is to forbid the camel itself and the other to prohibit its milk, and whence does our Simeon derive the prohibition of a camel's milk, he derives it from the word eth with the camel and the rabbis they do not stress the word eth. Occurring in the scriptures as it was taught Simeon the Ames not used to expound the word eth wherever it occurred in the law when he reached however the verse eth with the Lord thy God thou shalt fear he abstained his pupils thereupon said to him Rabbi every eth which you have expounded what will become of them you reply to them just as I have received reward for interpreting every eth so I shall receive reward for abstaining finally however our Akiva came and taught that the verse eth with the Lord thy God thou shalt fear intimates that we must pay reverence to scholars next to God said Araha the son of Rabbah to Arashi according to this the reason of the rabbis why milk of an unclean animal is forbidden is because of the repetition camel camel and that of our Simeon is because of the text eth with the camel but were it not so I might have said that milk from an unclean animal is permitted why should it be different from what was taught the verse these are the unclean implies the prohibition of their brine their soup and their jelly it is necessary to find another basis for milk for I might have been inclined to assume that since even the use of milk itself of a clean animal is an anomaly for a master said the blood during the nursing period is disturbed decomposed and turns into milk and since it is an anomaly therefore even from an unclean animal the milk should be permitted we are accordingly informed that this is not so this would indeed hold good according to him who says that the blood during the nursing period is disturbed decomposed and turns into milk but according to him who says that the reason why there is no menstruation period while nursing is because her limbs become disjointed and she does not become normal in herself for 24 months what can you reply it is still necessary I might have been inclined to assume that since there is nothing which proceeds from a living being which the divine law permits and Yet milk which is similar to apart from a living animal is permitted therefore even from an unclean animal the milk should be permitted we are accordingly informed that this is not so and whence do we derive that milk itself from a clean animal is permitted shall I say that since the divine law prohibits the boiling of milk and meat together this implies that separately milk is permitted but might I not still maintain that milk by itself is forbidden to be eaten though permitted for other general use whereas in the case of boiling meat and milk together it is also forbidden for any use and even according to the view of our Simeon who holds that meat and milk boiled together is permitted for general use the prohibition can be explained as necessary to inflict lashes for the boiling rather since the divine law states in connection with dedicated objects which became unfit notwithstanding thou mayest kill but not to use the shearing flesh but not the milk this implies that milk from an unconsecrated animal is permitted but may I not take the meaning to be that milk from an unconsecrated animal is forbidden to be eaten but may be used for other general use whereas in the case of consecrated objects it is forbidden even for any use rather deduce the law from what scripture has written and thou shalt have goats milk enough for thy food for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of thy maidens perhaps however this only refers to business rather deduce this from what scripture writes and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand perhaps here also it refers to business is it usual in war to sell food to the enemy if you prefer I may deduce from your land flowing with milk and honey now if milk were not permitted would scripture commend the country to us with something which is not fit to be eaten or if you prefer I may deduce it from your come yet by any yet come by wine and milk without money and without price now According to this the repetition rock badger rock badger hair hair swine swine are these also come for some purpose but the object of these repetitions quoted is really as was taught why is there a repetition of the clean and unclean animals on account of Shesua why with reference to birds is there the same repetition in the scripture on account of Ariad and perhaps the repetition of camel camel also has the same purpose all the same wherever we can derive a lesson from it. Biblical text we interpreted our rabbis taught if you gave birth to a species of a goat or a goat gave birth to a species of a you it is exempt from the law of the firstling but if the offspring possesses some mark similar to its mother it is liable to the law of the firstling our Simeon says it is not liable to the law of the firstling until the head and the greater part of the body resemble the mother the following query was put forward does our Simeon require in order that the animal may be permitted to be eaten the head and the greater part of the body or not in connection with the firstling scripture rights but the firstling of an ox indicating that the law of the firstling does not apply until the animal is an ox and its firstborn is an ox but as regards permission for eating the divine law says that only a camel is prohibited but Talmud, Mosbek or if it has changed from a camel there is no objection or is there perhaps no difference come and here if a clean animal gives birth to a species of unclean animal it is forbidden to be eaten but if the head and the greater part of the body resemble its mother it is liable to the law of the firstling may we not deduce from here that even as regards permission to eat our Simeon requires the head and the greater part of the body to be similar to its mother no only as regards the law of the firstling I can also prove it for he leaves the first clause of the above passage relating to eating as it is in places the provision of the head and the greater part of the body in conjunction with the firstling we deduce from here therefore do we not that only in connection with the firstling does our Simeon require the head and the greater part of the body but not as regards permission for eating no I may still tell you that also as regards eating our Simeon requires the head and the greater part of the body and that it was necessary to state this with particular reference to the firstling for I might be inclined to assume that
Passage the animal is unclean therein agreeing with our simian and proceeds to say but you may eat an animal which possesses one clean mark similar to its mother this tana of the above passage holds with our simian in one thing but he differs from him in the other some there are who raise a question with reference to the above bury the and answer it the question was asked can impregnation take place from an unclean animal for our joshua believe i said there can be no impregnation either of an unclean animal from a clean animal or of a clean animal from an unclean animal or of large cattle from small cattle or of small cattle from large cattle or of a domestic animal from a beast of chase or a beast of chase from a domestic animal except in the case discussed by our Eliezer and his disputants where all say that a beast of chase can become pregnant from a domestic animal and our jeremiah explained that the animal became pregnant from a cow of a cow adopting the view of our simian and the Beritha states, but you may eat an animal which has one mark like its mother. This tana from the Beritha holds with Arsimian in one thing, but differs from him in the other. Does this mean to say that our Eliezer holds that a product of two heterogeneous factors is permitted, and that our Joshua holds that a product of two such factors is forbidden? But have we not learned the reverse of them? For we have learned the offspring of a trifle must not be offered upon the altar, but our Joshua says it may be offered upon the altar. As a rule, our Eliezer maintains that a product of two heterogeneous factors is forbidden. But the case is different here. For if it were so, Scripture should write the sheep of lambs and goats. Why is the repetition of sheep sheep needed to deduce from here? Therefore, sheep in any circumstances, and our Joshua he will explain the matter to you as follows. In general, a product of two heterogeneous factors is permitted, but here in the Beritha, if this were the Case let scripture write ox sheep of a lamb sheep of a goat what need is there for the words lambs goats deduce therefore from here that the father must be a sheep and the mother must be a sheep come and here our simian says we find camel camel twice one refers to a camel born from a camel as prohibited and the other refers to a camel born from a cow but if its head and the greater part of its body resemble the mother it is permitted to be eaten deduce therefore from here that even for eating our simian requires the head and the greater part of the body to be similar to the mother this is proof for that which goes forth from the unclean etc a question was put to our she's hey what is the ruling concerning the urine of an ass why should not the question be put concerning the urine of horses or camels the question was not put concerning the urine of horses or camels for it is not thick and consequently it is not similar to milk it is merely water coming in and water coming out but the question does arise concerning the urine of an ass because it is thick and is similar to milk. What is the ruling? Is the urine drained from the body of the ass itself and therefore it is forbidden, or perhaps it is merely water coming in and water coming out and its thickness is due to the exudations of the body? Our she's hate replied to his questioners. We have learned it for that which goes forth from the unclean is unclean and that which goes forth from the clean is clean. Now it does not say from what is unclean Talmud, Mosbek or Opi, but from the unclean and this to the urine of an ass thick as milk is from that which is unclean. Some state the argument as follows with reference to the urine of horses or animals. The question was not put forward because it is not drunk. The question, however, arose concerning the urine of an ass which people drink and is good for jaundice. What is the ruling? Our she's hate replied to this. We have learned this in the mission that which goes. Forth from the unclean is unclean and that which goes forth from the clean is clean and this urine also comes from an unclean animal an objection was raised why did the sages say that honey from bees is permitted because the bees store it up in their bodies but do not drain it from their bodies he the tana of the passage quoted above holds with our jacob who said the divine law expressly permitted honey for it was taught our jacob says yet these may eat of all the winged swarming things this you may eat but you are forbidden to eat an unclean winged swarming thing but is not an unclean winged swarming thing expressly mentioned in the scripture as forbidden rather we must explain thus an unclean fowl that swarms you must not eat but you may eat what an unclean fowl casts forth from its body and what is this this is bees honey you might think that this also includes gazins honey or hornets honey as permissible you cannot however say this and why should you include bees honey and exclude gazins honey or hornets honey I include bees honey because it has no qualifying epithet but I exclude gazins honey or hornets honey since they have a qualifying epithet whom does this dictum that has been taught follow gazins honey or hornets honey is clean and is permitted to be eaten not our Jacob the Beretha says concerning gazins or hornets honey that it is clean consequently it requires the intention of using it as a food we infer from this that bees honey does not need it intention of using it as a food it has also been taught likewise honey in its high becomes unclean with the uncleanness of food even without the intention of using it as a food with regard to ball like concretions in a fell deer the rabbis in the presence of our safra proposed to lay down that they were real eggs and were therefore forbidden said our safra it was really the seed of a deer which sought to couple with a hind but since the latter's womb is narrow and it is unable to copulate it Deer therefore seeks to couple with a fellow deer releasing its semen into the latter's womb said Arhuna the skin which is over the face of an ass at birth is permitted to be eaten what is the reason it is a mere secretion but no real skin said Arhista to him there is a very the thought which supports you a skin which is over the face of a man whether alive or dead is clean now does not this mean whether both the offspring and its mother are alive or whether both the offspring and its mother are dead no it means whether the offspring is alive and its mother is dead or whether the offspring is dead and its mother is alive but has it not been taught whether the offspring and its mother are alive or whether the offspring and its mother are dead the ruling is that the skin is clean if it has been actually taught in a very then it has been taught Mishnah if an unclean fish swallowed a clean fish it is permitted to be eaten but if a clean fish has swallowed an unclean fish the latter is forbidden to be eaten because it is not the clean fish's product. Amara, the reason is because we actually saw that it swallowed, but if we did not see that it swallowed, we would say that it was bred by the unclean fish. Whence do we know this? For it has been taught an unclean fish breeds, whereas a clean fish lays eggs. If this is a fact, even if we see that it actually swallowed, we should say that the clean fish had been consumed and the fish found inside was bred by the unclean. Fish said Arshis hate it means if e.g. he found it in the secretory channel, our said if e.g. he found it whole, Arashi said the majority of fish breed their own kind, and therefore when we discover a different kind of fish inside, it is as if we had witnessed the swallowing or rabbis taught an unclean fish breeds, but a clean fish lays eggs whatsoever gives birth, gives suck, and whatsoever lays eggs supports its brood by picking up food for it except the bat for although it lays eggs, it gives. Suck to its young Talmud, Mosbek or dolphins are fruitful and multiply by coupling with human beings. What our dolphins said, Rab Judah, humans of the sea and any species which has its male balls outside the female give birth to its young, but where the male balls are inside the female lay eggs, it is not so. Did not Samuel say the domestic and wild goose are forbidden copulation? And we raise the point, what is the reason said Abbe? In one case, the male balls are outside and in the other, the male balls are inside, yet both lay eggs rather say whatsoever has its male genital outside gives birth, but whatsoever has its male genital inside lays eggs, whatsoever copulates in the daytime gives birth in the daytime, whatsoever copulates in the night gives birth in the night, whatsoever copulates in the day and nighttime gives birth both in the day and in the night, whatsoever copulates in the daytime gives birth in the daytime, for instance, a cock, whatsoever copulates in the Night gives birth in the night for instance a bat whatsoever copulates in the day and night time gives birth both in the day and in the night for instance man and all beings resembling him what is the practical rule to be derived from this statement the rule of Armari the son of Kahana for Armari the son of Kahana said if one searched a nest of chickens on the eve of a festival and did not find an egg therein and on the morrow he rose early and found there an egg it is permitted to be eaten on the festival but did he not search you presume that he did not search thoroughly but did he not search thoroughly you presume that the greater part of the egg came forth from the intestines of the chicken but returned and this is in accordance with the ruling of our Yohanan for our Yohanan said an egg the greater part of which came forth from the intestines of a chicken on the eve of a festival and returned to its intestines may be eaten on the festival all animals whose copulating and Pregnancy are alike give birth from one another and nurse each other's young. All animals copulate with their faces against the back of the female, except three which copulate face to face, and these are a fish man and a serpent. And why are these three different? When our
Corresponding to them are white figs among trees a viper or adder goes with young for 70 years and corresponding to it is the carob tree among trees from the time of the planting of the carob tree to the ripening of its fruit a period of 70 years elapses and the time of its pregnancy is 3 years a serpent goes with young for 7 years and for that wicked animal there is no companion among trees some however say that corresponding to a serpent is a kind of white fig among trees whence is this proof said Rab Judah in the name of Rab and they trace it in tradition up to the name of Arjashu be Hanania because scripture says cursed art thou from among all cattle and from among all the beasts of the field now if the serpent was cursed to go with young for a period longer than an animal how much longer must this have been than that of a beast but the object of the verse is to tell you just as the animal is cursed to go with young longer than a beast in the proportion of 1 to 7 and what is this an ass which goes with young longer than a cat so the serpent is cursed to go with young in the proportion of 1 to 7 which is 7 years but why not say that just as a beast has been cursed to go with young longer than an animal in the proportion of 1 to 3 and what is this a lion which goes with young longer than an ass so the serpent has been cursed to go with young longer than a beast in the proportion of 1 to 3 which is 9 years Talmud, Mosbek or does scripture write from among all the beasts and from among all the cattle it writes in the following order from among all the cattle and from among all the beasts the serpent is cursed from among all the animals which are cursed in that it takes longer to produce their young than the beast but why not say just as the animal has been cursed to go with young longer than the beast in the proportion of 1 to 3 and what is this a goat which goes with young longer than a cat so the serpent has been cursed in the proportion of 1 to 3 which is 15 months if you choose I may reply that scripture writes from among all cattle or if you prefer still another solution it is a curse which it is the object of the verse to inflict and therefore we cast the heaviest curses possible on the serpent the emperor once asked our Joshua be Hanania how long is the period of gestation and birth of a serpent he replied to him seven years but did not the sages of the Athenian school couple a male serpent with a female and they gave birth in three years those had already been pregnant for four years but did they not have sexual contact serpents have sexual intercourse in the same manner as human beings but are not the sages of Athens wise men and surely they must have ascertained the true facts about the serpent we are wiser than they if you are wise said the emperor go and defeat them in Argument and bring them to me. He asked him how many are the Athenian sages. Sixty persons thereupon he said to him, Make me a ship containing sixty compartments, each compartment containing sixty cushions. He did this for him. When Arjashu reached their city, he went up to a slaughterhouse. He found a certain man who was dressing an animal. He asked him, Is thy head for sale? The other replied, Yes. Thereupon he asked him for how much, and the man answered, For a half a zoos. He gave him the money. Eventually he said to him, Give me thy head. He gave him an animal's head. Thereupon Arjashu exclaimed, Did I say the head of an animal? I told thee thy head. Arjashu then said to him, If you wish that I should leave thee alone, step in front of me and show me the door of the school of the Athenian sages. Thereupon the man replied, I am afraid for whoever points them out. They put to death. Arjashu then said, Take a bundle of reeds, and if you reach the spot, throw it down as if to rest. He went and Found guards inside and guards outside the school for when the wise men saw somebody enter they used to kill the outside guards and when they saw someone leaving they killed the inside guards he reversed the heel of his shoe and they killed the inside guards he then reversed the shoe to its normal position and they killed all of them he proceeded and found the young men sitting high up in the upper chamber and the elders below he said if I'll give greetings to the elders then the young men will kill me the latter claiming we are more important for we sit high up and they sit below and if I give greetings to the young men then the elders will kill me the latter claiming we are older and they are just youngsters or Joshua then said peace to you they asked him what are you doing here he replied to them I am a sage of the Jews I wish to learn wisdom from you if so we will ask you questions said the Athenian wise men he answered them very well if you defeat me then Whatever you wish do unto me, but if I'll defeat you, eat bread with me in the ship. They said to him, If a person wished to marry a woman and the consent was not given, is it feasible that he should seek a woman of higher birth? He took a peg and stuck it below on the stone wall and it would not join, and then he stuck it higher up and it went and he said, Here also, therefore, it may happen that the second woman is his destined one. If a man lends money and is compelled to seize his debt by forces, it to be expected that he should lend again. He replied to them, A man goes into a forest, cuts the first load of wood and cannot lift it. He continues cutting until somebody comes along and helps him to lift the bundle. They said to him, Tell us some stories. He said to them, There was a mule which gave birth, and round its neck was a document in which was written, There is a claim against my father's house of 100,000 zoos. They asked him, Can a mule give birth? He answered them, This is one. Of these stories when salt becomes unsavory wherewith is it salted he replied with the afterbirth of a mule and is there an afterbirth of a mule and can salt become unsavory built as a house in the sky he pronounced the name of the deity suspended himself in the air and hung between heaven and earth he then said to them bring me up bricks and clay from down there they asked and is it possible to do this he replied and is it possible to build a house between heaven and earth where is it center of the world he raised his fingers and said to them here they said to him how can you prove it he replied bring ropes and measure they said we have a pit in the field bring it to the town he replied not ropes of bran flour for me and I will bring it and we have a broken millstone mended he took a detached portion from it and threw it before them saying take out the threads for me like a weaver and I shall mend it a bed of knives wherewith can we cut it with the horns of an ass they Asked, but has an ass horns and is there a bed of knives? He replied, They brought him two eggs, which is from the black clucking hen, and which is from the white he himself brought them two cheeses, and asked them, Which is from a black goat, and which from a white a chicken dead in its shell? Where has the spirit gone from whence it came thither? It went, Show us an article whose value is not worth the loss it causes. He brought a mat of reeds and spread it out, it could not get through the door being too long and wide. He then said, Bring a rake and pickaxe and demolish the door of the building. That is an example of an article whose value is not worth the loss it causes. He brought them to eat in the ship one by one to his separate chamber. When they saw the sixty cushions, each one thought that all the companions would come to this chamber. He ordered the captain to set sail as they were about to journey. He took some earth from their native soil, Talmud, Mos Bekorota, one day. Reached the straits, they filled a jug of water from the waters of the straits. When they arrived, they were presented to the emperor. He observed that they were depressed, being far from their native land. He said, These are not the same people. He therefore took a piece of the earth of their country and cast it at them. Thereupon they grew haughty towards the king. He then said to our Joshua, Whatever you desire, do with them. He fetched the water which the Athenians had taken from the straits and poured it into a ditch. He said to them, Fill this and depart. They tried to fill it by casting there in the water one after the other, but it was absorbed. They went on filling until the joints of their shoulders became dislocated and they perished. Mishnah, if a she asked that had never before given birth, gave birth to two males. The Israelite gives one lamb to the priest as a redemption. If it gave birth to a male and a female, he sets aside one lamb which remains for himself. If two she asks that. Had never before given birth gave birth to two males he gives two lambs to the priest if they gave birth to a male and a female or two males and a female he gives one lamb to the priest if they gave birth to two females and a male or to two males and two females the priest receives nothing if one she ass had given birth before and one had not given birth before and they gave birth to two males he gives one lamb to the priest if they gave birth to a male and a female he sets aside one lamb which remains for himself for scripture says and the first ling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb the lamb can come either from the sheep or the goat's male or female large or small unblemished or blemished he can redeem with the same one many times and the lamb enters the shed to be tithed if it dies the priest can benefit from it Gemara, who is the authority of the first passage in the mission our jeremiah said it does not follow the opinion of our Jose the Galilean for if it were the Opinion of our Jose the Galilean did he not say that it is possible to ascertain exactly that both heads came forth simultaneously said Abbe you may even assume that the passage in the Mishnah represents the opinion of our Jose the Galilean and that he makes a difference in connection with the firstborn of a clean animal for scripture writes the males shall be the lords but why not infer the case of the firstborn of an unclean animal from the case of the firstborn of a clean animal. The divine law
Consecrates for if it consecrates only when the whole womb touches a firstling granted it is impossible to ascertain that both heads came forth simultaneously nevertheless there is here an interposition said Arashi objects of a homogeneous kind are not reckoned as an interposition with reference to each other if it gave birth to a male and female he sets aside etc since it remains for himself what need is there to set it aside in order to release it from the prohibitions attaching to the first birth of an ass consequently we infer that until it is released it is forbidden to be used whose opinion does the Mishnah represent it is the opinion of Arjuna for it has been taught it is forbidden to make any use of the first birth of an ass these are the words of Arjuna but Arsimian permits this what is the reason of Arjuna said can you find an object which requires redemption and yet is permitted to be used while unredeemed but is there not what of a case of the first Born of a man who requires redemption and yet even before redemption one may derive benefit from him rather argue thus is there an object concerning which the Torah particularly enjoined that redemption must be with a sheep and which was yet permitted to be used before redemption and was the Torah indeed so particular did not our Nehemiah the son of our Joseph redeem an ass with boiled herbs of its equivalent value as regards an object of equivalent value this is not referred to here. What we are speaking of is the redemption of an object not with its equivalent value and all means this can you find an object concerning which the Torah was particular to release its prohibition only with a sheep even though not its equivalent in value and yet it is permitted to benefit therefrom unredeemed but what of the second tithing which the Torah was particular that the redemption must be with coined money and yet we have learned our Judah says if he betrothed the woman with second. Tithe willfully she is betrothed also with the first birth of an ass is a woman betrothed as our Eliezer taught for our Eliezer said a woman knows that the second tithe is not rendered unconsecrated through her and she therefore goes up to Jerusalem and eats it similarly here also a woman is aware that the first birth of an ass is prohibited she redeems it therefore with a lamb and is betrothed with the difference between the value of the ass and the sheep and as to our Simeon what is his reason? Said Ula, can you find an object whose ransom is permitted to be used while the object itself is forbidden but can we not what of the fruit of the sabbatical year whose ransom is permitted to be used and yet the fruit itself is forbidden also with the fruit of the sabbatical year is the ransom forbidden for a master said the prohibitions attaching to the sabbatical year take effect on the very last thing bought or if you choose I may say that our Judah and our Simeon differ in it. Interpretation of the following verse for it has been taught scripture says thou shalt do no work with the firstling of thine ox but you may do work with the firstling which belongs both to you and to a gentile nor shear the firstling of thy flock but you may shear what belongs both to you and to a gentile these are the words of our Judah but our Simeon says thou shalt do no work with the firstling of thine ox implying but you may work with the firstborn of a man thou shalt not shear the firstling of thy sheep implying but you may shear the first birth of an ass we understand why according to our Simeon's interpretation scripture needs to write both verses but according to our Judah what need is there for two verses to exclude a firstling which belongs both to you and to a gentile and furthermore according to our Judah the firstborn of a man also should we say is forbidden to work with before redemption rather therefore explain that all the authorities mentioned hold that the Words thine ox have for their object the exclusion of the firstborn of a man. The dispute, however, is in the interpretation of the words thy sheep for our Judah is in agreement with his own dictum elsewhere, where he says a partnership with a Gentile is subject to the law of the firstborn, so that there is need of a verse to make it permissible for shearing and working of the firstling. Our Simeon, however, holds that a partnership with a Gentile is not subject to the law of the firstborn, and therefore, in respect to shearing and working, there is no necessity for a verse to make it permissible. The necessity, however, arises for a verse in respect to the first birth of an ass. This is quite right on the view of our Judah, for it is for the reason stated above that Scripture writes thy sheep and the words thine ox. Scripture adds merely on account of the words thine ass, but according to our Simeon, what need is there for the words thine ox and thy sheep? This is indeed a difficulty. Rabbi said, our Simeon. Agrees, however, that after the breaking of its neck it is forbidden to use it. What is the reason he draws a conclusion by analogy between Arafah the breaking of the neck here and Arafah mentioned in connection with the heifer that had its neck broken? Said Rabbi, on what evidence do I say this? Because it has been taught the fruit of trees of the first three years of mixed seeds in a vineyard and ox that is to be put to death by stoning, or the heifer that has had its neck broken? The birds of the leper, the first birth of an ass, and the mixture of meat and milk boiled together, all of them receive the uncleanness relating to food. Our Simeon says all of them do not receive the Levitical uncleanness relating to food. Our Simeon, however, agrees with regard to the mixture of meat and milk that it receives the uncleanness relating to food, since at one time it was fit to receive the uncleanness relating to food. And R.C. explained in the name of our Yohan, and what is the reason of? Our Simeon scripture writes all food therein which may be eaten we deduce that food which you can give Gentiles to eat is called food but food which you are unable to give Gentiles to eat is not called food Talmud, Mosbek wrote but if this is so then in the case of the mixture of meat and milk why should it be said that the reason that it receives Levitical uncleanness is because at one time it was fit for the uncleanness relating to food why not derive this from the fact that it is a food which you can give to Gentiles for it has been taught our Simeon the son of our Judah says in the name of our Simeon the mixture of meat and milk is forbidden to be eaten but it is permitted for general use since scripture says for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God and in another place scripture says and ye shall be holy men unto me as in that case it is forbidden to be eaten but it may be used generally so here in connection with the mixture of meat and milk it is forbidden to be eaten but it may be used generally our Simeon gives one reason and still another reason one reason why it should receive the uncleanness of food is because it is a food which can be given to Gentiles and still another reason because for the Israelite himself too there was a time before its boiling when it was fit to receive uncleanness now if there is any substance in the opinion that after the ass's neck is broken it is permitted according to our Simeon to be used let the above bury the state but our Simeon agrees in connection with the first birth of an ass and the mixture of meat and milk that they receive the Levitical uncleanness relating to food no if one had formed the intention of using the ass as food it would be so as you argue we are dealing here however in a case where he had not formed such an intention and what is then the reason that the majority of the rabbis our Simeon's disputants make it receive uncleanness rabbi said the following in the Presence of Arshis hate the reason is that its prohibition by scripture renders it important to be regarded as food but do we say according to the rabbis that the reason is since its prohibition renders it important have we not learned in a mission 13 things were said with reference to the carcass of a clean bird and this is one of them it requires the intention to be used as food but it does not need to be rendered fit to receive uncleanness now if its prohibition signalizes it as food to receive uncleanness what need is there for the intention of using it as food the mission just quoted represents the opinion of our Simeon come and hear the carcass of an unclean animal in all places and the carcass of a clean bird and the fat of the carcass of a clean animal in the villages require the intention of being used as food in order to receive uncleanness but they do not need to be rendered fit to receive uncleanness now if you say that its prohibition renders it Important to receive uncleanness what need is there for the intention of using it as food this too represents the opinion of our Simeon come and hear the carcass of a clean animal in all places or the carcass of a clean bird or the fat of a ritually slaughtered animal in marketplaces do not require the intention of being used as food nor do they need to be rendered fit to receive uncleanness of food this implies that an unclean animal does require the intention of using it as food. In order to receive uncleanness and should you say that this too represents the opinion of our Simeon surely since the second part quoted below is the opinion of our Simeon then the first part cannot be according to the opinion of our Simeon for the second part states our Simeon says also a camel here rock badger and swine do not require the intention of using them as food in order to receive uncleanness nor need they be rendered fit to receive uncleanness and our Simeon further explained what is. The reason since these animals mentioned have marks of a clean animal no said rabbi all the authorities mentioned agree that we do not say that its prohibition by the scriptures renders it important to receive the uncleanness relating to food and as to your question what is the reason of the rabbis if the ass's neck has been broken it would really be so talmud, mosbek or opi but here we
Order to practice since even if he unintentionally ritually killed it the case should also be identical the answer is yes it is so but it is on account of Nemos that it does not state this have raised the following objection if he did not wish to redeem the ass he breaks its neck with ashes from the back and buries it and it must not be used these are the teachings of Arjuna but Arsimian permits it to be used explained in the following manner when alive it is forbidden to use it. First birth of an ass but Arsimian permits this but since the second part of the above passage refers to it when alive then the first part must refer to it when it is not alive for the second part states he must not kill the ass with a cane nor with a sickle nor with a spade nor with a son or may he let it enter an enclosure and lock the door on it in order that it may die and it is forbidden to shear it or to work with it these are the teachings of Arjuna but Arsimian permits this it. First and the second parts we may explain both refer to an ass when alive the first part however refers to monetary benefit and the second part refers to the benefit derived from its body and both parts require to be stated for if we had only the part referring to monetary benefit I might have assumed that in that peculiar case our simian permits whereas with regard to the benefit derived from its body I might have said that he agrees with Arjuna and if we had only the part referring to the benefit derived from its body I might have supposed that Arjuna forbids in that particular case whereas in the case of monetary benefit I might have said that he agrees with our simian therefore both parts are necessary and so our naman reported in the name of Rabbi the son of Abu our simian agrees that after the neck has been broken it is forbidden to be used and our naman said on what evidence do I say this because it has been taught scripture says then thou shalt break its neck here the Word Arafa is used and above the word Arafa is used just as above it is forbidden to be used so here also it is forbidden to be used whose opinion does this represent shall I say it is according to the opinion of Arjuna surely he prohibits it even when alive must you not therefore admit that it is the opinion of our Simeon said Arshis hate to him Safra our fellow student interpreted it as follows the above Arafa can still be the opinion of Arjuna and yet there is need for stating it I might have assumed that since Arafa stands in the place of redemption as redemption makes it permissible to be used so Arafa is permitted he consequently informs us that it is not so said Arnaman on what evidence do I say this from what our Levi taught the Israelite causes a monetary loss to the priest therefore he should suffer a monetary loss whose opinion does this represent shall I say that it is the opinion of Arjuna surely his loss is of long standing must we not therefore Admit that it is the opinion of our Simeon if you choose I may say it is the opinion of our Judah and if you choose I may say that it is the opinion of our Simeon if you choose I may say that it is the opinion of our Judah and he speaks of the loss entailed in the difference and if you choose I may say that it is the opinion of our Simeon and he speaks of the loss incurred by its death and so did Rush Lakish say our Simeon agrees that the ass after its neck has been broken is forbidden to be used but our Yohanan or as some say our Eliezer says the difference between the rabbis and our Simeon still prevails even in such circumstances some report this our Naman's ruling in connection with the following if one betrothed the woman with the first birth of an ass she is not betrothed are we to say that the Mishnah is not according to the opinion of our Simeon our Naman reported in the name of Rabbi the son of Abu'ah the Mishnah refers to a case where the neck had been broken and therefore agrees with all. The authorities concerned some there are who say whose opinion does this represent neither the opinion of Arjuna nor that of our Simeon for if it is the opinion of our Simeon let her become betrothed with the whole value of the ass and if it is the opinion of Arjuna let her become betrothed with the difference said Rabbi Abba in the name of Rabbi Mishnah can still be the opinion of Arjuna e.g. where the ass was of the value only of a shekel and he holds according to the view of our Hosea B. Judah for it has been taught scripture says thou shalt redeem thou shalt redeem one text thou shalt redeem intimates immediately and the other text thou shalt redeem intimates with whatever value but our Hosea B. Judah says there can be no redemption with less than the value of a shekel the master said scripture says thou shalt redeem thou shalt redeem the one text thou shalt redeem intimates immediately and the other text thou shalt redeem intimates with whatever value is. Not this obvious it is necessary to state it I might have assumed that since an unclean animal is compared with the firstborn of a man just as in the case of the firstborn of a man the redemption takes place after a period of thirty days and with the sum of five cellars so here also the redemption should take place after a period of thirty days and with the sum of five cellars therefore scripture states thou shalt redeem biz immediately thou shalt redeem biz with whatever value our Jose be. Judah says there is no redemption with less than the value of one shekel but which way do you take it if our Jose compares an unclean animal with the firstborn of a man then the sum of five cellars is required for redemptions and if he does not compare an unclean animal with the firstborn of a man whence does he derive that the redemption is with a shekel in fact he does not compare an unclean animal with the firstborn of a man yet said Rabbi scripture says and all valuations shall. Be according to the shekel of the sanctuary intimating that any valuations which you assess shall be no less in value than a shekel and the rabbis who differ with our Jose what say they Talmud, Mosbek or that verse refers to the amount of one's means said our nom and the Halachah is according to the teachings of the sages and how much must be the value of the lamb said our Joseph even a puny lamb worth no more than a dunk said Rabbi we have learned this too the lamb for redemption can either be large or small without a blemish or blemish is this not evident you might have assumed that to that extent i.e. that of a puny lamb etc it is not an adequate redemption or indeed which would be better a puny lamb is not an adequate redemption at all our Joseph consequently informs us that it is an adequate redemption our Judah the prince had a first birth of an ass he sent it to our Tarfan he asked him how much am I required to give the priest he replied to him behold it. Rabbi said the liberal person redeems with a cellophore zoos the stingy person redeems with a shekel two zoos an average person redeems with a regia said Rabbi the law requires redemption with a regia and how much is this three zoos less than one and more than the other does not this ruling contradict the above there is no difficulty we are dealing here with the case when one comes to seek advice and the case there is where he redeems of his own accord our Isaac reported in the name of Resh. Lakish if one possesses a first birth of an ass and he has not a lamb with which to redeem it he redeems it for its equivalent value according to whose opinion is this shall I say it is according to our Judah did he not say that the Torah was particular that the redemption must be with a sheep you must then say it is according to the view of our Simeon Arah stated it thus Rabbi found a difficulty in the difference between our Judah and our Simeon the law is according to our Judah moreover the tenor. Of our mission states the law anonymously in the sense of our Judah and still you declare the Halachah is according to our Simeon but rather say that our Isaac's statement accords even with the opinion of our Judah for let not the redemption of the first birth of an ass be more stringent than other consecrated objects moreover the Torah did not propose by the law of redeeming with a lamb to make it severe for him but on the contrary to make it easier for him our Nehemiah the son of our Joseph redeemed the first birth of an ass with boiled herbs of its equivalent value our by reported in the name of our if one redeems the ass of his neighbor it is a valid redemption the question was raised is it a valid redemption as regards the person who redeems it or does it mean that it is a valid redemption as regards the owner according to the opinion of our Simeon there is no need to inquire for since he says that it is permitted to use the first birth of an ass it is the owner's money the Question does arise however according to the opinion of Arjuna who says that it is forbidden to use it does he compare it with the consecrated object concerning which the divine law says and he shall give money and it shall be assured to him or perhaps since the owner possesses the difference between the value of the ass and a sheep it is not compared with the consecrated object said Arnav and come and here if one stole the first birth of an ass belonging to his neighbor he pays double to the owner for although he does not possess the rights of ownership now he will possess subsequently now whose opinion does this represent shall I say that it is the opinion of Arsimian why has he no rights of ownership now then obviously it must be the opinion of Arjuna now if you were to assume that we compare it with the consecrated object does not the divine law say and it be stolen out of a man's house implying but not from the possession of the sanctuary and there is nothing more to be said. If one she ass had given birth before and one had not given birth before etc. Our rabbis taught under what circumstances did the sages rule that it enters the shed to be tithed you cannot say that it means where the lamb came into the possession of the
is his and it was necessary to teach both cases for had our not only the first case I might have assumed that the reason was because it was already set aside but here in the second case since gifts for the priest which have not yet been taken by the priest are not considered as having been given I might have said it is not so and if he had only taught the second case I might have assumed that the reason why the tithes are his is because it is possible to tithe people as it is for. It lies in one place but in the other case since the lamb comes from another place we do not say that it is as if it were already set aside and therefore I might have said that it was not as stated it was therefore necessary to state both cases our Samuel be Nathan reported in the name of our Hannah if one who buys untithed grain Talmud, Moss Pekorot be evenly piled up from a Gentile he tithes it and it is his who piled it up shall I say that a Gentile piled it up surely the text says that corn implying but not the corn of a Gentile rather we are dealing here with a case where the Israelites piled it up in the domain of a Gentile he tithes it because a Gentile has not the right of possession in Palestine to release produce from the obligation of tithing and it is his because he says to the priest I have acquired my rights from a man with whom you cannot go to law we have learned elsewhere if a man deposits his fruits with a kutian or with an amhire as it may be presumed that they retain their former condition in respect of tithes and the sabbatical year but if with a Gentile they are like the Gentiles fruits are Simeon says they are demi I said our Eliezer that the priest's share should be set aside all the authorities mentioned agree where they differ is on the question whether to give it to the priest the first Tana mentioned holds that he has certainly changed them and therefore he must give the priestly share to the priest whereas our Simeon maintains that they have the law of Demi Ardimi was once sitting and repeating this teaching said Abbe to him the reason is because we are in doubt whether he changed them or not but if he certainly changed the fruits all the authorities mentioned would agree that he is required to give the priestly share to the priest would they not but surely did not our Samuel report in the name of our Hannah if one bought untithed grain from a Gentile piled up in proper shape he gives tithes and it is his perhaps he Reply the one refers to great Terima and our Samuel's report refers to the Terima of the tithe said Abbe this indeed reminds me of something which supports your very explanation for our Joshua the son of Levi said whence do we derive that a purchaser of untithed grain from a Gentile piled up in proper shape is exempt from the Terima of the tithe because scripture says moreover thou shalt speak unto the Levites and say unto them when ye take of the children of Israel we infer that from the untithed grain which you buy from the children of Israel you separate the terima of the tithe and give it to the priest but from untithed grain which you buy from a Gentile you do not separate terima of the tithe and give it to the priest and if it died he benefits therefrom in what circumstances are we to suppose it to have died shall I say that it died in the possession of the priest and that he is permitted to benefit therefrom this is obvious since it is his own money again if it means that it died in the possession of the owner and that he the priest is permitted to benefit therefrom this too is obvious I might have assumed that as long as the animal has not reached the priest's hands the latter does not really possess it the mission accordingly informs us that from the time that the Israelite has set it aside it stands in the domain of the priest Talmud Mos Bekorot, a mission we do not redeem a first birth of an ass either with a cafe beast of Chasen. Animal ritually killed it for Kilei Yim or Koi or Eliezer permits however redemption with Kilei Yim because it is also described as a lamb but he forbids with a Koi because its nature is doubtful if he gave the first birth of an ass itself to the priest the latter must not retain it unless he sets aside a lamb in its place Gemara whose opinion does the Mishnah represent it is that of Ben Bag Bag for it has been taught we read here in connection with the redemption of the first birth it. Word lamb and we read elsewhere with reference to the Paschal offering the word lamb just as their scripture excludes all those named in the mission above as unsuitable for the Paschal offering so here also it excludes all those named as unsuitable for the object of redeeming now you might assume that just as the Paschal offering must be a male without a blemish and a year old similarly here in connection with the redemption of the first birth of an ass it must be a male without a Blemish and a year old the text therefore states thou shalt redeem and repeats thou shalt redeem to include even other than a male etc. Now if the repetition thou shalt redeem thou shalt redeem has for its purpose to include then why not include also all those animals named in the mission as being unsuitable to redeem if this were so what is the use of the analogy above between the words lamb lamb the question was raised what is the ruling as regards redeeming a first birth with a ben. Pico according to the opinion of our mayor there is no need for you to ask for since our mayor said a ben pico requires ritual slaughter it is a perfect lamb but the question does arise according to the opinion of the rabbis who hold that its mother slaughtering makes it permitted to be eaten without slaughtering so that it is like flesh in the pot or are we to say that since at the moment it runs and walks we can describe it as a lamb our zitra said we do not redeem with it said our ashi. To Marzitra, what is your reason? Is it because you infer this from the Paschal offering which cannot be a hen pico? Then why not say also that as in the case of the Paschal offering it must be a male without a blemish and a year old? So here the animal for redeeming must be a male without a blemish and a year old. The text thou shalt redeem and its repetition thou shalt redeem includes even other than a male, etc. But if the repetition thou shalt redeem thou shalt redeem has for its object to include, then why not include also ben pico? If so, what need is therefore the analogy above derived from the words lamb lamb? The question was raised, what is the ruling as regards redeeming the first birth of an ass with an itma? You cannot ask according to our Eliezer, for since according to him we may redeem with kilaim, how much more so with an itma? The question does arise, however, according to the opinion of the rabbis, do we say that we are forbidden to redeem with kilaim, but we May redeem with an admet or perhaps there is no difference and in both cases we are forbidden to redeem with them come and here if a cow gave birth to something looking like a kid we do not redeem with it from this we infer that if you gave birth to what looks like a kid we do redeem with it now whose opinion does this represent shall I assume it is the opinion of our Eliezer but do we not also redeem with Kilaim according to him you must then say that it is the opinion of the rabbis. No you can still maintain that it is the opinion of our Eliezer and he teaches us this very thing that if a cow gave birth to what looked like a kid we do not redeem with it and that you should not say decide according to the offspring itself and this is a genuine kid but we rather say decide according to its mother and therefore it is a calf come and here for Rabbi B. Samuel learned what is Kilaim you which gave birth to something that looked like a kid though its father was a sheep of it. Father was a sheep, is it Kilaim? Is it not Nidmer? Rather than put it in this way, what is that which is like Kilaim? So that the rabbis have placed it on a PAR with Kilaim, a you which gave birth to what looked like a kid, though its father was a sheep. Now, for what purpose does the very to say that we like a Nidmer Kilaim if in respect of dedicating it as a sacrifice? Surely this is not necessary since from the text from which we derive the exclusion of Kilaim is unsuitable for a sacrifice on the altar. We also derive the exclusion of Nidmer, for it has been taught scripture says when a bullock or a sheep intimating the exclusion of Kilaim or a goat intimates the exclusion of Nidmer, is it then in order to exclude Nidmer from the rule of the firstling? Surely the divine law says, but the firstling of an ox implying that it is not subject to the law of the firstling until the father is an ox and the offspring is an ox, obviously excluding Nidmer, is it then from it? Rule of tithing of animals. The rule for both Nidma and Kilaim is expressly derived from the analogy of the words under under mentioned. In both cases, you must say that it is with regard to the first birth of an ass. No, the comparison of Nidma with Kilaim can still refer to tithing, and we suppose to a case where the Nidma possesses certain marks similar to its mother. I might in this case assume that we draw an analogy between the passing mentioned in connection with tithing and the passing mentioned in connection with the firstling. Therefore, we are told that we rather draw the analogy between under mentioned here and under mentioned in connection with consecrated sacrifices. The question was raised: What is the ruling as regards redeeming the first birth of an ass with dedicated sacrifices, which became unfit for the altar? This question does not arise if we accept the opinion of our Simeon, for since he holds that it is permitted to be used before its redemption. It is unconsecrated. The question does arise, however, according to the opinion of our Judah, who says that it is forbidden to be used before its redemption. What is the ruling? Since it is forbidden to be used, do we apply the principle that one prohibition does not take effect where another
holds there is no uncertain first birth of an ass which requires redemption. The question does arise, however, according to the opinion of Arjuna, what is the ruling since he sets aside a lamb and it remains for himself, we can apply to it the designation for food, or perhaps since as long as the ass's prohibition is not cancelled, it is not permitted, it is like trading with the fruits of the sabbatical year. Come and here for Arhista said, if an animal has been purchased with the fruits of it. Sabbatical year we are not permitted to redeem with it an ass distinctly a first birth, but it is permitted to redeem there with an uncertain first birth. Arhista further said an animal bought with the fruits of the sabbatical year is not liable to the law of the firstling, it is subject, however, to the law of the gifts which are the prerogative of the priest, it is not liable to the law of the firstling because the divine law says for food implying but not for burning, and it is subject to the law. Of gifts for we can apply to it the designation for food an objection was raised from the following if one eats from the dough of the sabbatical year before the hala has been taken he incurs the guilt of death at the hands of heaven but why since if it became levitically unclean it is fit for burning and the divine law says for food implying but not for burning the case is different here for it says throughout your generations it has been taught to the same effect whence do we derive that if one eats from the dough of the sabbatical year before its hala is taken he incurs the guilt of death because it is said throughout your generations but why not derive that the firstling bought with the fruits of the sabbatical year is liable to the law of the firstling from the case of hala in the case of hala its separation is mainly for the eating of the priests except when it receives uncleanness but in the case of the firstling the portion for the altar is mainly for burning if he gave it to the priest etc we have learned here that which our rabbis have taught if an Israelite had a first birth of an ass in his house and the priest said to him give it to me and I will redeem it he should not give it to him except the priest redeem it in his presence are nominated reported in the name of Rabbi the son of Abuah this proves that the priests are suspected of neglecting the redemption of the first births of asses surely this deduction is evident you might have assumed that this is the case only where he is known to be suspected but generally we do not suspect the priest he therefore informs us that he usually decides that it is a legitimate act mission if one sets aside a lamb for the redemption of the first birth of an ass and it died our Eliezer says he is responsible as is the case with the five sellers in connection with the redemption of the firstborn but the sages say he is not responsible as is the case with the redemption of the second Years tithing our Joshua and our Zadok testified concerning the redemption of the first birth of an ass which died that the priest receives nothing in such circumstances if the first birth of an ass died after the lamb for redemption had been set aside our Eliezer says it shall be buried but the lamb may be used whereas the sages say it is not required to be buried and the lamb belongs to the priest Gemara said our Joseph what is the reason of our Eliezer because scripture writes nevertheless the firstborn of man shalt thou surely redeem and the firstling of unclean beasts shalt thou redeem just as in the case of the firstborn of a man he is responsible if the redemption money is lost similarly in the case of the first birth of an unclean animal he is responsible if the redemption lamb dies said to him if the comparison be correct then as in the case of the firstborn of a man it is permitted to benefit from his work before redemption so in the case of an unclean Animal, it should be permitted to benefit from it, and should you assume that this is so? Have we not learned in a mission if the first birth of an ass dies? Our Eliezer says it shall be buried. What does he mean by the phrase "it shall be buried"? Does he not mean that it is forbidden to use it? No, it means it shall be buried, as in the case of the firstborn of a man. But am I to infer that on why a firstborn of a man requires burial, but that a plain Israelite does not require burial? And moreover, it has been taught our Eliezer agrees that if an Israelite has an uncertain first birth of an ass in his house, he sets aside a lamb on its behalf, and it is his rather said. Rather, the following is the reason of our Eliezer. Scripture says, nevertheless, the firstborn of man shall thou surely redeem. Scripture implies I have compared an unclean animal with the first birth of a man in connection with the responsibility for redemption, but not as regards any other matter. We have learned elsewhere in a. Mission evaluations are according to their period. The redemption of the firstborn takes place after 30 days, and the redemption of the first birth of an ass takes place immediately. But does the redemption of the first birth of an ass take place immediately? Against this, I quote the following in contradiction: the period of valuation or redemption of the firstborn or Nazi rightship or redemption of the first birth of an ass is in no case less than 30 days, but we can extend the time in each of these cases indefinitely. Set are from it, but owing to the fact that an unclean animal is compared with the firstborn of man, and usually a dead firstborn receives burial, nom in the statement above that the redemption of the first birth takes place immediately means to inform us that if he redeemed it, it is redeemed. This would imply that in the case of his firstborn son, if he redeemed him within the 30 days, he is not redeemed. Has it not been stated if one redeems his son within it? 30 days Rab holds his son is redeemed but surely has it not been stated in this connection Rabbah said all authorities agree that if he said that the firstborn should be redeemed from now before the expiry of the 30 days then his son is not redeemed Talmud, Mas Bekor wrote Arshis hate said the above very the means to inform us that he does not transgress on account of the first birth Rami the son of Hammer raised an objection from the following the duty of redemption is for the entire period of 30 days after that either he redeems it or breaks its neck what does it mean does it not mean that it is a religious duty to retain it for the whole period of 30 days no it means that it is a religious duty to redeem it all the 30 days if this is the case what it should say is after that either he redeems it or he transgresses the command to redeem rather said Rabbah there is no contradiction the one statement that redemption is after 30 days gives it Opinion of our Eliezer who compares an unclean animal with the firstborn of a man and the other statement that redemption takes place immediately gives the opinion of the rabbis who do not make this comparison mission if he does not wish to redeem it the first birth of an ass he breaks its neck from behind and buries it the mizwah of redemption is prior to the mizwah of breaking its neck for it says and if thou wilt not redeem it then thou shalt break its neck the mizwah of Udis prior to the mizwah of redemption for it says who hath betrothed her to himself the mizwah of Yubam is prior to the mizwah of Eliza this was the case at first when the parties concerned used to carry out the law with religious intentions but now that they do not carry out the law religiously the rabbis have said the mizwah of Eliza is prior to the mizwah of Yubam the mizwah of redemption of an unclean animal whose value is dedicated to the sanctuary rests with the owner he is first before any other man for it says or if it be not redeemed then it shall be sold according to the valuation chapteri mission an Israelite who buys an embryo of a cow belonging to a heathen or who sells one to him although this is not permitted or who forms a partnership with him or who receives an animal from him to look after or who gives his cow to him to look after is exempt from the law of the firstling for it says I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel but not in Gentiles. Priests and Levites are subject to the law of the firstling they are not exempt from the law of the firstling of a clean animal but only of a firstborn son and the firstborn of an ass Gemara why does the redactor of the mission state the case of the embryo of an ass in the first chapter and subsequently in the second chapter the case of an embryo of a cow why not state in the first chapter the case of an embryo of a cow since it is a case of an animal consecrated as such and Subsequently in the case of an embryo of an ass as it is a case of an animal consecrated only for its value it was explained in the West Palestine if you choose I may say the reason is because he dwelt with peculiar pleasure on this case in the manner of our Hannah explained above or if you prefer I can say it is because the regulations concerning an unclean animal are relatively few the redactor of the mission therefore cleared them out of the way first our Isaac B. Namani reported in the name of Resh Lakish on behalf of our Oshia if an Israelite gave money to a heathen for his animal we judge the transaction according to their laws and even though he did not pull the animal he acquires possession and is subject to the law of the firstling if a heathen gives money to an Israelite for his animal we also judge the transaction according to their laws and although he did not pull the animal he acquires possession and is exempt from the law of the firstling the master says if an Israelite gave money to a heathen we judge the transaction according to their laws and although he did not pull the animal he acquires possession and is subject to the law of the firstling what does their laws mean shall we say that according to their laws means as regards the person of the heathen and we conclude a fortiori that if the person of the heathen is acquired by the Israelite for money
Method of his acquiring must resemble the form of acquiring mentioned in connection with the text by neighbor just as in the case of thy neighbor i.e. an Israelite possession can be acquired only in one way so in the case of a heathen only in one way the master said but if a heathen gave money to an Israelite for his animal he judged the transaction according to their laws and even though he did not pull the animal he acquires possession and is exempt from the law of the firstling. What does according to their laws mean if the expression according to their laws refers to the person of the Israelite who is acquired with money by a heathen and we infer a fortiori if the person of an Israelite is acquired with money for scripture rights out of the money that he was bought for how much more so is the Israelite's property acquired by means of money by a Gentile this can be refuted by the case of a transaction between Israelites for his person is acquired with money. And yet his property is acquired by Meshach or rather said of a according to their laws means those which the Torah laid down for them scripture says and if thou sell off to thy neighbor we infer from this that to thy neighbor the way of acquiring possession is by Meshach but in the case of a Gentile possession is acquired with money but why not say that for a heathen there is no way for acquiring possession at all I can answer no have we not in a fortiori argument if a heathen can acquire the person of an Israelite with money how much more so is this the case with the property of an Israelite but why not say that for a heathen there must be two ways of acquiring possession but is there not the a fortiori argument to the contrary if a heathen acquires possession of the person of an Israelite by one act only should the Israelite's property be acquired only by two acts but why not say that a heathen acquires possession of an Israelite's property either by means of one or the other, the way of acquiring possession must resemble what is mentioned in connection with the text. Thy neighbor Talmud, Mas Pekoro P as thy neighbor, i.e., an Israelite acquires possession only in one way, so the heathen acquires possession only in one way. It was argued now according to Amimar who said that Meshach affects possession in the case of a heathen. This might be right if he holds according to the opinion of our Yohanan who maintains that according to the biblical law, money affects possession between Israelites, whereas Meshach does not affect possession. The text to thy neighbor serves then the purpose of allowing us to deduce that to thy neighbor, i.e., an Israelite money affects possession, but for a heathen to affect possession, Meshach is required. But if he holds according to the opinion of Rush Lakish who maintains that Meshach is expressly mentioned in the Torah with the indicating result that to thy neighbor, an Israelite with Meshach and for a heathen with Meshika what need then is there for the text to thy neighbor it can be explained thus the text means to thy neighbor you return an overcharge but you do not return an overcharge to a Canaanite a heathen but do we not derive the exclusion of the law of overcharging in connection with the Canaanite from the following text ye shall not oppress one another one text refers to a Canaanite and the other refers to sacred property and it was necessary to teach both cases for if the divine law had written only one text I might have assumed that as regards a Canaanite there is no law concerning overreaching but in regard to sacred property the law of overreaching is enforced therefore scripture teaches us that this is not so this would hold good according to him who says that the robbed object of a Canaanite is forbidden to be retained therefore a scriptural text is necessary to permit the retention of overreaching but if he holds with him who says that the Robbed object of a Canaanite is allowed to be retained. Can there be any question about permitting to retain overreaching? I can answer if Amimar holds according to him who says that the robbed object of a Canaanite is allowed to be retained, then perforce he will hold according to the view of our Yohanan. An objection was raised if one buys broken pieces of silver from heathen and finds among them an idol. If he made Meshika before he had given the purchase money, he should withdraw from the transaction. But if he made Meshika after he had given the money, he should carry the benefit derived therefrom to the dead sea. Now, if you hold that money affects possession, what need is there for Meshika? We are dealing here with the case where the heathen undertook to act in the matter in accordance with Israelite law. If so, what need is there for money as a means of affecting possession? This is what the Beretha intends to say, although he had given the money if he made Meshika. Then he can withdraw, but if not, he cannot do so. If this is the case, there is a difficulty in the first part of the Beretha said, Abbe, the reason of the first part of the Beretha is because it was made in error. Rabba said to him, You say that the reason of the first part of the Beretha is because it was made in error, but is the last part of the Beretha also not a case of a purchase in error? Rather said, Rabba, both the first and the last parts deal with the case of a purchase in error, but in the case stated in the first part where he had not yet given the money, the idol does not appear to have been in the possession of an Israelite, whereas in the last part of the Beretha where he had given the money, the idol appears to have been in the possession of an Israelite, and Abbe, he will explain thus the first part is a case of a purchase made in error, for he did not know of the idol since he had not yet paid the money, but the last part is a case of a purchase made in Error for since he had given the money when he was about to make Meshika he should have examined the purchase and then made Meshika or as he said since in the first part of the Beretha Meshika does not affect possession in the last part also Meshika does not affect possession but as he mentions Meshika in the first part he also states Meshika in the last part Rabbin has said since in the last part Meshika affects possession in the first part too Meshika affects possession and what the first part says in effect is this if he had not given the money nor made Meshika he withdraws what is then meant by he withdraws that he can retract his words for he the tana of the Beretha maintains to retract one's words indicates a want of honesty but this is the case only with an Israelite dealing with an Israelite because they stand by their word whereas in the case of an Israelite dealing with Gentiles since the latter do not stand by their word it is not so Talmud Mosbeck wrote a mission all dedicated sacrifices which had a permanent blemish before their dedication and were redeemed are liable to the law of the firstling and the priestly gifts they become unconsecrated animals as regards shearing and working their offspring and milk are permitted to be used after their redemption he who slaughters them without the temple court does not incur the punishment of excision and the law of substitute does not apply to them and if they died before redemption they may be redeemed except in the case of the firstling and an animal set aside for tithe of cattle all animals however which were dedicated before they became blemished or had only suffered a transitory blemish before their dedication and after that developed a permanent blemish and were redeemed are exempt from the law of the firstling and from the priestly gifts they do not become unconsecrated as regards shearing and working their offspring and milk are forbidden to be used after their Redemption he who slaughters them without the temple court is punishable with excision the law of substitute applies to them and if they die they are to be buried Gemara the reason is because they were redeemed but if they were not redeemed they would have been exempt from the law of the firstling and from the priestly gifts for the Mishnah holds that the consecration of an object consecrated for its value sets aside the law of the firstling and the duty of the priestly gifts and they become unconsecrated etc the reason is because they were redeemed but if they were not redeemed they would have been forbidden as regards shearing and working this would confirm the opinion of our Eliezer who said animals dedicated for keeping the temple in repair are forbidden as regards shearing and working no it can he maintain that this is no proof for an object consecrated for its value eventually to be used for the altar might be confused with an object which is itself consecrated for the altar therefore the rabbis enacted a prohibition but in the case of an object dedicated for keeping the temple in repair the rabbis did not enact a prohibition their offspring and milk are permitted etc how is this to be understood shall I say that we speak of where they became pregnant and gave birth after their redemption surely this is obvious they are unconsecrated animals rather what is meant is that they were pregnant before their redemption and gave birth after their redemption this implies that before their redemption the offspring are forbidden Talmud Mosbeck wrote the point that arises can they be redeemed even when they are without a blemish or can they not be redeemed so long as they are without a blemish come and here if one consecrated animals having a permanent blemish for the altar and they gave birth they are to be sold and the offspring do not need a blemish because they receive no sanctity for we cannot be more stringent with the subsidiary then with the principal object now the reason why the offspring do not require a blemish before redemption is because we should not be more stringent with the subsidiary than with the principal but if he consecrated a male animal for its value it receives the sanctity of an animal consecrated as such this would support Rabba's teaching for Rabba said if one consecrated a male animal for its value it receives the sanctity of an animal which has been consecrated in itself he who slaughters them. Without the temple court does not incur the punishment of excision our Eliezer quoted with reference to this passage of the Mishnah he is culpable
Scripture consequently informs us that this is not so in connection with the type animal too we draw an analogy between passing and passing used in connection with the firstling but why not then say let us apply the text above to an animal exchanged for a dedicated sacrifice for I might have been inclined to assume that since it is sacred even if blemished since scripture writes neither shall he alter it or change it etc therefore it should be offered up even blemished and consequently. Scripture teaches us that it is not so scripture says that it and that for which it is changed shall be holy it thus compares the exchanged animal with the animal itself as the animal itself is unfit for the altar if blemished so the exchanged animal with the blemish is unfit for the altar are zeradimmered why not say apply the text to the blemished offspring born of unblemished sacrifices for I might have been inclined to assume they are holy even blemished through their mother therefore. They may be offered up even blemished and scripture therefore informs us that it is not so said Rabbi Atana of the school of our Ishmael has already pronounced on the matter for Atana of the school of our Ishmael taught scripture says only thy holy things which thou hast and thy vows only thy holy things this refers to exchanged animals which thou hast these are the offspring of dedicated sacrifices and thy vows scripture here compares them with an animal vowed for a sacrifice as an animal. Vowed for a sacrifice is unfit for the altar with a blemish so these two are unfit with a blemish the law of substitute does not apply to them etc what is the reason because scripture says he shall not alter it nor change it a good for a bad or a bad for a good now if a bad i.e. a blemished consecrated animal must not be exchanged for a good and unblemished and unconsecrated animal is it necessary to inform us concerning the prohibition of exchanging a good and unblemished consecrated animal. For a bad blemished animal what is meant then is that to an animal good i.e. unblemished from the start before dedication but which became blemished afterwards the law of substitute applies but to one bad i.e. blemished from the start before dedication the law of substitute does not apply and if they die they may be redeemed Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab this is the teaching of our Simeon who said objects consecrated for the altar were at first included in the law of presentation and valuation whereas objects consecrated for keeping the temple in repair were not included in the law of presentation and valuation for we have learned our Simeon says objects consecrated for keeping the temple in repair if they die are redeemed our Simeon agrees however that an animal blemished from the start before dedication may be redeemed what is the reason because scripture says and the priest shall value it the word it excludes the case of an animal with a blemish from the start before dedication but the sages say if they die they are to be buried who are the sages referred to here it is a tana of the school of Levi for a tana of the school of Levi taught all objects were at first included in the law of presentation and valuation even an animal blemished from the start before dedication and thus did the school of Levi teach in his mission even a beast and even a bird but does not scripture say it the word it according to the opinion of the tana of the school of Levi is a difficulty but the rabbis who differ from our Simeon what is the position is it a fact that they hold that if the blemished dedicated animal died it is redeemed if so Talmud, Mosbek or a in connection with Rab's observation above what should be said is this is the teaching of our Simeon and those who dispute with him I can answer Rab holds with our Simeon the son of Lakish who explained that according to the rabbis who differ with our Simeon objects dedicated for the keeping of the temple in repair were at first included in the law of presentation and valuation whereas objects dedicated for the altar were not included in the law of presentation and valuation therefore the Mishnah cannot be explained to agree completely with the views of the rabbis for it states in the later clause and if they die they shall be buried but whence can we prove that the reason of the Mishnah why they shall be buried is because they are subject to the law of presentation and valuation perhaps the reason is because we may not redeem dedicated sacrifices in order to give food to dogs we can answer if this is so then let the Mishnah state if they become true for they shall be buried or if you choose another solution I can say that Rab in fact holds with our Yohanan and read in the passage above this is the teaching both of our Simeon and of those who dispute with him but if their dedication preceded etc whence is this proof our rabbis have taught Scripture says how be it as a gazelle and as a heart as a gazelle is exempt from the law of the firstling so dedicated sacrifices which have become unfit for the altar are also exempt from the law of the firstling I would then exclude the firstling and not the priestly gifts the text therefore states a heart as a heart is exempt from the law of the firstling and from the duty of priestly gifts so blemished dedicated sacrifices are exempt from the law of the firstling and of the priestly gifts am I to say that just as the fat of a gazelle and a heart is permitted to be used so the fat of blemished dedicated sacrifices is also permitted to be used for this reason the text states aka how be it which intimates a distinction the master said I would then exclude the firstling but not the priestly gifts now what is the difference I exclude the firstling because its law does not equally apply in all cases whereas I do not exclude the priestly gifts as their law Applies equally in all cases hence scripture states a heart said our papa to have a one not say that just as the law concerning the killing of the young with its mother on the same day does not apply to a gazelle and a heart so the law concerning the killing of the mother on the same day does not apply to dedicated sacrifices which have become unfit for the altar he replied to him with what will you compare blemished dedicated sacrifices to render them exempt from the law regarding the killing of the young with its mother on the same day if you compare them with unconsecrated animals then the law concerning the killing of the young with its mother on the same day should apply to them and if you compare them with dedicated sacrifices here also the law regarding the killing of the young with its mother on the same day should apply to them you reply to him if so then in regard to the fat of blemish dedicated animals why not say likewise as follows with what will you compare them if with unconsecrated animals their fat is forbidden and if with dedicated sacrifices their fat is forbidden but did you not say that the word ak implies but not their fat then similarly this the word ak is implying but the law regarding the killing of the young with its mother on the same day is not included in the analogy rabbi said the word ak serves to exclude from the analogy the law concerning the killing of the young with its mother on the same day while as regards the fat a blemish dedicated sacrifices we derive the prohibition from the words of blood thereof for it is written only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof what do the words of blood thereof mean you can hardly say that it actually means the blood thereof for granting that it is only as the blood of a gazelle and heart is then the blood of a gazelle and heart permitted the words of blood thereof then refer to its fat and why does not scripture expressly write its fat if the divine law had written the word fat I might have assumed that both the analogy and the scriptural verse helped to define the nature of the prohibition of the fat the analogy between the word fat and the words as a gazelle and heart helped to exclude it from the punishment of excision for scripture imposes the punishment of excision only on one who eats the fat of an animal as it says for whosoever eats the fat of the animal and the scriptural verse also helped to make the eating of the fat of blemished sacrifices equivalent to the breaking of a mere prohibition therefore the divine law used the expression the blood thereof to teach you that as the eating of its blood is punishable with excision so the eating of its fat is punishable with excision but does not the tana above in the very to say that the word ak implies but not its fat this is what the tana intends to say if there were not a text the blood thereof I might have said that the word ak implies but not its fat now however that scripture says the blood thereof the word ak serves to exclude from the analogy the law regarding the killing of the young with its mother on the same day and they do not become unconsecrated whence is this derived our rabbis taught scripture says notwithstanding thou mayest kill implying but not cheer the text continues further flesh implying but not milk and eat implying but not for dogs hence we infer that we do not redeem dedicated sacrifices to give food to the dogs. Talmud, Mosbek or Opisum there are who say thou mayest kill and eat the permission of eating of blemished dedicated sacrifices is only from the time of their killing and thenceforward we may however redeem dedicated sacrifices to give food to dogs their offspring and their milk are forbidden after their redemption how is this to be understood shall I say that they became pregnant and gave birth after their redemption why in that case should they be forbidden the offspring are as a Gazelle and heart rather what is meant is that they became pregnant before their redemption and give birth after their redemption but if they were born before their redemption they would indeed become holy whence is this proof for our rabbis taught scripture says whether male this includes the offspring of a peace offering it goes on or a female this includes an animal exchanged for a peace offering now I can only infer from these unblemished offspring and unblemished exchanged animals whence however can I derive blemished offspring and bl
He consecrates them for that particular sacrifice before their redemption. Does this mean to say that they are capable of redemption? Explain rather as follows before the redemption of their mother. He consecrated them for that particular sacrifice. And what is the reason said our Levi? It is a preventive measure lest he should rear of them flocks. Rub and asked of our she's hate. May he consecrate the offspring for any sacrifice that he chose. He replied, He may not consecrate them except for the particular sacrifice of the mother. What is the reason he said to him? There is an analogy between the words within the gates used in connection with blemish dedicated sacrifices and the words within the gates used in connection with the firstling, just as a firstling does not become consecrated after birth for any sacrifice which he chooses because scripture writes, Howbeit the firstling among the beasts which is born a firstling to the Lord, no man shall sanctify it, so these young ones do. Not become consecrated for any sacrifice he chooses. It has been taught in accordance with the opinion of Arshis. Hate dedicated sacrifices which became permanently blemished before their dedication and were redeemed are subject to the law of the firstling and of the priestly gifts, whether before their redemption or after their redemption. One who shears them and works with them does not receive forty lashes, whether before their redemption or after their redemption. The law of substitute does not apply to them before their redemption. The law of sacrilege applies to them, but after their redemption it does not. Their offspring are unconsecrated, even if an embryo before redemption and born after redemption they are redeemed unblemished and become consecrated for any sacrifice he chooses. The general rule in this matter is they are like unconsecrated animals in all particulars. The only religious duty which applies to them is that of valuing them for redemption, but if their dedication preceded their blemish or if a transitory blemish preceded their dedication and after that there appeared on them a permanent blemish and they were redeemed they are exempt from the law of the firstling and from the priestly gifts whether before their redemption or after their redemption one who shears and works them receives forty lashes whether before their redemption or after their redemption the law of substitute applies to them before their redemption sacrilege applies to them but not after their redemption their offspring are holy if an embryo before redemption they are not redeemed unblemished and they do not become consecrated for any sacrifice that he chooses the general rule in the matter is that they are like consecrated animals in all particulars you have only the permission to eat them now the general rule of the first part of the barrier above is stated in order to include the rule that one who slaughters them without the temple court is exempt from it Punishment of excision. The general rule of the second part of the Beretta Talmud, Mosbek wrote, is it is to include its milk. The master said they are not redeemed unblemished and they do not become consecrated for any sacrifice he chooses. The unblemished are not redeemed. We infer from this that the blemished are redeemed also for any sacrifice he chooses. They are not consecrated. We infer from this that for that particular sacrifice they are consecrated. Now, what do we find here that they are consecrated for that particular sacrifice and are redeemed when blemished? Shall we say that the CONFUTES are who not are who not can answer? Thus, the rule really is that blemished animals also are not redeemed. But since the first part of the Beretta states they are redeemed unblemished, therefore the second part of the Beretta also states they are not redeemed unblemished. And also, since it states in the first part of the Beretta for any sacrifice he chooses, the second part in it. Beretha also states for any sacrifice he chooses and he who slaughters them without the temple court is not culpable. Our Huma read as in the Mishnah he is culpable and he explains it of a case where the blemished animal had a withered spot in the eye cataract and in accordance with the opinion of our Akiba who maintains if they have been put on the altar they must not be taken down again both before its redemption and after its redemption the law of substitute applies our nomin reported in. The name of Rabbi the son of Abba and the exchanged animal after its redemption is left to die. What is the reason? How are we to do? Shall we offer it up? The animal exchange derives its status from cancelled holiness. Shall we redeem it? It is not qualified to receive redemption, therefore we leave it to die. Our Amram demurred and why should the exchanged animal not be eaten by the owners when blemished? In what way is this different from an animal exchanged for a firstling and a tithe animal for? We have learned animals exchanged for a firstling and a tithe animal and also their offspring and their offspring's offspring until the end of time are like a firstling and a tithe animal and are eaten by their owners when blemished said Abay to him in this case it bears the name of its mother and in the other case it bears the name of its mother in this case it bears the name of its mother for it is called the animal substituted for a firstling and a tithe animal and therefore as a firstling and a tithe animal are eaten by their owners when blemished so the exchanged animal is eaten under similar circumstances and in the other case it bears the name of its mother it is called the animal exchanged for the dedicated sacrifice and as a dedicated sacrifice which became blemished may not be eaten unless redeemed so also an animal exchanged for a dedicated sacrifice is not eaten unless redeemed but in this present case it is not qualified to receive redemption and therefore it is left to die. It has been taught in accordance with the opinion of our nomin. Whence do we derive that an animal exchanged for a blemish dedicated sacrifice is left to die? Because it says, Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cut. He is unclean to you. But is this text not required to teach that there are five sin offerings that are left to die? The latter teaching we learn from the continuation of the text of them that divide the hoof. He is unclean to you. It has also been taught to the same effect. Whence do we derive that the five sin offerings are left to die? Because it says, All of them that divide the hoof. He is unclean. But is not the rule of the five sin offerings that are left to die learned purely from tradition? Rather, the text comes to teach us concerning the animal exchanged for a guilt offering that it pastures until blemished. But is not the rule of a guilt offering also learned purely from tradition? For wherever a sin offering is left to die in a Corresponding case of guilt offering pastures the fact is that the text still refers to the rule of the five sin offerings left to die and both the text and the traditional law are necessary for had I the text alone I might have said that they are condemned to pasture therefore the traditional law teaches us that they are to die and had I the traditional law alone I might have said that if by chance he ate of these five sin offerings he performed a forbidden action but he did not transgress a negative precept therefore a scriptural text teaches us that he transgresses a negative precept ye shall not eat or if you wish I may say that it is in order to compare an object the rule of which is derived from the text of them that chew the cut with an object the rule of which is derived from the text of them that divide the hoof so as to teach that just as there they are condemned to die so here also they are condemned to die mission if one receives flock from a heathen on iron terms. Talmud, Mosbek or Opi, their offspring are exempt from the law of the firstling, but the offspring of their offspring are liable to the law of the firstling. If the Israelite put the offspring in the place of their mothers, then the offspring of the offspring are exempt, but the offspring of the offspring of the offspring are liable to the law of the firstling. Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel says, even unto ten generations, the offspring are exempt from the law of the firstling, since they are pledged to the heathen. If you gave birth to what looked like a kid, or a kid which gave birth to what looked like a you, it is exempt from the law of the firstling, but if it possesses certain clear marks resembling the mother, it is liable to the law of the firstling. Gamar, does this mean to say that since the owner does not take money, therefore it is still the property of the owner? Against this, I quote, one must not receive a flock from an Israelite on iron terms because it is usually this. Shows that it is in the ownership of the receiver said Abay this is no difficulty in the one case our mission he the heathen owner took the risks of accidents and a fall in value while in the other he the owner did not take the risks of accidents and a fall in value Rabbi said to him if he took the risks of accidents and a fall in value do you call this receiving a flock on iron terms and moreover where is this distinction implied in the context and moreover why does the second part of the passage quoted above state one may receive from a heathen a flock on iron terms why not draw a distinction in the first part itself as follows when does this apply where he the owner did not undertake the risks of accidents and a fall in value but where he undertook the risks of accidents and a fall in value it is permitted rather said Rabbi in both cases he the owner did not take the risks of accidents and a fall in value but here in connection with the first link this is it. Reason if the heathen came and wanted money and the Israelite did not give it to him he would seize the animal and if he did not find the animal he would seize its offspring therefore the heathen has a share in it and wherever the heathen has a share in an animal it is exempt from the law of the firstling if the Israelite put the offspring in the place of their mothers the offspring of the offspring are exempt said Arhu not their offspring are exempt from the law of the first
Of the offspring of the offspring are liable to the law of the firstling we have learned in the Mishnah Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel says even unto ten generations the offspring are exempt since they are pledged to the heathen now there is no difficulty on the view of Rab Judah who said that the first tana in the Mishnah goes up to two generations Talmud, Mosbek or A of offspring and exempting that is why Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel said to him even unto ten generations the offspring are exempt but according to Arhuna who said that the first tana does not go up to two generations of offspring and exempting what does Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel mean by unto ten generations Arhuna can reply Ar Simeon B. Gamaliel refers to the second clause where the Israelite put the offspring in the place of their mothers and where the tana in question goes up to two generations of offspring come and here if one received a flock from a heathen on iron terms their offspring are exempt but the offspring of the offspring are liable to the law of the firstling. Now is this not an argument against Arjuna? Arjuna can reply, read they and their offspring. Some there are who say they and their offspring are exempt. Now is this not an argument against Arjuna? Arjuna can reply, read they the offspring are exempt. Whereas the offspring of the offspring are liable to the law of the firstling. If you gave birth to what looked like a goat, etc. Arashai of Nihardia came bringing a berry with him. A born of a goat or a goat born of a you is declared liable by Armeir. Whereas the sages exempt, etc. Arashai to Rabbi, when you go up into the presence of Arjuna, inquire from him. Armeir makes it liable for what shall I say? For the law of the firstling does not Armeir hold that when Scripture says, but the firstling of an ox, it intimates that the law of the firstling does not apply until the sire is an ox and its firstling is an ox. Shall I say that he means liable to the rule of? Giving the first churn wool to the priest hardly so for does he not hold with the tana of the school of Ishmael who taught lambs whose wool is hard are exempt from the rule of the first churn wool for it says and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep he replied to him let us see we are dealing here with a case where you gave birth to what looked like a goat and its sire was a he goat and the difference of opinion is whether we take into consideration the nature of the sire in connection with the prohibition of killing the mother with its young on the same day for our mayor holds that we take into consideration the nature of the sire whereas the rabbis hold that we do not take into consideration the nature of the sire if so let them also differ as to whether we take into consideration the nature of the sire in other cases as in the dispute between Hanania and the rabbis rather the reference is indeed to the law of the firstling and what we are dealing here with is it. Case of a born of a you which in turn was born of a good one authority our mayor maintains that we follow the mother and this is not an admit while the other authority maintains that we follow the mother's mother and therefore this is an admit or if you prefer I may say it is a case of a born of a good which in turn was born of a you one authority maintains that the sheep goes back to its former status whereas the other authority maintains that the sheep does not go back to its former status Arahi said we suppose it possesses certain marks resembling the mother and who are the sages who exempt our simian who holds that the law of the firstling does not apply until its head and the greater part of the body resemble its mother said our Yohanan our mayor agrees however that in the case of the goat for the new moon we require it to be the offspring of a she goat what is the reason because scripture says and one he goat the single out since the six days of the creation and do we derive it from this text. Do we not derive it from another text? As follows, Scripture says a bullock or a sheep. This excludes killing the words or a goat. Excluded, but both texts are necessary. For from the latter text alone, I might have inferred that this is the case only when it has not returned to its original status. But where it has returned to its original status, I might have thought it is not a case of nidma. And from the former text alone, I might have inferred that this is only the case with an obligatory sacrifice. But in the case of a free will offering, there is no prohibition as regards nidma. There is therefore a need for both texts. Said Arahabi Jacob. All the authorities concerned, even Armeir, agree that by using its wool, one does not become liable to lashes for killing. For Scripture says, Thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool and linen together. Just as the linen must be proper linen, so the wool must be proper wool. Said Arpapa. All the authorities concerned. Agree that its wool is disqualified for purple blue for scripture says thou shalt not wear mingled stuff thou shalt make the twisted cords just as the flax must be proper flax so the wool must be proper wool said Arnam and B. Isaac all the authorities concerned agree that its wool is not liable to the uncleanness of plagues for scripture says whether it be a woolen garment or a linen garment just as the flax must be proper flax similarly the wool must be proper wool said Arashi we will also say something on similar lines if one trains a vine over a fig tree its wine is unfit for libations what is the reason scripture says a sacrifice and drink offerings just as a sacrifice must be a normal animal similarly the drink offerings must be a normal liquid rub and to this if one trains flax over a shrub does it cease to be proper flax if this is so then you cannot say that just as flax must be proper flax since flax can also be transformed he replied to him in the one case the smell had altered in the other its smell has not altered Mishnah of you which never before had given birth for two males and both heads came forth simultaneously our Jose the Galilean says both belong to the priest for scripture says the males shall be the lords whereas the sages say it is impossible to ascertain exactly if both heads came forth simultaneously one therefore remains with the Israelite and the other is for the priest our Tarfon says the priest chooses the better one our Akiba says we compromise between them and the second one in the Israelite's possession is left to pasture until it becomes blemished Talmud Mosbek or the owner is liable for the priest's gifts whereas our Jose exempts him if one of them died our Tarfon says they divide the living one our Akiba says the claimant must produce the evidence if it gave birth to a male and a female the priest receives nothing in such circumstances Gamar the school of Janay said of our Jose the Galilean we have heard that he said it is possible to ascertain simultaneity in natural processes and therefore how much more so is it possible to ascertain exactly in human actions the rabbis we know hold that it is impossible to ascertain simultaneity in natural processes what is their view with reference to human actions come and here a red line went round the altar in order to divide between the blood to be sprinkled above and the blood to be sprinkled below now if you say that it is impossible to be exact in human actions sometimes the priest might put the blood which should be above below the middle of the altar the line is made somewhat wide come and here proof can be a from the measurements of the furniture of the sanctuary and from the measurements of the altar it is different there since the divine law said do it and in whatever manner you are able to do it it will be satisfactory as david said all this the lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me said R. Katna come and here if an unclean oven is divided into two and the parts are equal both are unclean for it is impossible to be exact our Kahana replied an earthen vessel is different because it has holes come and here if a slain body is found at exactly the same distance between two cities both bring two heifers these are the words of our Eliezer what is the reason is it not because he holds that it is possible to be exact in human actions and the words the city which is nearest imply even the cities which are nearest know our Eliezer Talmud Mosbek wrote holds with our Jose the Galilean who said it is possible to ascertain simultaneity in natural processes and how much more so in human actions may we say that ten aim differ in this matter if a slain body was found at the same distance between two cities we do not perform the ceremony of breaking the heifers neck our Eliezer says both cities bring two heifers is not the difference of opinion based on this very point for the First Tana holds that it is impossible to be exact whereas our Eliezer holds that it is possible to be exact but can you really say this if the first Tana holds that it is impossible to be exact why did they not have the ceremony of breaking the heifer's neck let the two cities bring one heifer between them and make a stipulation rather according to these Tana quoted above they all hold that it is possible to be exact the point at issue however is whether we hold that the words the city which is nearest implied but not the cities which are nearest the first Tana holds the words which is nearest implied but not the cities which are nearest whereas our Eliezer holds the city which is nearest implies even the cities which are nearest what do we decide our high be been reported in the name of our Romay Tana taught if a slain body is found at exactly the same distance between two cities our Eliezer says both cities bring two heifers whereas the sages say they shall bring one heifer between them and make a stipulation now what is the reasoning of the rabbi sages if the rabbis hold that it is possible to be exact and the words the city which is nearest imply also the
Possession of the Israelite is left to pasture until it is blemished. What is the reason of Armadir said Aryohan? And because the priest can make a claim upon him from two sides, for he can say to him, If it is a firstling, then it belongs to me entirely, and if it is not a firstling, give me the priest's gifts therefrom. And Arhose, what is his reason? Said Rabbi the rabbis, put one who had not taken possession in the position of one who had taken possession, so although it had not reached the priests. Hence it is as if it had reached his hands and he had sold it to the Israelite when blemished said Arlaz all the authorities concerned agree that an animal which is a doubtful firstborn since the priest has a beast in its stead is liable for the priest's gifts. You say all the authorities concerned now whose view does this represent our Jose's but is not this obvious for our Jose exempts only where the priest has a beast in its stead in which case the sages put one who has not taken possession in the position of one who had taken possession but where the priest has nothing in its stead it is not so you might have thought that the reason of our Jose was because he held that if you make him liable for the priest's gifts he may come to shear and work the animal even where the priest has nothing in its stead he consequently informs us that we do not fear this but how can you say this have we not learned in the subsequent mission for our Jose used to say Talmud, Moss. Bekorot be wherever the priest has a beast in its stead he is exempt from the priest's gifts whereas our mayor makes him liable the reason therefore is because the priest has a beast in its stead but if the priest has nothing in its stead it would be otherwise you might have assumed that our Jose was arguing according to the view of our mayor as follows my own view is that even if the priest has nothing in its stead he is not liable for the gifts or if you render him liable for the priests. Gifts he may come to shear and work the animal but according to your view at least admit that where the priest has a beast in its stead the sages put one who had not taken possession in the position of one who had taken possession to this our mayor reply to him it is not so said our papa all the authorities concerned agree with reference to a doubtfully tithed animal that it is exempted from the priest's gifts you say all the authorities concerned whose opinion is that it is our mayor's but is not this obvious for our mayor only makes him liable for the priest's gifts in connection with an animal which is a doubtful firstborn since the priest can make claim upon him from two sides but in the case of a doubtfully tithed animal it is not so you might have assumed that the reason of our mayor was that the law of the priest's gifts should not be forgotten and consequently even in the case of a doubtfully tithed animal the ruling is the same he therefore informs us that it is not so but how can you say this have we not learned for our Jose used to say that wherever the priest has a beast in its stead it is exempt whereas our mayor makes him liable you might have assumed that our mayor even in the case of a doubtfully tithed animal makes him liable and the reason why they differ in the matter where the priest has a beast in its stead is to show how far our Jose is prepared to go since he exempts even where the priest can make a claim upon him from two sides he therefore informs us that this is not so if one dies our Tarfon says they divide the living one why should they divide the living one let us see if the fat one died it is the priest which has died and the one remaining is the owners and if the lean one died it is the owners which has died and the one remaining is the priest said rmi our Tarfon retracted our Akiva says the claimant must produce the evidence said our high on our Tarfon's view what does the position resemble that of two men who gave to animals in charge of a shepherd and one died where the shepherd leaves the living one between them and departs on the view of our Akiva to what can the position be compared to that of a man who gave an animal in charge of an owner of animals where the claimant must produce the evidence then what is the point at issue will our Akiva deny where to give two animals in charge of a shepherd that the shepherd leaves the living one and departs and will our Tarfon differ in the case where one gave an animal in charge of an owner of animals said Rabbah or some say our Papa all the authorities concerned agree that where two men gave two animals in charge of a shepherd the shepherd leaves the living one between them and departs also in the case where one gave an animal in charge of an owner of animals that the claimant must produce the evidence the point at issue however is where the ground is the owners and the priest is the shepherd our Tarfon holds the owner gives possession to the priest in his ground since he is desirous that a miswa should be performed through his property and therefore the position is that of two who gave animals in charge of a shepherd where the shepherd leaves the living one between them and departs but our Akiva says since he would suffer loss he does not give him any possession and it is therefore similar to the case of one who gave an animal in charge of the owner of animals where the claimant must produce the evidence mission if to use which had never previously given birth for two males both belong to the priest if they gave birth to a male and a female the male belongs to the priest if they gave birth to two males and a female one remains with him and the other belongs to the priest our Tarfon says the priest chooses the stronger one our Akiva says the fat one remains between them and the second pastures until blemished and he is also liable for the priest's gifts our Jose however exempts him if one of them dies our Tarfon says they divide the living one our Akiva says the claimant must produce the evidence if they gave birth to two females and a male or two males and two females the priest receives nothing in such circumstances if one of the youths had given birth and the other had never previously given birth and they bore two males one remains with him and the other belongs to the priest our Tarfon says the priest chooses the strong one our Akiva says the fat one remains between them and the second pastures until Blemished and he is also liable for the priest's gifts our Jose however exempts him for our Jose says wherever the priest receives an animal in its stead he is exempt from the priest's gifts our mayor however makes him liable if one of them dies our Tarfon says they divide the living one our Akiva says the claimant must produce the evidence if they gave birth to a male and a female the priest receives nothing in such circumstances Gamara all these cases where our Tarfon and our Akiva differ are necessary to be stated for if we had been informed of the first case above I might have assumed that in that case our Akiva held that the claimant must produce the evidence because two males came from one you but in the case of two ewes which had never previously given birth and where two animals a male and a female were born from one and one male from the other I might have said that he agrees with our Tarfon that the animal which came forth singly is much the better one and if he had Stated only the latter case I might have assumed that in this case our Akiva held that the claimant must produce the evidence for neither had previously given birth but where one you had given birth and the other had not given birth and they begot two males I might have said that he agrees with our Tarfon Talmud, Mosbek wrote that the one which had not given birth is much the better one there is need therefore for the enumeration of all the instances where our Tarfon and our Akiva differ. Mishnah with regard to an animal extracted through the Caesarean section and the firstling which came after it our Tarfon says both pasture until blemished and are eaten with their blemishes by the owners whereas our Akiva says in both cases the law of the firstling does not apply in the first because it is not the first birth of the womb and the second because another animal preceded it Gamar on what principle do they differ our Tarfon is in doubt whether a firstling in only one respect is the Firstling of scripture whereas our Akiva is certain that a firstling in only one respect is not the firstling of the scripture our rabbis taught a lesson can be derived from a general proposition which requires complementing by specification and from a specification which requires complementing by a general proposition for instance scripture says sanctify unto me all the firstborn I might understand from this that even a female is subject to the law of the firstling hence the text expressly states all the firstling males that are born from the word males however I might understand that even if a female came forth before it, it is subject to the law of the firstling hence the text expressly states that openeth the womb from the words that openeth the womb however I might understand that the law applies even if it came after an animal extracted through the Caesarean section hence scripture expressly states the firstling said Arshurabia to obey in the first part of it. Above passage why does not the Talmud bring the text the firstling from this we see that a firstling in only one respect is the firstling of the scripture and in the last part of the above passage the Talmud brings the text firstling consequently we see that the firstling in only one respect is not the firstling of the scripture he replied to him indeed the firstling in only one respect may still not be the firstling of the scripture and in the first part of the above passage what he means to say is this from the word male in the text however I might infer that even a firstling extracted through the Caesarean section is the firstling of the scripture hence scripture expressly states the first birth of the womb Robin has said indeed a firstling in one respect may still be the firstling of the scripture and the last part of the passage means this if you should assume that a firstling which came forth after one extracted through the Caesarean section is sanctified what need is there for the divine law to write the word firstling
is that the best explanation is that of a B-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I mission if one buys an animal from a heathen not knowing whether it had given birth or had never yet given birth or Ishmael says that born of a goat in its first year certainly belongs to the priest after that it is a questionable case of a firstling that born of a you two years old certainly belongs to the priest after that it is a questionable case of a firstling that born of a cow or an ass three years old certainly belongs to the priest after that it is a questionable case of a firstling said our Akiba to him if an animal were exempted from the law of the firstling only with the birth of actual offspring it would be as you say but the fact is as the rabbi said the sign of offspring in small cattle is a discharge from the womb in large cattle the after birth in a woman the signs are the foetus and the after birth this is the general rule wherever it is known that it had given birth the priest receives nothing wherever it had never given birth it belongs to the priest if there is a doubt it shall be eaten in its blemished state by the owner's gemara the mission says that after that it is a questionable case of a firstling why is it a questionable case why not go by the majority of animals which become pregnant and beget in their first year and so we say that this one certainly gave birth in the first year may we therefore not say that our Ishmael holds according to our mayor who takes into Consideration the minority you may say that he even concurs with the rabbis for the rabbis go by the majority only when it is the majority which is before us as e.g. the case of the nine stalls and the Sanhedrin but in the case of a majority which is not before us the rabbis do not go by the majority but is there not the case of minors a boy and a girl which is a majority that is not before us and still the rabbis go by the majority for we have learned minors whether boy or girl do not perform the act of Eliza nor the Levirate marriage this is the teaching of our Meir the rabbi said to him you rightly say that they do not perform the act of Eliza for scripture says a man and we put a woman on a level with a man in this respect but what is the reason why they do not perform the Levirate marriage either upon reply to them a boy minor is not allowed to do so lest he be found to be a eunuch and a girl minor lest she be discovered to be sterile and thus render it a case of Contact with a forbidden relation and the rabbis we go by the majority of boys in the world and the majority of boys are not eunuchs we go by the majority of girls in the world and the majority of girl minors are not sterile rather said Rabbi Talmud. Mas Bekorot it is the best explanation to say that our Ishmael holds according to our mayor who takes into consideration the minority Rabbi said you may still say that he holds with the rabbis for the rabbis go by the majority only in the case of a majority that does not depend on action but in the case of a majority which depends on action it is not so our rabbis taught that born from a goat in its first year certainly belongs to the priest after that it is a questionable case of a firstling that born of a you two years old certainly belongs to the priest after that it is a questionable case that born of a cow three years old certainly belongs to the priest after that it is a questionable case the rule for a she ass is the same as for a cow, our Jose B. Judah, however, says that the offspring of a Shias four years old certainly belongs to the priest. Thus far, the teachings are those of our Ishmael. When these teachings were reported to our Joshua, he said to them, Go and say to our Ishmael, You have made a mistake. If the animal were exempted only with the actual birth of an embryo, it would be as you say, but the sages have declared a sign of offspring in small cattle is a discharge from the womb in large cattle, the afterbirth. And in a woman, the signs are the foetus and afterbirth. I do not, however, hold with this, but what I say is that a goat which at six months discharged from the womb can give birth in its first year, that a you which discharged within its first year from the womb gives birth in its second year, said our Akiba, I have not got so far as this, but what I say is that wherever it is known that it had given birth, the priest receives nothing, wherever it had never given birth, it belongs to the priest. And if it is a questionable firstling it shall be eaten in its blemished state by the owner what is the point at issue between our Ishmael and our Joshua may we say that the point at issue is as to whether a discharge from the womb exempts from the law of the firstling our Ishmael holding that a discharge does not exempt whereas our Joshua holds that a discharge exempts no if we actually saw it discharging all the authorities would agree that a discharge exempts from the law of the firstling. The point at issue however is whether we take into consideration the possibility of its having discharged our Ishmael holds we do not take into consideration the possibility of its having discharged whereas our Joshua holds that we take into consideration this possibility but does not our Ishmael take into consideration such a possibility did not Rabbi say above that it is obvious that our Ishmael holds with our mayor who takes into consideration the minority our Ishmael takes into consideration it. Minority when the object is to make the ruling more stringent but when the object is to render the ruling more lenient then he does not take into consideration the minority and if you prefer another solution I may say whether it is to restrict or to make the ruling more lenient he takes into consideration the minority the difference of opinion however is whether where it discharges from the womb it can subsequently give birth in its first year our Ishmael held that an animal which discharges does not subsequently give birth in its first year and consequently this one since it gave birth certainly did not discharge but our Joshua held an animal which discharges can give birth subsequently in its first year it says above I do not however hold with this but a goat six months old which discharge gives birth in its first year you a year old when she discharged gives birth in its second year what is the difference between what he had on tradition and his own opinion where E.g. the animal discharged at the end of six months and they differ as to Z.E.I.R.I.'s dictum for Z.E.I.R.I. said the period of discharge is not less than 30 days what he had on traditions agrees with Z.E.I.R.I.'s dictum whereas his own opinion does not agree with Z.E.I.R.I.'s dictum and if you prefer another solution I may say all the authorities concerned except Z.E.I.R.I.'s dictum the point at issue here however is whether an animal gives birth before the due number of months is completed Talmud, Moss. Bekorot be according to what we have on tradition we do not maintain that it gives birth before the due number of months is completed but according to his own opinion we maintain that it does give birth before the due number of months is completed and if you still prefer another solution I may say we do not maintain that an animal gives birth before the due number of months is completed and the point at issue here is however whether a part of a day is considered as equivalent to the whole. Day according to his own opinion we say that a part of the day is considered equivalent to the whole day whereas according to what he had on tradition we do not say that a part of the day is considered as the whole day said our Akiba I have not come so far as this but wherever it is known etc what is the difference between our Akiba and our Joshua said our hand of sir the difference between them is whether milk exempts from the law of the firstling our Akiba holds milk exempts for we go by the majority of animals and the majority of animals do not give milk unless they have given birth but our Joshua holds that there exists a minority of animals which give milk although they have not yet given birth but does our Joshua take into consideration the minority have we not learned if a woman had a mother-in-law she need not fear but if when she left the mother-in-law was pregnant she must fear our Joshua however says she need not fear and we explained what is the reason of our Joshua he holds. The majority of pregnant women actually gave birth and only a minority miscarry and of all who give birth half bear males and half females add the minority of miscarriages to the half which bear females and males are in the minority and we do not take into consideration a minority rather reverse the names above and it has been taught similarly milk exempts from the law of the firstling this is the teaching of our Joshua our Akiba however says milk does not exempt our rabbis have taught if a she kid gave birth to three females and each female gave birth to three all of them enter the shed to be tithed said our Simeon I saw a she kid of which the offspring was tithed in its first year what need is there for the Baritha to state that each gave birth to three let it state that one gave birth to three and the rest each gave birth to two since one animal must necessarily bear three the Baritha states in each of the cases mentioned that it gave birth to three and what need is there for the Baritha to state that each gave birth to three at all let it say that each offspring gave birth to two and the mother again gave birth together with them Talmud, Mas Bekorota may we say therefore that he holds that an animal which discharges does not subsequently give birth in the year of its discharging no though you hold that an animal which discharges can give birth in the year of its discharging you may still maintain that if it gave birth it cannot give birth. Again in the same year said our Simeon I saw a she etc what is the difference between the first tana quoted above in the Baritha and our Simeon they differ in accepting or rejecting the dictum of Zeiri for Zeiri said the period of discharging from the womb is not less than 30 days the first tana in the above Baritha accepts
Here is whether animals may enter the shed to be tithed before its due time Talmud, Mas Pekoro P and we have a very thick confirming this our Simeon the son of Judah reported in the name of our Simeon an animal though immature can enter the shed to be tithed for it is like the case of a firstling just as a firstling is sanctified before its due time and is sacrificed when its time becomes due so a tithing animal can be sanctified before its due time and offered up after its time becomes due but why deduce the case of a tithing animal from a case of a firstling? Why not deduce it from a case of dedicated animals? It is reasonable to infer the case of a tithing animal from a case of a firstling because to both apply the rules regarding redemption of blemish exchange and eating. On the contrary, according to this, the very thought to infer the case of a tithing animal from a case of dedicated animals because to both apply the rules regarding a plain animal, a male. Sanctification and the priest's dues. The fact is that our Simeon learns from the analogy between passing and passing what is the discharge from a womb, like Rab said, as the shepherds of Zalta said, the womb closes up. Samuel said, casting up blood, and he is required to show it to a wise man. Sage, how does a wise man know? Said our Papa, what is meant is a wise shepherd. Said our Hisda, behold, the sages said the period for the formation of an embryo in a woman is forty days. Our Hisda thereupon asked. How long is the period in the case of an animal said our Papa Juabe is not the CIRI's dictum for CIRI said the period of discharging is not less than 30 days the statement referred only to the receiving of a male for coupling now we have in our mission the ruling concerning an Israelite purchasing an animal from a heathen what is the ruling however where an Israelite purchases an animal from an Israelite said rabbit is surely a firstling for if it had given birth he would certainly have recommended it on this ground but Samuel says it is a questionable firstling because the seller thinks the other needs it for slaughtering our Yohan and said the animal is genuine Holland what is the reason if it be a fact that it had never given birth since we have here a prohibition he would surely inform him it has been taught in support of our Yohan's ruling who maintains that it is Holland if he did not inform him he can proceed to kill and need not refrain may we assume then that this barita is a refutation of Rab and Samuel there it depends on the seller whereas here the matter depends on the buyer mission our Eliezer B. Jacob says if a large domestic animal has discharged a clot of blood it the clot shall be buried and it the mother I is exempted from the law of the first lingamar our high taught the clot of blood does not make unclean with contact nor by being carried now since it does not make a person unclean by contact nor the carrier unclean. Why is it buried Talmud, Mosbeck wrote in order to make known that the mother is exempted from the law of the first ling does not this mean to say that it is a genuine embryo then why does it not make unclean by contact nor make the carrier unclean our Yohanan answered because the principle of neutralization by the larger portion is applied here and our Yohanan is in agreement here with the opinion he expressed elsewhere for our Yohanan said our Eliezer B. Jacob and our Simeon made similar. Statements What is the statement of our Eliezer B. Jacob that which we have learned in our mission above what is our Simeon statement as we have learned if there is an afterbirth in a house the house is unclean not that the afterbirth is considered an embryo only because there cannot be an afterbirth without an embryo but our Simeon says the embryo was mashed before it came forth we have learned elsewhere the opening of the uterus for untimely births is not until the embryo on leaving the uterus forms around head like a coil what kind of coil does this mean like a coil of wool said hi be rab to our who not did rabbi explain whether the coil of wool containing warp or containing wolf is meant he replied to him it has been taught the coil of the warp these are the words of our Meir our Judah says the coil of the wolf our Eliezer B. Zadok says from the time when the ring like formations at the mouth of the vagina are visible what are the ring like formations like rab Judah reported in the name of Samuel in behalf of our Eliezer son of Arzadik in Jerusalem they used to explain it in this manner like a mule which bends to urinate and it has the appearance of a coil coming forth out of a coil said Arhuna I learned two sizes of coils one of the warp and the other of the wolf and I am unable to explain when our came from Palestine he reported in the name of Arhuna and I learned of three sizes of coils one of the warp another of the wolf and one large coil and again another of the sack carriers and I am unable to explain when Arhuna came from Palestine he explained this in the name of Arhuna and in the case of a woman the coil is like a warp in the case of an animal the size of the coil is like the wolf as to a large size coil of the sack carriers it is as we have learned a clot of clay from a Beth Hopper or a clot of imported clay must have the size of the great seal of the sack carriers which is like the seal of leather bags and of the same size as the top part of the stopper of the Bethlehem one Judge Reshlakish reported in the name of our Judah the prince he who buys brine from an Amhirez must bring it in contact with water and it is then levitically clean for in either case if the larger portion of the brine is water since he brings it in contact with water he has cleaned it and if the larger part is brine brine is not susceptible to levitical uncleanness the only doubtful element is that small quantity of water in the brine and this is neutralized in the larger portion of the brine said our Jeremiah this has been laid down only with regard to dipping bread in it but for cooking purposes the brine is not permitted since like it tracks like and the uncleanness is aroused our Demi was once sitting and repeating the statement of our Jeremiah said Abbe to him can levitical uncleanness once neutralized be aroused again he replied to him and do you not hold that this is reasonable have we not learned if SEI of unclean Terima has Fallen Talmud, Mosbeck wrote into a hundred of clean Holland. Our Eliezer says the Teramah is separated and left to rot for I maintain that the same SEO which fell was separated but the sages say a SEO is separated and eaten in a moldy state parched needed in fruit juice or divided into minute loaves so that there shall not be in one place the size of an egg and it was taught in connection as to that Holland Talmud, Mosbeck wrote according to our Eliezer what shall become of it it shall be eaten in a moldy state parched needed in fruit juice or be divided into minute loaves so that there shall not be in one place more than the size of an egg and Allah further explained what is the reason it is a precautionary measure in case he brings a cab of unclean Holland from another source and a cab and a little over from this kind he thinks that he neutralizes it by the larger portion but since there is this minute quantity of unclean Teramah like combines with like and it Uncleanness is stirred up, he said to him, if Levitical uncleanness arouses uncleanness, shall therefore Levitical cleanness stir up uncleanness. He have raised an objection to our Jeremiah's views if ashes fit for lustration from the red heifer were mixed with wood ashes, we go by the larger portion to render unclean, but if the greater part is wood ashes, they do not make unclean. Now, if you say that Levitical uncleanness which was neutralized is considered as still existing, granted that it does not make uncleanness by contact, still let it make the carrier unclean. It was indeed stated on the subject, our Jose son of Arhanana said the word clean in the above Mishnah means that it is so far clean as not to make uncleanness by contact, but it still makes the carrier unclean, but did not our Hisda say is neutralized by ritually cut meat, for it is impossible for ritually cut meat to become nibble. Now, granted that it does not make unclean by contact, still let it make the carrier. Unclean here, Dimi replied to him, You report this in connection with what our Hista said. We report it in connection with our high for our high taught nibble and ritually cut meat neutralize one another when mixed together. And it was stated on the subject, Our Jose son of Arhanan said, It is so far clean as not to make unclean by contact, but it makes the carrier unclean. But have we not learned our Eliezer, the son of Jacob, says, If a large domestic animal discharged a clot of blood, it shall be buried. And it is exempt from the law of the firstling, and our high taught in a very it does not make unclean neither by contact nor by carrying. Now, if the forbidden thing remains in existence even after neutralization, granted that it does not make unclean by contact, still let it make the carrier unclean here. Dimi became silent. Nevertheless, there is no difficulty. Perhaps it is different here because it is an uncleanness which is putrid. This would indeed hold good according to Barpadehu. Said a major uncleanness attaches to it as long as it is fit to be eaten by a stranger, whereas a minor uncleanness until as long as it is fit for a dog. And in the case here, it is surely not fit for a stranger. But according to our Yohanan, who said Talmud, Mosbeck wrote the Talmud, Mosbeck wrote the one as well as the other attaches to it. So long as it is fit for a dog, in the case here, is it not fit for a dog? This is indeed a difficulty.
Fell a little water is levitically unclean Arnaman reported in the name of Rabbi Abu this proves that the Amharas are suspected of mixing half water in brine but why half why not even less than a half for together with the little water here it makes a half and a half does not become neutralized right up to a half and if you prefer another solution I may say the levitical uncleanness imposed with reference to an Amharas is a rabbinic enactment and the uncleanness of liquid is also a rabbinic enactment therefore in the case where the water is the greater portion the rabbis decreed uncleanness but where there is half and half the rabbis did not decree uncleanness Mishnah Arsimian B. Gamaliel says if one buys an animal giving suck from a Gentile he need not fear that perhaps the offspring belongs to another animal if he went among his herd and saw animals which had given birth for the first time giving suck and animals which had not given birth for the first time. Giving suck we need not fear that perhaps the offspring of this one came to the other or perhaps the offspring of the other came to this one Gemara Arnaman reported in the name of Rab the law is in accordance with the Mishnah in the whole chapter except in the case where a difference of opinion is recorded said Arshis hate I say that Rab declared this tradition when he was half asleep for to what does Rab refer you can hardly say that he refers to the first part of the chapter for R. They're not differing opinions recorded of R. Ishmael and R. Akiba. Again, if he refers to the teaching of R. Elizar B. Jacob in the preceding Mishnah, is not the Mishnah of R. Elizar B. Jacob little in quantity but well sifted. And if he refers to the teachings of R. Simeon B. Gamaliel in R. Mishnah, are there not differing opinions in the Beretta? If he refers to the teachings of R. Jose B. Hameshalam in a subsequent Mishnah, has not Rab, however, informed us of this once for Rab said the law is in accordance with R. Jose B. Hameshalam. And if he refers to the subsequent Mishnah in connection with the hair of a blemished firstling, are there not, however, different opinions recorded of Akiba B. Mahalil and the Rabbis? Indeed, Rab refers to the teachings of R. Simeon B. Gamaliel, and this is what he teaches us that the difference of opinion in the Beretta is not considered a difference of opinion to be taken into account. But since Rab said the law is according to the Mishnah. In the whole chapter, except where there is a difference of opinion, Talmud, Masbek wrote, What need is there for the ruling that the law is in accordance with our Jose B. Hameshalam? If he had said that the law was according to the Mishnah in the whole chapter and did not state subsequently that the law was in accordance with our Jose B. Hameshalam, I might have thought that he referred to our Jose B. Hameshalam and that what the expression the whole chapter meant was that our Jose stated to things in the subsequent Mishnah and that the difference of opinion in the Beretta is considered a genuine difference of opinion. Therefore, Rab informs us that the law is in accordance with our Jose so as to intimate to us that in the other statement he refers to our Simeon B. Gamaliel and thus the difference of opinion in the Beretta is not considered a difference of opinion of any importance. What is the Beretta referred to above as it has been taught if one buys an animal giving suck? From a Gentile, the young which follows it is a doubtful firstling because it can give suck even to one to which it had not given birth. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel, however, says we follow the natural presumption, and so our Simeon B. Gamaliel used to say if one goes among his herd at night and sees about ten or fifteen animals, both those which had not born previously and those which had previously given birth, and the next day he rises early and finds the males clinging to the animals that had given birth previously and the females clinging to those which were now giving birth for the first time, he need not fear that perhaps the offspring of one came to the other. It was clear it was the reason of our Simeon B. Gamaliel's statement that we follow the natural presumption because no dam gives suck to a stranger unless it has had a child of its own, but where it had given birth before we do fear lest it gives suck to a stranger, or perhaps was it that it gives suck to its own, but it does not give suck. To a stranger, what is the practical difference to punish with lashes on its account for transgressing the prohibition of killing the mother and its young on the same day? If you say that it gives suck to its own but not to a stranger, then there is here a liability of lashes. Whereas if you say that it gives suck also to a stranger, then there is no liability of lashes. Come and here, our Simeon B. Gamaliel says, if one buys an animal from a Gentile, he need not fear that perhaps it was the offspring of another. No, does our Simeon say that perhaps it is? He says that perhaps it was what he means is this. He need not fear that perhaps it was the offspring of another, except when it had previously given birth. Come and here, if one went among his herd and saw both the animals now bearing for the first time giving suck and those not now bearing for the first time giving suck, he need not fear that perhaps the offspring of this one came to the other or the offspring of the other came to this. One why is this so why not fear lest it gave suck to a stranger where it has its own offspring it does not leave its own and gives suck to a stranger come and here we follow the natural presumption and so now does not the first part of the Beretta above resemble the second part so that just as the second part refers to a case where the offspring is certainly its own so the first part also refers to a case where the offspring is certainly its own is this an argument the first part deals with its own case and the second part deals with its own case and what does the Beretta mean by the phrase and so it refers to the exemption from the law of the firstling Rabbi Barhan reported in the name of Aryohan and if one saw a swan clinging to you it is exempted from the law of the firstling and it is forbidden to be eaten until he come and teach righteousness unto you you say it is exempted from the law of the firstling whose view is followed the view of Arsimian B. Gamaliel you say and it is forbidden to be eaten whose view is followed the view of the rabbis and moreover if it is according to the rabbis why until he come and teach righteousness to you until it be known to you is what is required and should you say that our Yohanan is in doubt whether the law is in accordance with our Simeon B. Gamaliel or the rabbis if our Yohanan is in doubt then why is it exempt from the law of the firstling and further is there a doubt did not Rabbi B. Barhan report in the name of our Yohanan wherever our Simeon B. Gamaliel expressed the view in the mission of the Halachah is in accordance with him with the exception of his view regarding surety ship and the last case dealing with evidence one may still say that our Yohanan is in no doubt that the law is in accordance with our Simeon B. Gamaliel he is in doubt however whether our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that an animal which has given birth gives suck even to a stranger or whether it does not give suck to a stranger. If so, instead of stating this ruling in connection with the case of a swine, why not state it in connection with the case of a lamb? And as regards the punishment with lashes for infringing the prohibition of killing the mother and its young on the same day, he had need to state this ruling in connection with the case of a swine. For if he had stated this ruling in connection with the case of a lamb, I might have thought that even if you assumed that our Simeon holds that an animal which gives birth gives up to a stranger, this only applies to a stranger belonging to its own species, but not to an animal not belonging to its own species. Consequently, our Yohanan states the case of a swine to inform us that this ruling applies, although it does not belong to the species of the for Even here, one can say that perhaps it gave suck, and this is what our Yohanan meant above Talmud. Mosbek wrote Biahabirabi asked, How is it if one saw a swine clinging to you, but what? Exactly does the question refer to if it has reference to the law of the firstling and the query is whether the law is in accordance with the view of Arsimian B. Gamaliel or according to the rabbis why not put this query with reference to the case of a lamb the query refers to the law of the firstling as laid down by the rabbis and to the rule as to eating as laid down by Arsimian B. Gamaliel the query refers to the law of the firstling thus do we say that even in accordance with the rabbis who maintain that it gives suck to a stranger this is only the case with an animal belonging to its own species but to one not belonging to its own species it does not give suck or do we perhaps maintain that even to offspring that does not belong to its own species the animal also gives suck and also in connection with eating the query is put forward do we say that even according to Arsimian B. Gamaliel granting that he holds that an animal which has begotten gives suck even to a stranger this is the case only when the offspring belongs to the same species as the you but where it does not belong to the same species it does not give suck or perhaps even if the offspring does not belong to the species of the you do we say that it also gives suck to it let this remain undecided mission our Jose B. Hameshalam says one who slaughters the firstling first makes a clear space with the butcher's hatchet on both sides and tears the hair on both sides provided however that he does not remove the wool from its place with an instrument and similarly one may tear the hair to show the place of the blemish to a sage Gemara Rab said the Halachah is according to
not be squeezed in on a festival day in that case even Arsimian would agree for Rabbe and Rabba both said Arsimian admits where it is a case of let his head be cut off but let him not die that it is forbidden but did not Arhai B. Ashi report in the name of Rab the Halachah is in accordance with Arjuda and Arhain and B. Ami reported in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian and Arhai B. Abin taught without naming the authority as follows Rab says the Halachah is in accordance with Arjuda whereas Samuel says the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian indeed Rab holds that a forbidden act which was produced without intent is prohibited on a festival day and that tearing is not considered the same as shearing and the reason why it is permitted on a festival day is because it is detaching a thing from its place of growth in an unusual manner but is not tearing considered the same as shearing has it not been taught if one plucks a large feather from the wing of a bird and cuts off its head and smooths it. He is obliged to bring three sin offerings. And Reshlakish explained he is guilty for the act of plucking it because it comes under the category of shearing. He is guilty for the act of cutting because it comes under the category of severing. And he is guilty for the act of smoothing because it comes under the category of scraping. Plucking a wing is different for that is the usual thing. Now since Rab holds in accordance with Arhosei B. Hameshalim then Arhosei B. Hameshalim holds in accordance with Rab. But does Arhosei B. Hameshalim hold that a forbidden act which was produced without intent is forbidden? Has it not been taught if two hairs of a red heifer are red at the roots but black at the top? Arhosei B. Hameshalim says he may shear with scissors without fear. The case of a red heifer is different for it does not belong to a class of animals that are sheared. But has it not been taught? Scripture says thou shalt do. No work with the firstling of thine ox nor shear the firstling of thy flock from this I can gather only that working an ox and shearing sheep are forbidden whence will you deduce that the expression used in connection with an ox applies equally to sheep and the expression used in connection with sheep applies equally to an ox the text states thou shalt not work nor shear the firstling of thy flock rather say the case of a red heifer is different for it is an offering for the temple repair. But has not our Eliezer said offerings for temple repair are forbidden in respect of shearing and work it is a rabbinic enactment but is there not still a rabbinic prohibition the case of a red heifer is different as it is a rare occurrence but why not redeem the red heifer bring it to a state of Holland in order to shear it and then again consecrate it its price is high but why not act here as Samuel taught for Samuel said a dedicated object worth a mango which has been redeemed for the Value of a paratot is considered redeemed. Samuel's teaching refers only to a case where it has been done, but does he teach that it is directly permissible? If you wish, I may say Rab holds with Arhosei B. Hameshalim, but Arhosei B. Hameshalim does not hold with Rab that unintentional results caused by forbidden acts are prohibited and tears the hair provided. However, he does not remove the wool from its place. Arashi reported in the name of Reshlakish they have taught this only with regard to tearing with the hand, but with an instrument it is forbidden. But does not the Mishnah state he makes a place with a butcher's hatchet on both sides read for the butcher's hatchet? And similarly, if one tears the hair to show the place of the blemish it was squared, does it mean that this is directly permitted or only condoned if it had been done? Said our Jeremiah, come and here if wool is entangled in the ear. Arhosei B. Hameshalim says he tears it and shows its blemish deduced from here. Therefore. That it means a direct permission that stands proved said Armari we have also learned and similarly if one tears the hair to show the place of the blemish what does the expression and similarly indicate if it is to tell us that he must not remove it from its place since if he slaughters where the slaughtering proves his intention you still say that he must not remove its will can there be any question as regards showing the place of the blemish must you not therefore admit that it refers to the tearing deduced from this therefore that it is directly permissible it stands proved mission if a portion of the hair of a blemish firstling was torn away and he placed it in the window and subsequently slaughtered the animal Akhidi Abi Mahalil allows IT Talmud, Mosbek Oropi whereas the sages declare it forbidden these are the words of Arjuna Arhose said to him Akhidi Abi Mahalil did not allow in this case but it is in the case where the hair of a blemish firstling which was torn Away and he placed it in the window and the animal died subsequently that Akhidi Abi Mahalil allows whereas the sages declare it forbidden where the wool of a firstling is loosely connected with the skin that part which appears on a level with the rest of the wool is permitted whereas that which does not appear on a level with the rest of the wool is forbidden Gamar Akhidi Abi Mahalil did not allow in this case is it to be deduced and that the wool is forbidden if in the case of a dead firstling the wool torn away is allowed to be used is there any question that in the case where it is slaughtered the wool torn away is allowed what is meant then is not in this case does Akhidi allow and the sages declare it forbidden but where he slaughtered it all unanimously allow the use of the wool they only differ in connection with the case of a dead firstling RSC reported in the name of Reshlakish the difference of opinion relates to a case where the expert had Permitted the firstling one authority maintaining that we enact the prohibition as a precaution lest he should come to detain it while the other authority maintains that we do not enact such a prohibition but where the expert had not yet permitted it all unanimously hold that the wool is forbidden Arshis hate raised an objection blemished sacrifices which became mixed up with other sacrifices are forbidden whatever they may be Arhose however says the case must be examined and we raised it. Point what does Arhose mean by the statement it must be examined you can hardly say that it refers to the blemished animal which is then to be taken away for we should then infer that the first tan quoted above does not hold this and our nomin answered in the name of Rabbi Abba we are dealing here with the wool of a blemished firstling torn away while alive which became mixed up with the wool of Hullen and who is the first tan quoted above Arjuna in our mission who said that we're he slaughtered it the rabbis declared it forbidden whereas our Jose adheres to his own view that if he slaughtered it the rabbis allowed and it states it shall be examined now what does this expression it shall be examined mean does it not mean that the examination is by the expert to see whether it possesses a permanent blemish and then killing it will make everything permissible to be used or a transitory blemish said Rabbi no the expression it shall be examined means that an examination is made if the expert had permitted the first link before the wool was torn away in that case the wool is allowed but if not then it is not allowed when Rabin went up from Babylonia to Palestine he reported the dictum of our Naman before our Jeremiah the latter said the foolish Babylonians because they dwell in a dark country report an obscure tradition have they not heard what our high Abba reported in the name of our Yohan and the difference of opinion relates to a case where he searched and did not find the blemished animal and they differ on the principle on which our mayor and the rabbis differ for we have learned our mayor used to say everything which has a presumption of levitical uncleanness continues forever in that status until the uncleanness is revealed whereas the sages say he digs until he reaches a rock or unbroken ground after which there is no further uncleanness but R.C. says the difference of opinion relates to a case where he searched and found a blemished animal and they differ on the principle on which rabbi and Arsimian be Gamaliel differ for it has been taught if one enters a field in which a grave was lost he becomes unclean if a grave is found there and he is clean for I maintain that the grave found is the identical one which was lost these are the words of rabbi whereas Arsimian be Gamaliel says the entire field must be searched why does not R.C. concur with the interpretation of our high Abba? he can reply as follows this would indeed hold Good with regard to levitical uncleanness for one can say that a raven or a mouse came and took it but in the case of a blemished animal where could it have gone and the other authority are high he will reply one can say that it was a transitory blemish and are high b abba what is his reason for not accepting the explanation of rc he can answer to you in this matter this indeed holds good with regard to a field in which a grave was lost for just as it is possible for this man to bury there so it is for another but in the case of dedicated animals once they have been examined is it a usual thing that a blemish should occur in them and the other authority he answers since animals attack each other blemishes frequently occur even after an examination an objection was raised if one plucks wool from an unblemished firstling although there appeared on it subsequently a blemish and he slaughtered it the wool is forbidden to be used now the reason why the wool is forbidden is because the animal was unblemished Talmud, Mosbeck wrote but if it were blemished the wool would have been allowed to be used although the expert did not permit the firstling explained this as follows as long as the expert has not permitted it the Tana in the Be
permitted it. The first Tana quoted above holding that if the expert permitted the first ling, the wool is allowed to be used, but if not, it is not allowed. While our Jose comes along and says that even though the expert had not permitted the first ling, it is still allowed. Said Rabbanu, all agree that if the expert had permitted the animal, the wool is allowed to be used, and if the expert had not permitted it, it is not allowed to be used. There are, however, three differences of opinion in the matter. For the first Tana quoted above holds that the difference of opinion between Akhidia and the sages refers to a dead first ling, and the same applies in the case where he slaughtered it. And the reason why they differ in connection with the dead first ling is to show to what lengths Akhidia is prepared to go. And Arjuna holds that in connection with the dead first ling, all the authorities concerned prohibit, and that the difference of opinion is where he slaughtered it. Then our Jose comes. Along and says where he slaughtered it all agree that it is allowed but the difference of opinion is where the first ling died said Arnam and the law is in accordance with Arjuna since we have learned in a mission of Bekirda in agreement with his view for we have learned if the hair of a blemished first ling became torn away and he placed it in a window subsequently slaughtering it Akhidi Abimahalil allows whereas the sages declare it forbidden Arnam and B. Isaac said the language of it. Mission also indicates this if wool of a first ling is loosely connected with the skin that which appears on a level with the rest of the wool is allowed whereas that which does not appear on a level with the rest of the wool is forbidden whose opinion is this shall I say that it is our Jose's if so in what circumstances is this the case you can hardly say where he slaughtered the first ling for both Akhidi and the rabbis in both instances indeed allowed us and this perhaps refer to the Case of a dead firstling, but if the mission gives the opinion of the rabbis, then in both instances they indeed forbid. And if it is Akhidia's opinion, then the passage ought to be reversed as follows: If it appeared on a level with the rest of the wool, then it is forbidden for death renders it prohibited. Whereas if it did not appear on a level with the rest of the wool, then it is allowed. Having been torn away previously, it is evident, therefore, that the mission represents our Judah's view. In what circumstances you can hardly say in a case where the firstling died for both Akhidia and the rabbis in both instances prohibit what is meant, then is in a case where he slaughtered it. And if the mission represents Akhidia's view in both instances, he indeed allows. Must you not then admit that the mission is the view of the rabbis and deduce from this that the point at issue is where he slaughtered it? The stands proved. Arjuna asked, How is it if one plucks wool from an unblemished burnt? Offering, but if one actually plucks, is there any authority who allows? Rather, the question is regarding wool which became detached from an unblemished burnt offering. What is the ruling concerning a sin offering or trespass offering? There is no need to ask, for since they come to atone, he would not detain them. And as regards a tithing animal, too, there is no need to ask, for since it does not come to atone, he might detain it. The question does arise, however, concerning a burnt offering. What is the ruling Talmud? Mosbek or Oti, since it is essentially not brought to atone, he might detain it. Or since a burnt offering also atones for a transgression of a positive precept, do we say that he would not detain it? Come and here, if one plucks wool from an unblemished firstling, although a blemish appeared on it subsequently and he slaughtered it, the wool is forbidden to be used. Now the reason is because he actually plucks it, but if it became detached, it would be allowed. How much more so? Therefore, in the case of a burnt offering, is it to be expected that he would not detain it? No, the same ruling applies if it became detached from an unblemished animal that it is forbidden. And the reason why the very the states, if one plucks, is to show the length to which Akhidiyah is prepared to go. That in the case of a blemished sacrifice, one is evenly allowed to pluck it. But have we not learned which became torn away? It says which became torn away to show to what lengths the rabbis are prepared to go. And it says if one plucks, to show the lengths to which Akhidiyah is prepared to go. Wool of a firstling loosely connected, etc. How is the expression that which does not appear with the wool to he understood? Our Eliezer reported in the name of Reshlakish wherever the root of the wool is turned towards its head. Our Nathan B. Ashai says wherever it is not attached to the skin on a line with the rest of the wool, why does not Reshlakish give the explanation of our Nathan B. Ashai said? R. L. Reshlakish holds that the reason is because it is impossible for wool to be free from loosely connected thread. Chapterib Mishnah. Up to how long is an Israelite bound to attend to a firstling in the case of small cattle until thirty days with large cattle? The period is fifty days. R. Jose says in the case of small cattle, the period is three months. If the priest says to the Israelite during this period, give it to me, he must not give it to him. But if the firstling was blemished and the priest said to him, give it to me so that I may eat it, then it is allowed. And in temple times, if the firstling was in an unblemished state and the priest said to him, give it, I will offer it up. It was allowed. A firstling is eaten year by year, both in an unblemished as well as in a blemished state. For it is said, thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year. If a blemish appeared on it in its first year, he is permitted to keep it all the twelve months after the twelve. Months, however, he is not permitted to keep it except for thirty days. Gemara, whence is this proof? Said Arkahana, scripture says, The firstborn of thy sons thou shalt give unto me, likewise shalt thou do with thy sheep, thou shalt not delay to offer of the fullness of thy harvest and of the outflow of thy presses, likewise thou shalt do with thine oxen. And why not reverse this? It is reasonable to assume that the part which comes first in the first text forms an analogy with that which comes first in the subsequent verse, and that which comes later in the first text forms an analogy with that which comes later in the subsequent text. On the contrary, the text that is near to it should rather form an analogy with the text near to it. Rather, said Rabba, the text says, Thou shalt do scripture adds the duty of another doing, i.e., attention in connection with thine oxen. And why not say sixty days? Scripture refers you to the sages for the precise interpretation it has also been taught to. This effect scripture says the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt give unto me likewise thou shalt do with thy sheep I might conclude from the biblical text that it applies also to thine ox and the text therefore states thou shalt do the text adds the duty of another doing i.e. attention in connection with an ox and scripture refers you to the sages for the precise interpretation hence the sages said up to how long is the Israelite bound to attend to the firstling in the case of small cattle until thirty days and in the case of large cattle fifty days our Jose says in the case of small cattle the period is three months because it requires extra attention what does the expression because it requires extra attention mean attended taught because its teeth are small if the priest said to him during this period give it to me he must not give it to him what is the reason said our she's hate because it makes him appear like a priest who helps in the threshing floors our rabbis taught if priests love it and pour help in the house of the shepherds in the threshing floors and in the slaughtering place, we do not give them the priests gifts, terima or tithes in reward. And if they acted thus, they render them holy. And concerning these scripture says, ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi. And scripture further says, and ye shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel that ye die not. What need is there for a further text? You might think that there is no death guilt. Come therefore, and here there is a further text, and ye shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel that ye die not. And the sages wish to punish the owners by making them separate terima a second time from their own. And what was the reason why they did not punish them, lest the owners come to separate from what is exempt from terima for what is subject to terima? And in all these cases mentioned above, the owners enjoy Talmud, Mosbek, or the benefit for putting. A person under an obligation in what way if an Israelite separated Terimah from his pile and another Israelite found him and said to him here is a cellar for you and give it to the son of my daughter a priest it is permitted if however a priest approached him on behalf of another priest it is forbidden and why does not the Tana of the Beretha also mention the case of the priest's gifts he can explain it to you as follows when Terimah is consecrated as such since it is not redeemed no mistake can be made with it but in these cases of the firstling and priest's gifts since they are consecrated only for their value the priest may make a mistake with them thinking that their holiness is redeemed for the four zoos i.e. the cellar and thus will come to treat them after the manner of Hullen Rabba said Terimah from abroad is not subject to the ruling of a priest who helps in the threshing floors Arhamma gave it to his attendant Samuel said Terimah from abroad is neutralized in a Larger quantity Rabbah neutralized it in a larger quantity and used to eat it in the days of his love. Michael impurity are who not the son of our Joshua when he happened to have one of Terima from abroad used to m
and eats of the terima from abroad the law however is not in accordance with his view marzitra reported in the name of arshis hate one made unclean through a reptile bait and eats the terima from abroad the law however is not in accordance with his view a firstling is eaten year by year etc since the Mishnah says if a blemish appeared on it during its first year we infer that we count according to its own year whence is this proved as rab judah reported in the name of rab scripture says Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year. Now, what year is it which enters into another? One must say it is the year of the firstling. The school of Rabbi, however, taught the text year by year denotes one day in this year and one day in the next year, and teaches that a firstling may be eaten for two days and a night. And according to the school of Rabbi, whence do they derive this? They infer it from dedicated sacrifices, and as regards to dedicated sacrifices themselves, whence do we deduce the set? Araha, the son of Jacob, scripture says a lamb of the first year, implying the year of the lamb, but not the year counted according to the creation. And whence does Rab derive that a firstling may be eaten for two days and a night? He derives it from the text, and the flesh of them shall be thine as the way breast, and as the right thigh. Scripture compares it to the way breast and the right thigh of peace offerings, just as there they may be eaten for two days and a night. So here it. May be eaten for two days and a night. Talmud, Mas Bekorot A, and what says the other to this from that text? One could say that it refers to the way breast and the right thigh of a thanksgiving offering, and the other scripture says shall be thine, thus adding another being in connection with the firstborn and the other. If we go by that text, we could say that it teaches concerning a blemished firstling that he gives it to the priest, as we do not find this stated explicitly in the whole of the Torah, and the other it says, and the flesh of them intimating that an unblemished as well as a blemished firstling may be eaten, and the other the text, and the flesh of them refers to the firstlings of all the Israelites. If a blemish appeared on it during its first year, he is permitted to keep it all the twelve months. The query was put forward, what does the mission exactly mean? Does it mean that if a blemish appeared on it during its first year, he is allowed to keep it all the Twelve months and thirty days besides, or does the mission mean that where a blemish appeared on it during its first year he is allowed to keep it all the twelve months but no longer and where a blemish appeared on it after its first year he is not allowed to keep it except for thirty days come and here it was taught a firstling in our days so long as it is not fit to show to a sage is allowed to be kept for two or three years and when it is fit to show to a sage if a blemish appeared on it during its first year he is allowed to keep it all the twelve months whereas after its first year he is not allowed to keep it even one day nor even one hour on the ground however of restoring a lost object to the owners the rabbi said that he is allowed to keep it for thirty days but I can still however raise the question concerning the beritha itself does it mean thirty days after its first year or before its first year come and here if a blemish appeared on it fifteen days during its First year we complete for it 15 days after its first year this proves that this supports the views of R. Eliezer for R. Eliezer said we give it 30 days from the time when the blemish appeared on it some there are who read R. Eliezer said once do we know that if a blemish appeared on a firstling in its first year we give it 30 days after its year it is said thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year now what is the number of days which is reckoned by all authorities as a year you must admit that it is 30 days an objection was raised it is taught if a blemish appeared on it 15 days in its first year we complete for it 15 days after its year we deduce from here that we complete 30 days but we do not give it 30 full days after its first year this is a refutation of R. Eliezer it is indeed a refutation mission if one slaughtered the firstling and showed its blemish to an expert our Judah permits whereas our mayor says since it was not Slaughtered by the instructions of the expert, it is forbidden if one who is not an expert sees the firstling and it was slaughtered by his instructions. In such a case, it shall be buried and he shall make reparation out of his own estate. Demara said, Rabbi Barhana, in the case of a blemish of withered spots in the eye, all agree that it is forbidden for they change. They only differ regarding blemishes of the body. Our mayor maintaining that we prohibit blemishes of the body on account of withered spots in the eye, whereas our Judah maintains that we do not prohibit blemishes of the body on account of withered spots in the eye. It has also been taught to the same effect if one slaughtered a firstling and showed an expert its blemish after its slaughter. Our Judah says, if there are withered spots in the eye, it is forbidden since they change, whereas if there are bodily blemishes, it is permitted because they do not change. But our mayor says, both in the one case as in the other, it is forbidden. Because they change, you say because they change, you cannot mean that two bodily blemishes change. Rather, what our mayor means is on account of those blemishes that change. Said our Naman B. Isaac Talmud, Mas Bekor B. I can prove it from our mission. Our mayor says since it was not slaughtered according to the instructions of an expert, it is forbidden. Deduce from here that our mayor does indeed penalize him. The stance proved the question was raised as a statement above on account of those blemishes that change imply that all the withered spots in the eye change, or that some change and others do not change. What is the practical difference? Whether we should declare the witnesses false or not? If you say that in all cases withered spots in the eye change, then they are false. But if you say that there are some that change and other do not, we rely on them. What is the ruling? Come and here for Rabbi Barhana reported in the name of our Yohanan our Josiah Abishah told me come and I. We'll show you withered spots in the eye that change now since he said to him come and I will show you this implies that there are some that change and others which do not change if one who is not an expert sees the firstling and it was slaughtered by his instructions in such a case it shall be buried may we say that the mission states anonymously that the ruling is in accordance with our mayor perhaps it refers to a case of withered spots in the eye and thus it will be according to the view of all the authorities concerned and he shall make reparation out of his own estate a tenant taught when he pays the priest he pays a quarter of the loss for a firstling of small cattle and a half for a firstling of large cattle what is the reason for this disparity in reparation in one case the loss is great whereas in the other it is small if this be a fact let him pay the priest in proportion to the loss are who not be no reported in the name of Arahabi ika they inflicted on him only a quarter of the loss because of the trouble of raising small cattle mission if a judge in giving judgment has declared innocent a person who was really liable or made liable a person who was really innocent declared defiled a thing which was levitically clean or declared clean a thing which was really defiled his decision stands but he has to make reparation out of his own estate if however the judge was an expert for the beth then he is absolved from making reparation tomorrow may we say the anonymous statement of the mission is in accordance with our mayor who is prepared to adjudicate liability for damage done indirectly rl reported in the name of rab we suppose that he personally executed the judgment by his own hand now this is quite intelligible where the judge made liable a person really innocent the explanation being eg where he personally executed the judgment by his own hand but where he declared innocent the person who was really liable how are we to understand it for if you say it means where he said to him you are innocent he does not personally execute the judgment by his own hand said Robin the case deals here where e.g. the creditor had a pledge and the judge took it from him the case also where he declared defiled the thing which was really clean can be explained where he touched clean things with a dead reptile and the case where he declared clean the thing which was really defiled can be explained where he mixed them with his fruits mission. It happened once that a cow's womb was taken away and Artarfon gave it to the dogs to eat the matter came before the sages at Jabna and they permitted the animal for Theodos the physician had said no cow nor so leaves Alexandria of Egypt before its womb is cut out in order that it may not breed said Artarfon your ass is gone Tarfon said Arakiba to him you are absolved for you are an expert and whoever is an expert for the Bethdin is absolved from reparation Gamara and why does not Arakiba? Infer this from the fact that he had heard in a matter where the mission is explicit and one who errs in a matter where the mission is explicit can reconsider his decision he gave him one reason and then another one reason for absolving is because you gave a wrong decision against an explicit law in the mission and another is that even if your mistake was made against the common practice you are an expert for the Bethdin and whoever is an expert for the Bethdin is absolved from reparation. Mission if one takes payment for seeing the firstlings they must not be slaughtered by his instructions unless he was an expert Talmud, Mosbek or like Ilah and Jabna whom the sages permitted to accept four as for small cattle and six as for large cattle whether unblemished or blemished tomorrow what is the reason in one case i.e. of
If he was an old man he mounts him on an ass he also pays the priest as he would a workman tomorrow whence is it proved Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab scripture says behold I have taught you etc just as I teach virtuously so you should teach virtuously it has also been taught to the same effect scripture says even as the Lord my God commanded me intimating just as I teach virtuously so you should teach virtuously and whence do we derive that if he cannot find someone to teach him virtuously he must pay for learning the text states by the truth and whence do we infer that one should not say as I learned the Torah by paying so I shall teach it for payment the text states and sell it not to sprinkle or to sanctify its waters are considered cave waters and its ashes are considered calcined ashes the following was cited in contradiction if one betroths a woman with the waters of purification or with the ashes of purification she is betrothed although he isn't. Israelite said obey this offers no difficulty in the case mentioned above in the Beritha it is payment for bringing the ashes or filling the waters whereas in the case of the Mishnah it is payment for actual sprinkling or sanctification I can also prove it for here in our Mishnah it states to sprinkle or to sanctify whereas there in the Beritha it states if one betroths a woman with the waters of purification or with the ashes of purification it stands proved if he was a priest and he was made unclean in respect of his terimah how could the priest go to a place of uncleanness he went to a Beth HaParis the prohibition being a rabbinical enactment for Rab Judah reported in the name of Rabbi man can blow away the bones of a Beth HaParis and may then proceed Talmud, Mas Bekorot B and Arjuda B Ami reported in the name of Rab Judah a Beth HaParis which has been trodden is levitically clean or we may also say the Mishnah refers to other impurities concerning which he is not warned against coming into contact if he was an old man he mounts him on an asset and taught he receives payment on the scale of a workman with nothing to do what does the expression an idle workman mean since it does not render him idle Abbe said he pays the priest like a workman idle from his particular occupation mission if one is suspected in connection with firstlings even deer's flesh we must not buy from him nor undressed hides or Eliezer says female hides we may buy from him washed or dirty wool we must not buy from him but spun wool or garments we may buy from him Gemara the reason for prohibiting deer's flesh is because it might be exchanged for calves flesh undressed skins are forbidden to be bought thus implying that dressed skins we may buy what is the reason if there was any substance in the suspicion that they might be of a firstling he would not have troubled in the matter reflecting thus if the rabbis heard about me they would make me forfeit them our Eliezer says female hides we may buy from him what is the reason it is easily recognized and the first tana if this be so then in the case of a male also he might cut away the male genital and maintain that mice have devoured it and the other the action of mice is easily recognized washed or dirty wool we must not buy from him if we must not purchase washed wool from him is there any question about dirty wool rather this is stated as one case wool washed from its dirt but spun wool or garments we may buy from him now if we must not buy spun wool is there any question as to garments the kind of garments meant are felt spreading's mission if one is suspected of ignoring the sabbatical year flax must not be bought from him even carded but spun or woven wool may be bought from him tomorrow now if spun wool may be bought is there any question with regard to woven wool woven means here twist mission if one is suspected of selling terramize holland even water and salt must not be Bought from him, these are the words of our Judah. Our Simeon says, Whatever comes under the obligation of Terima and tithes must not be bought from him. Gemara, the expression, Whatever of our Simeon, what does it include? It includes the entrails of fish in which oil is mixed. There was a certain butcher suspected of selling Talmud. Moss Bekor wrote a kidney fat for the fat of Ilium. Rabbah punished him by forbidding him to sell even nuts. Said our Papa to Rabbah, What opinion does this represent? Our Judah's if it is the opinion of our Judah, then the prohibition should apply even to water and salt. It may still represent the opinion of our Simeon, and we punish him through the very object which caused the offense. Young children are generally attracted by nuts. He goes and misleads the children of butchers, attracting them by means of nuts. They bring him kidney fat, and he sells it for the fat of Ilium. Mission one who is suspected of ignoring the sabbatical year is not suspected of ignoring also the tithes one. Who is suspected of ignoring tithes is not suspected of ignoring also the sabbatical year one who is suspected of ignoring both is suspected of ignoring the rules of levitical purity and it is possible for one to be suspected of ignoring the rules of levitical purity and yet not suspected of ignoring the two laws cited above this is the general rule one who is suspected of ignoring a religious law must not give judgment on it or testify concerning it tomorrow what is the reason fruits of it sabbatical year are not required to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem whereas tithes are required to be eaten within the walls and therefore the rule is more stringent with regard to the one who is suspected of ignoring tithes what is the reason the tithe can be redeemed whereas fruit of the sabbatical year is forbidden to him and cannot be redeemed and therefore the rule is more stringent in regard to one who is suspected of ignoring both laws since he is suspected of ignoring both Laws of biblical enactment how much more so is he suspected of ignoring a rabbinic enactment like eating Holland levitically prepared and it is possible for one who is suspected of ignoring the rules of levitical purity what is the reason even though he is suspected of ignoring a rabbinic enactment he is not suspected of ignoring a biblical enactment the following was cited in contradiction one who can be relied upon in respect of the rules of purity is relied upon with respect to the sabbatical year and tithes this allows the inference that one who is suspected of ignoring the rules of levitical purity is suspected of ignoring the laws just cited said RLA the mission refers to a case where we saw him practice privately at home our Jane son of Arishmael said the Barry the refers to a case where EG he was suspected of ignoring both the sabbatical year and levitical purity and he came before the rabbis and received a warning concerning both of them and subsequently he was again suspected of ignoring one of them we then hold that since he is suspected of ignoring the one he is also suspected of ignoring the other rabbi barhana reported in the name of our yohan and those are the words of our akiba whose opinion has been adopted without naming him but the sages say one who is suspected of ignoring the laws of the sabbatical year is suspected of ignoring the laws of tithes who are the sages referred to our judah for in the place of our judah the sabbatical year was strictly observed by the people for there was a certain party who called after his companion proselyte son of a proselyte and the latter retorted may i merit divine reward as i have not eaten the fruits of the sabbatical year like you some there are who say rabbi barhana reported in the name of our yohan and those are the words of our akiba whose opinion has been adopted without naming him but the sages say one who is suspected of ignoring tithes is suspected of ignoring the law of it Sabbatical year and who are the sages referred to it is our mayor who said one who is suspected of ignoring one religious law is suspected of disregarding the whole Torah Arjona and our Jeremiah the pupils of our Zeira or according to others Arjona and our Zeira pupils of our Yohanan reported differently one said but the sages said one who is suspected of ignoring the sabbatical year laws Talmud Mas Bekorot B is suspected of ignoring the laws of tithes and who are the sages referred to our Judah for in the place of our Judah the sabbatical year law was kept strictly by the people and the other said one who is suspected of ignoring the laws of tithes is suspected of ignoring the sabbatical year laws and who are the sages referred to our mayor as it has been taught in Amharas who accepted the obligations of a Haber and who is suspected of ignoring one religious law is suspected of disregarding the whole Torah but the sages say he is only suspected of ignoring that particular. Religious law and a proselyte who accepted the teachings of the Torah, though he is suspected of ignoring only one religious law, is suspected of disregarding the whole Torah, and he is considered as a non-observant Israelite. The difference would be that if he betroths a woman, even after his relapse, his betrothal is valid. The woman thus requiring a divorce. Our rabbis taught if one is prepared to accept the obligation of a Haber, except one religious law, we must not receive him as a Haber. If a even is prepared to accept the Torah, except one religious law, we must not receive him as an Israelite. Our Jose, son of our Judah, says even if the exception be one point of the special minutiae of the scribes' enactments, and similarly, if a son of a Levite was prepared to accept the duties of the community of Levites, except one religious law, we must not receive him as a Levite. If a priest was prepared to accept the duties of the priesthood, except one religious law, we must not receive him as a priest as it is said he among the sons of A
So then you have your ruling where Beth Shammai is more lenient and Beth Hillel is the stricter rather red Beth Hillel say both in the one case as well as in the other the period is 30 days Nimad a Haber scholar purple blue repent tax collector are rabbis taught one who desires to accept the obligations of a Haber is required to do so in the presence of three Habram whereas his sons and the members of his family are not required to accept these obligations in the presence of three Habram but Arsimian B. Gamaliel says his sons and the members of his family are also required to accept these obligations in the presence of three Habram because the case of a Haber who accepts these obligations is not on a PAR with the case of the son of a Haber who accepts them are rabbis taught one who desires to accept the obligations of a Haber is required to accept them in the presence of three Habram and even a Talmud Hakam a scholar is required to accept the obligations. In the presence of three Habram an elder a member of a scholar's council is not required to accept these obligations in the presence of three Habram having already accepted them from the time when he took his place at the council Abbasal says even a Talmud Hakam is not required to accept the obligations of Haber in the presence of three Habram and not only this but even others may accept the obligations of Haber in his presence said Aryohanan in the days of the son of Arhanabi. Antigonus was this teaching taught for Arjuna and Arhose were in doubt concerning a matter of Levitical cleanness they sent a pair of scholars to the son of Arhanabi Antigonus they went and asked him to inquire into the matter they found him carrying Levitically prepared food he seated some of his own disciples with them while he stood up to look into the question they came and informed Arjuna and Arhose of his conduct towards them Arjuna said to them his father held scholars in Contempt and he also holds scholars in contempt. Arhose replied to him, Let the dignity of the elder lie undisturbed in its place. But from the day that the temple was destroyed, the priests guarded their dignity by not entrusting matters of Levitical cleanness to everybody. Our rabbis taught the wife of a Haber is considered as a Haber. If a Haber dies, his wife and the members of the family retain their status until there is reason to suspect them. And similarly, a courtyard in which Teeth left. Purple blue is sold retains its status until it is disqualified. Our rabbis taught the wife of an Amhiris who was married to a Haber, likewise a daughter of an Amhiris who was married to a Haber, and similarly the slave of an Amhiris who was sold to a Haber. All of these must first accept the obligations of a Haber, but the wife of a Haber who was married to an Amhiris, likewise the daughter of a Haber who was married to an Amhiris, and similarly the slave of a Haber who was sold to. And Amhiras need not first accept the obligations of Haber. Our Simeon B. Eliezer says even the latter require first to accept the obligations of Haber. For our Simeon B. Eliezer reported in the name of Armadir it happened with a certain woman who was married to Haber that she fastened the straps of the Tefillin phylacteries on his hand and when afterwards married to a publican she knotted the custom seals for him. Talmud, Mosbek our rabbis taught and all of these if they repented. Must never be received. These are the words of Armadir. Our Judah says if they repented only in secrecy we must not receive them but if publicly they may be received. Some there are who say if what they did was in secrecy they may be received but if publicly they must not be received. But our Simeon and our Joshua B. Karhase both in the first case as in the other they may be received because of what is said. Turn no backsliding children are Isaac of Faraka reported in the name of our Yohan and the Halachat. Is in accordance with the view of that pair our rabbis taught at first the sages said if a Haber became a tax collector he is expelled from the order if he withdrew he is not received as a Haber they subsequently declared if he withdrew he is regarded like any other person the scholars required the teaching of Arhunabi high rabbi and our Joseph went into him together with 400 pairs of scholars when he learned that they were coming he read 400 stools for them eventually. They heard that he had become a tax collector thereupon they sent him a message that he should adhere to his office he went back to his former position and sent back to them I have withdrawn our Joseph did not go but rabbi went our Joseph said we have learned if he withdrew from the office he must not be received as a Haber rabbi however says we have learned they subsequently decided that if he withdrew he is regarded like any other person our rabbis taught a man may examine all firstlings except his own he may examine his holy sacrifices and his animal types he also allows himself to be asked with reference to his levitically prepared food the master said a man may examine all firstlings except his own what are the circumstances shall I say that only one person examines but is one person believed then we must suppose that three persons examined but are three persons suspected on his account have we not learned if a woman made a declaration of protest or performed halizah before him a scholar the latter may marry her because he is of the Bethdin I may still say it refers to one person and as our history reported in the name of our Yohan and elsewhere that it was a case of an individual expert so also here it is a case of an individual expert who examined the firstling he may examine his holy sacrifices the reason being because if he wished he could ask for their release from a scholar and as regards his animal types the reason is because if he wished he could cast a blemish in the entire herd of animals he also allows himself to be asked with reference to his levitically prepared food the reason being because they are fit to eat during the period of his uncleanness chapter mission of the prophet on all dedicated objects which became unfit for the altar goes to the sanctuary they are sold in the market slaughtered in the market and weighed by the pound except in the case of a firstling or a tithing animal as their profit goes to the owners the profit on dedicated objects which became unfit for the purpose consecrated goes to the sanctuary you must weigh one piece of meat of the firstborn against another piece of ordinary meat of ascertained weight talmud mosbekorot bigamara the mission says that the profit on all dedicated objects which have become unfit for the object consecrated goes to the sanctuary now when is this is it after redemption then why does it state that their profit belongs to the sanctuary is not it Profit on them for the owners if again you maintain that the mission refers to the period before redemption why does it say they are slaughtered do they not require presentation and valuation no difficulty arises according to him who says that objects consecrated for the altar are not included in the law of presentation and valuation but according to him who holds that they are included in the law of presentation and valuation what answer could you give you can still say that the mission refers to the period after redemption and what is meant then by the expression their profit belongs to the sanctuary it means from the beginning for since the master permits them to be sold in the market slaughtered in the market and weighed by the pound the amount of the redemption is increased from the beginning except in the case of a firstling or of a tithing animal as their profit belongs to the owners this is quite fair in the case of a firstling which although it must not be sold in the market can be sold privately but our animal tithes allowed to be sold privately has it not been taught in connection with the firstling it is said but the firstling of an ox thou shalt not redeem intimating that it may be sold alive and in connection with animal tithing it says it shall not be redeemed intimating that it is forbidden to be sold either alive or ritually cut whether unblemished or blemished this problem presented itself to our she's hate in the evening and he solved it. The next morning by reference to a very the mentioned below we are dealing here in the mission with the tithing animal belonging to orphans and by permitting in this case we resort to the principle of restoring something lost our ED was the attendant of our she's hate he heard this answer from him and proceeded to mention it in the college but did not cite it in his name our she's hate heard of it and was annoyed he exclaimed he who has bitten me a scorpion should bite him and what practical. Difference did this make to our she's hate as Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab what is the meaning of the scriptural text I will dwell in thy tent in both worlds is it possible for a man to dwell in two worlds what David meant is this master of the universe may they cite a tradition in my name in this world for our Yohanan reported in the name of our Simeon B. Yohei when a tradition is cited in a scholar's name in this world his lips murmur in the grave and our Isaac B. Zerah also said what is the meaning of the scriptural text and the roof of thy mouth like the best wine that glides smoothly for my beloved moving gently the lips of those that are asleep it is like a heated mass of grapes just as a heated mass of grapes strips as soon as you apply your finger so do the lips of scholars in the graves murmur when sayings are cited in their name what is the very referred to above as it has been taught a tithing animal belonging to orphans we may sell and as to the flesh of originally. Cut tithing animal he may also sell it in conjunction with its skin fat tendons and bones what does the berith mean Abbe said it means this a tithing animal belonging to orphans may be sold and how is it sold in conjunction with its skin fat tendons and horns this would therefore imply that in
When it is alive thus implying that after being ritually cut it may be redeemed and it is but the rabbis who have prohibited its selling after having been ritually cut in order to prevent its selling before it was ritually cut consequently in the case of an object which is valued when alive the rabbis prohibited its selling after having been ritually cut in order to prevent its selling before it was ritually cut Talmud, Mas Pekorot, but in the case of an object which is not valued when alive the rabbis did not prohibit and in the case of orphans the rabbis let the law remain according to the biblical ruling and our Samuel son of our Isaac also held Rabbi's view for our Samuel son of our Isaac said once is it proved that we may sell a tithing animal belonging to orphans in the ordinary way because it is said notwithstanding thou mayest kill and eat flesh within all thy gates after all the desire of thy soul according to the blessing of the Lord thy God now which dedicated object has no blessing from the dedication when alive but only after being slaughtered you must say that this is a tithing animal the following query was put forward what of selling its flesh in conjunction with the bones are high and our Simeon son of Rabbi differ in this matter one says he may sell indirectly and the other says he must not sell indirectly and they do not really differ the teacher who forbids refers to the bones of small cattle and the other refers to bones of large cattle or if you prefer I can say in the one case as well as in the other it refers to large cattle and yet there is no difference of opinion one follows the custom of his place and the other that of his above text states in connection with the first link scripture says thou shalt not redeem implying that it may be sold when alive and in connection with tithing it is said in the scriptures it shall not be redeemed intimating that it is forbidden to be sold either alive or ritually cut whether unblemished or blemished whence is this proof our Hanan reported in the name of Rab and likewise when our Dimi came he reported in the name of our Yohanan it is said in connection with tithing the expression it shall not be redeemed and we read in the scriptures in connection with Haram the expression it shall not be redeemed just as the latter includes the prohibition of selling so the former includes selling said Arnam the son of Isaac to Arhuna son of Joshua the text it shall not be redeemed is Free for interpretation for if it were not free for interpretation it may be objected against this analogy that the case of Haram is different because they take effect upon everything is it not so it is indeed open for interpretation for if scripture should not have stated it shall not be redeemed in connection with Haram one could have inferred this from the case of a tithing animal just as a tithing animal is holy and is not redeemed so Haram are holy and are not redeemed what? Need therefore is therefore the words it shall not be redeemed deduced from here consequently that it is free for interpretation but it may be objected to this analogy that the case of a tithing animal is different because the animals which preceded and followed the tenth in the counting are all holy rather argue that scripture should not have stated it shall not be redeemed in connection with Haram and one could have inferred this from the case of the firstling as a firstling is. Holy and is not redeemed so Haramim are holy and cannot be redeemed what need then is therefore scripture to write it shall not be redeemed this shows that it is free for interpretation but it may still be objected that the case of the firstling is different because it is hallowed from birth rather argue that scripture should not have used the expression it shall not be redeemed in connection with the tithing animal and one could have inferred this from the analogy between passing here and Passing mentioned in connection with the firstling as a firstling is holy and is not redeemed so a tithing animal is holy and is not redeemed what need then is therefore scripture to write it shall not be redeemed in connection with the tithing animal it is therefore free for interpretation but still the expression in connection with the tithing animal is not free since we can refute the analogy as we did above the text that thou shalt cause to pass is superfluous but why not also make a Comparison between the text thou shalt not redeem used in connection with the firstling and the text it shall not be redeemed used in connection with Haram the redemption mentioned in connection with tithing is free for interpretation whereas the redemption mentioned in connection with the firstling is not free for interpretation but why do you see fit to say that the text mentioning redemption in connection with the firstling is required for its own sake while the text it shall not be redeemed in connection with tithing is free for interpretation why not say that the text it shall not be redeemed in connection with tithing is required for its own sake while the text thou shalt not redeem referring to a firstling is free for interpretation we compare the word Geula with the word Geula whereas we do not compare the word Pedia used in connection with the firstborn with the word Geula mentioned in connection with Haram but what is the practical difference did not attend of the school of our Ishmael teach scripture says and the priest shall come again and later it says and the priest shall come to show that the same rule applies to his coming the second time as to his entering after a week this is the case only where no identical words are to be found with which to compare but where identical words are to be found we rather make the comparison with identical words but why not infer the case of the firstling from that of a tithing animal by means of it. Analogy between passing and passing for as regards the forbidding of the sale of a tithing animal we have already compared the word Geula with the word Geula mentioned in connection with Haram scripture excludes this in connection with Haram saying it is most holy implying it is most holy but not a firstling but why not say that the text implies it is most holy but not tithing it is reasonable to maintain that the word Geula is used in connection with tithing and it where Geula is used with reference to Haramim in order that the former may be compared with the latter Rabbah said the text it shall not be redeemed in connection with Haramim is superfluous for where were these Haramim if in the possession of the owners then they are holy if in the possession of the priest then they are holy and may be sold for it has been taught so long as Haramim are in the possession of the owners they are considered as holy in all respects for it is said every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord if however he gave them to the priest they are considered as holy in all respects as it is said everything devoted in Israel shall be thine Talmud Mas Bekorot be what need then is there for the text it shall not be redeemed if it has no bearing on the subject of Haramim make it bear on the subject of tithing as regards selling but why not say make it bear on the subject of the firstling it is reasonable to maintain that the word Geula used in Connection with Haram is to be applied to tithing since the identical word Geula is used with reference to tithing as with the former Arashi says it shall not be redeemed mentioned in connection with tithing means that it shall not be sold said Arashi once can I prove the scripture writes then both it and that for which it is changed shall be holy it shall not be redeemed now when is it that the law of substitution applies when the animal is alive therefore when may it not be redeemed when it is alive thus implying that after having been slaughtered it may be redeemed but does it not require presentation and valuation therefore you must deduce from here that the text it shall not be redeemed means that it shall not be sold this would indeed hold good according to him who holds that objects consecrated for the altar are included in the law of presentation and valuation but according to him who holds that objects consecrated for the altar are not included in the law a presentation and valuation what can you reply we mean this Arashi argues is there any object which cannot be redeemed when alive and can yet be redeemed after being slaughtered but why not it is natural that when an object is alive its holiness being strong it cannot be redeemed whereas after its slaughtering its holiness having been weakened it may be that it can be redeemed but is it not a matter of course for if when the animal is alive when it is qualified to effect redemption scripture says that it cannot be redeemed after having been slaughtered when it has not the strength to effect redemption how much more so is it the case that it cannot be redeemed consequently we deduce from here that the text it shall not be redeemed means that it shall not be sold but why does not the divine law then write explicitly it shall not be sold if the divine law had written it shall not be sold i might have thought that it cannot indeed be sold since he performed a secular Action in exchanging, but it can be redeemed because its money enters the coffers of the sanctuary. The divine law therefore writes it shall not be redeemed, teaching that it can neither be sold nor redeemed. Mishnah Beth Shammai say an Israelite must not be invited to share a blemished firstling with a priest, whereas Beth Hillel permit this even in the case of a heathen Gemara whose view does the Mishnah represent that of Arachibah, for it has been taught only a company, all of whom are priests, may enter for a share of the firstling. These are the words of Beth Shammai, but Beth Hillel permit even strangers Arachibah permits according to Beth Hillel, even heathens. What is the reason of Beth Shammai? It is written, and the flesh of them shall be thine as the way breast and as the right shoulder are thine, just as their priests may eat, but not a lay Israelite. So your priests are allowed to eat, but not an Israelite Talmud, Mas Bekorot, and Beth Hillel. This is only the case in connection with an unblemished firstling
Deuteronomy mentioning the gazelle and the heart. One text is for what our Isaac and our Ashai taught, the other for what our Eliezer Hakapur taught, and the last to interpret as follows as a gazelle and heart are not subject to the law of the firstling and the priest's gift, so consecrated objects rendered unfit for sacrifices are not subject to the law of the firstling and the priest's gifts. Our rabbis taught a firstling must not be given to eat to menstruant women. These are the words of Beth. Shammai, whereas Beth Hillel say we are allowed to give it to eat to menstruant women, what is the reason of Beth Shammai scripture writes with reference to a firstling and the flesh of them shall be thine as the way breast and as the right shoulder as there in the case of the way breast, etc. Menstruant women are forbidden to eat, so here menstruant women are forbidden to eat the firstling and Beth Hillel. This is only the case with an unblemished firstling, but as regards a blemished. Firstling the unclean as well as the clean may eat it alike and Beth this is only the case that an unclean person may eat it where the impurity does not issue from the body but where the impurity issues from the body it is not so for we find that the divine law makes a distinction between impurity which issues from the body and impurity which does not issue from the body for we have learned the paschal language is offered by those in a state of uncleanness must not be eaten by. Zabum Zabov menstruant women or confined women and Beth Hillel their Zabum etc. are forbidden to eat the paschal lamb because scripture explicitly made this clear in the text by reason of a dead body whereas here in connection with the firstling the text says the unclean person in general implying without any distinction our rabbis taught we must not flay an animal from the feet on a holy day nor on a weekday when the animal is a firstborn even blemished nor sacrifices rendered unfit now we. Understand this as regards a holy day because he undertakes a labor of which he can make no use on that day but as regards a firstling who is the authority for the law just quoted said Arhista it is the view of Beth Shammai who say we must not give it to eat to menstruant women nor sacrifices rendered unfit who is the authority for the said Arhista it is the opinion of our Eliezer B. R. Simeon for it has been taught if he has two sin offerings in front of him one unblemished and the other. Blemished the unblemished one shall be offered up and the blemished one shall be redeemed if however the blemished one was slaughtered before the blood of the unblemished animal was sprinkled it may be eaten but if it was slaughtered after the blood of the unblemished animal was sprinkled it is forbidden to be eaten our Eliezer B. R. Simeon however says even if the flesh of the blemished one is already in the pot if the blood of the unblemished one had been sprinkled it is forbidden to be. Eden and why does not our Hisdah interpret the above very well altogether in accordance with Beth Shammai? Perhaps Beth Shammai is stringent only with reference to a firstling since its holiness is from birth, but in the case of sacrifices which have become unfit whose holiness is not from birth, the case is different. Talmud, Mosbek, or B, and why not interpret the above very well altogether in accordance with our Eliezer son of our Simeon? Perhaps our Eliezer son of our Simeon holds that it is forbidden only in the case of sacrifices which have become unfit for they are competent to be redeemed, but in the case of a firstling which is not competent to be redeemed, it is different. But does not our Eliezer son of our Simeon accept the preceding mission? All consecrated objects which become unfit may be sold in the market, slaughtered in the market, and weighed by the pound. From this we see that since there is a benefit for the sanctuary, the rabbis permitted it here also, then since there is a Benefit for the sanctuary let the rabbis permit its flaying said Armari the son of Arkahana what benefit he obtains through selling the skin at a high price he loses by spoiling the flesh in the Palestinian colleges it was said in the name of Rabbin the reason is because it appears like doing work with sacrificial animals our Jose B. Abin says it is a precautionary measure lest he raise herds from the mission if the firstling has an attack of congestion we must not let its blood even if it dies as a result these are the words of our Judah but the sages say he may let blood only he must not make a blemish and if he made a blemish he must not slaughter it on account of this our Simeon however says he may let blood even though he makes a blemish Amara our rabbis taught we may let blood of a firstling which had an attack of congestion in a part of the body where it is not made blemish but we must not let blood in a part of the body where a blemish is caused these are the words of Armenia, but the sages say he may let blood even in the part which makes it blemish only he must not slaughter it on account of that blemish our Simeon however says it may also be slaughtered on account of that blemish our Judah says we must not let blood for it even if it dies as a result our Eliezer taught his son as follows a similar difference of opinion exists with reference to a jug of terimah for we have learned if there is a jug of terimah concerning which there is a doubt as to its Levitical cleanness our Eliezer says if it was lying in a filthy place he must put it in a cleanly place and if it was open he must cover it our Joshua says if it was lying in a clean place he must put it in a filthy place and if it was covered he must open it while our Gamaliel says he must not introduce any new factor now our Meir will hold the view of our Eliezer the rabbis will hold according to the view of our Joshua and our Judah will hold the view of our Gamaliel but once is this proven it may be that our mayor holds this view only here because he does it directly, but there where the effect is caused indirectly, he holds the view of our Joshua, and it may be that our Eliza holds this view only in connection with doubtful terimah in case Elijah should come and pronounce it clean. But in this case, where if you leave it, the animal dies, he holds the view of the rabbis, and perhaps the rabbis hold their view only here. For if he leaves it, it dies. But there, in case Elijah should come and pronounce it clean, they hold with our Eliza, and perhaps our Joshua holds his view only there because the effect is caused indirectly. But here, where the effect is direct, he may even hold the view of our Eliza, and perhaps our Judah holds his view only here. For he does it directly, but where the effect is merely caused indirectly, he may agree with our Joshua, and perhaps our Gamaliel may hold his view only there in case Elijah should come and pronounce it clean. But here, where if he leaves the animal, it dies. He agrees with the rabbis and moreover the difference of opinion here is with reference to the interpretation of scriptural text and there too the difference of opinion is with reference to the interpretation of scriptural text there the difference is with reference to the interpretation of text for our high b Abba reported in the name of our Yohanan all are agreed that one who added a transgression to the leavening affected by another person is guilty of breaking the law in this connection for scripture says it shall not be baked with leaven no meal offering shall be made with leaven all are also agreed in the case of one who adds a transgression to the mutilation caused by another person that he is guilty for scripture writes that which hath its stones bruised or crushed or torn or cut ye shall not offer unto the lord now if he is guilty for cutting the stones how much more so is he guilty for tearing them the purpose of the text is therefore to include the case of Tearing after another person had cut as rendering him guilty. The point at issue, however, is with reference to causing a blemish to a blemished animal. Our mayor holding that we emphasize the text, there shall be no blemish therein, whereas the rabbis hold that we emphasize the full beginning, it shall be perfect to be accepted. And what does our mayor do with the text? It shall be perfect to be accepted. He requires it to exclude the case of an animal which possessed a blemish originally, but is not the case of an originally blemished animal, obviously excluded since it is just a palm tree. Rather, it is required to exclude the case of sacrifices rendered unfit for the altar after their redemption. You might be inclined to assume that since they must not be shorn or work, they are also forbidden to be blemished. He therefore informs us that it is not so, and as regards the rabbis, does not scripture write there shall be no blemish therein. This text forbids causing a blemish even indirectly. For it has been taught scripture says there shall be no blemish therein I am here told Talmud, Mosbek wrote only that he must not cause a blemish directly once is it learned that he must not bring a case of pressed figs or dough and put it on the ear so that a dog may come and eat it with the possibility of a blemish being caused therefore the text says there shall be no blemish it says blemish and it adds there shall be no blemish and there also the difference of opinion is in the interpretation of scriptural texts for Rabbi Judah reported in the name of Samuel and so did Rush Lakish say and likewise our Naman reported in the name of Rabbi Aboah scripture says and I behold I have given thee the charge of my heave offerings our Eliza holds that scripture refers to two kinds of terima one clean terima and the other terima held in suspense and the divine law says keep charge of it not to make it unnecessarily unclean and how does our Joshua explain this that Written text is my offering. Does this mean to say that our Eliza holds that the traditional reading vowels must guide us? The
Rule rather you must say that it refers to the Arsimian of the Beritha and Arshisha B.E. did taught this explicitly Rab Judah reported in the name of Samuel the Halachat is like Arsimian of the Beritha mission if one makes a slit in the ear of a firstborn animal he must never slaughter it these are the words of Arlizer whereas the sages say he may slaughter it on account of another blemish when it appears on it Gemara and does Arlizer penalize in perpetuity the following was cited in Contradiction if one had a Bahir Talmud, Mosbek or and it was cut off unintentionally he becomes clean if however he cut it off intentionally our Eliezer says when another plague spot appears on him from which he is pronounced clean then he is cleansed from the first but the sages say in order for him to be clean either the second plague must break out all over his flesh or before the cutting off of the first leper spot it must have decreased to less than the size of a Bean Rabbah and Arjoseph both replied our Eliezer penalizes us only where a person's property is concerned not where his body is concerned as regards his property i.e. the firstling one can say that he may do it in either case but as regards his body can it be said that he would do it in either case said Rabbah is there only a contradiction between our Eliezer here in the Mishnah and our Eliezer in Nikaim is there not a similar contradiction between the rabbis in the Mishnah and the rabbis? In Nikaim, the difficulty with regard to our Eliezer has already been solved, and as regards the difficulty in the case of the rabbis, this is also no problem. In the one case, we punish him for what he did, and in the other, also, we punish him for what he did. In one case, that of the firstling, we punish him for what he did. For how did he intend to make it permitted by means of this blemish? The rabbis therefore punished him by ordering that the firstling should not be permitted on account of this very blemish, and in the other case, we punish him for what he did. For how did he intend to make himself appear clean by cutting off this bahir? If the rabbis therefore punished him for this very cut, our papa inquired, does it mean he shall become clean, or and then he shall become clean? What is the practical difference in the case of the bridegroom on whom there appeared the second leper spot? For we learned in the case of the bridegroom on whom there appears a plague spot, we give him seven days of it. Wedding week not to see the priest to him to his garment and to his covering and likewise in the case of any person on a festival we give him the whole festival in which not to see a priest now if you say that it means he shall become clean then he is clean from the first plague and as regards the second we wait seven days for him but if you say that it means and then he shall become clean of what avail is it that he is not unclean from the second plague if he remains unclean by reason of the first plague what is the answer let the question stand over our Jeremiah inquired from our Zeira if one slit the ear of the firstling and he died what is the ruling as regards penalizing his son should you take as a guide the rule that if a man sells his slave to a heathen and he dies his son is penalized after him the reason there may be because every day he is prevented from carrying out commandments and should you be guided by the rule that if a man plans some work for the Intermediate days of the festival and dies his son is not penalized after him the reason there may be because he did not actually do anything forbidden what then is the ruling here did the rabbis penalize the man himself and he is no more or perhaps does the penalty of the rabbis apply to his property and this is still in existence he replied to him we have learned this in a mission a field which had its thorns removed in the sabbatical year may be sown in the period beginning with the end of the sabbatical year if however the field had been improved or manured with the excrement of cattle it must not be sown in the period beginning with the end of the sabbatical year and our Jose B. Hanada said we hold the tradition if he improved the field and died his son may sow it consequently we see that the rabbis punished the man himself but the rabbis did not punish his son here also the rabbis punished the man himself but not his son said Abbe, we hold the tradition Talmud Mosbek wrote if a man made unclean food levitically prepared and died his son is not punished after him what is the reason a damage not discernible in the object itself is not regarded as a tangible damage it is therefore only a rabbinical penalty thus the rabbis imposed a penalty upon the man himself whereas the rabbis did not impose a penalty upon his son mission it happened that a quester saw an old male lamb with its long wool hanging down and asked what is the meaning of this they replied it is a firstling and is not to be slaughtered until it has a blemish the roman took a dagger and slit its ear the matter came before the sages and they permitted it after they had permitted he went and cut into the ears of other firstlings the sages thereupon forbade them children were once playing in a field they tied the tails of sheep one to the other and one tail which belonged to a firstling was severed the matter came before the rabbis and they permitted the firstling when the children saw that they had permitted they proceeded to tie the tails of other firstlings the sages thereupon forbade the other firstlings this is the rule wherever the blemish is caused with the knowledge and consent of the owner it is forbidden but if it is not with his knowledge and consent it is permitted Gemara children were once playing etc it is necessary to state both these cases in the mission for if it had informed us only of the case of the heathen i might have thought that the reason was because there can be no fear if we permit that he will acquire the habit of making blemishes but in the case of a minor where he might acquire the habit of making blemishes i might have said that it was forbidden and if it had informed us only of the case of a minor i might have thought that the reason was because one would not mistake the case of a minor for an adult but in the case of the quest where one might mistake this for the case of any adult i might have said that it was Forbidden there is need therefore for the mission to state both cases are historic reported in the name of Katna. This was taught only when they replied to him in the words until it has a blemish, but if they reply to him in the words until it was made blemished, it is as if they had told him go make a blemish, said Rabbah. Now does not the permission come automatically? What difference then is it whether they reply to him in the words until it has a blemish or until it was made blemished? Even if they reply to him in the words until it was made blemished, the permission comes automatically, and thus there is no difference. This is the rule wherever the blemish is caused with the knowledge and consent of the owner. IT is forbidden. What does this include? It includes the case where the blemish was caused indirectly, but if it is not with his knowledge, this includes the case where they casually mentioned the fact mission. If the firstling was running after him and he kicked it and thereby Blemish that he may slaughter it on account of this Gemara said our papa this was taught only when he kicked it while it was running but if he kicked it after it had stopped running it is not so but is not this obvious I might have assumed that the reason why he kicked it was because he recalled his distress he therefore teaches us that this was not the reason some there are who say our papa said do not say that this applies only while it was running but not after it had stopped running for even after it had stopped running the same law applies for the reason that he recalled his distress said Rab Judah it is permitted to cause a blemish to a firstling before it is born said Rabbi e.g. a kid in its ears and a lamb in its lips some there are who say a lamb even in its ears for one can say that the animal came forth from the womb with its temples first said our papa if when the animal eats the defect is not visible but when it bleeds the defect is visible it is considered a blemish. What does he wish to teach us? We have already learned this in a mission. If the incisors were broken off or leveled with the gum, or if the molars were torn out completely, it is considered a blemish. Now, what is the reason in the latter case? Is it not because when the animal bleeds, the defect is visible? Said Rabbi Arpapa also merely explains the mission as follows. Why is it that if they were torn out, they are considered a blemish? Because when the animal bleeds, the defect is visible. Mission. In respect of all blemishes which might come through the agency of a manly Israelite, shepherds are trustworthy, whereas priests' shepherds are not trustworthy. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says he is trustworthy as regards somebody else's firstling, but he is not trustworthy as regards his own. Our Meir says one who is suspected of neglecting any religious matter must not pronounce judgment on it nor give evidence concerning it. Our Yohanan and our Eliezer differ as to the interpretation of the mission. One explains it as follows the expression lay Israelite shepherds means lay Israelites in the employ of priests are trustworthy for we do not apprehend that their testimony may be influenced by their bread and butter the expression priest shepherds means shepherds who are priests in the employ of Israelites are not trustworthy since the shepherd might say since I work for him he will not pass over me and give it to another and the same ruling of the testimony being untrustworthy applies to a shepherd who was a priest with reference to the firstling of another priest for we suspect them of favoring each other and thereupon our Simeon comes and says he is trustworthy as regards somebody else's firstling but he is not trustworthy as regards his own and our Meir then adds he who is suspected of disregarding any religious matter must not pronounce judgment on it nor give evidence concerning
says that the expression Israelite shepherds means shepherds of Israelite animals and even if priests they are trustworthy it is for this reason that our mayor thereupon says he who is suspected of ignoring a certain religious matter must not pronounce judgment on it nor give evidence concerning IT but according to him who holds that the expression priests shepherds means that shepherds who are priests in the employ of Israelites are not trustworthy what does our mayor teach us here is not his view identical with that of the first Tana quoted above the difference between them is the ruling of our Joshua the son of Kapuzei for it has been taught our Joshua the son of Kapuzei says two independent witnesses are required to testify as regards a firstling in the possession of the priest our Simeon B. Gamaliel says even his son or his daughter may give evidence rabbi says even the evidence of ten people is not accepted if they are members of his household according to which authority will be the ruling which our Hista reported in the name of Arkatna who said an uncertain firstling born in the possession of an Israelite requires two independent persons to give evidence you ask according to which authority it is of course according to that of our Joshua the son of Kapuzei our says the owners are permitted to give evidence in respect to an uncertain firstling for if you will not say so but that an Israelite is suspected how according to the view of our mayor can he give evidence with reference to the blemish of a tithing animal but surely with regard to a tithing animal even the owner is trustworthy since if he wished he could have maimed the entire herd before tithing rather question as follows in a case of an uncertain firstling who can testify according to the view of our mayor and if you will say indeed it is so that there is no remedy in these circumstances have we not learned for our Jose used to say wherever there is another animal in its stead in the hands of the priest the Israelite is exempt from the priest's gifts whereas our mayor declares him liable hence therefore we can deduce that the owners are permitted to give evidence with reference to a doubtful firstling priest alone being suspected as regards blemishes whereas Israelites are not suspected as regards blemishes it has been stated our says the halachat is like our Simeon B. Gamaliel Rabbah says however the halachat is like Rabbah but did Rabbah actually state this did not Rabbah Say if the owner of a firstling was with us outside the house and the animal entered whole and emerged injured they can testify concerning it read all its owners were with us we have no apprehension if this be the case what need is there to state it you might be under the impression that we entertain a suspicion he therefore teaches us that it is not so and the law is in agreement with the view of our Simeon B. Gamaliel and only in the case of his son and his daughter is the testimony. Believed but not in the case of his wife what is the reason his wife is considered like himself said our Papa Juave according to the view of our mayor who holds that one who is suspected of disregarding a religious matter must not pronounce judgment on it nor give evidence concerning it and who also maintains that one who is suspected of disregarding one religious matter is suspected of disregarding the whole Torah then a priest should not be able to act as a judge but is it not written and by there were shall every controversy and every stroke be Talmud, Mosbek or Ode our mayor meant that we have fear but did he actually presume that he is to be suspected the following query was put is the testimony of a witness reporting another witness considered as evidence in connection with the first ling RMI forbids whereas RSC permits said RSC to RMI did not the tana of the school of Manasseh teach only in connection with a woman is the evidence of a witness reporting an eye. Witness valid explained this as follows it is valid only in respect of testimony which a woman is allowed to give our Yamar permitted the evidence of a witness reporting an eyewitness to be valid in connection with the first ling Yamar designated to him the expression Yamar the one who permits firstlings and the law is that the evidence of a witness reporting an eyewitness in connection with the first ling is valid said our lay if an animal was not thought to be a first ling and its owner a priest. Came and declared that it was a firstling with a blemish on it. He is believed. What does he teach us? The mouth that bound is the mouth that loosens. But have we not learned this? A woman who said, I was a married woman, but now I am divorced, is believed. For the mouth which bound is the mouth which loosens. You might be under the impression that there she is believed, because if she wished, she need not have said anything. But here, since it is impossible that he should not inform the expert for the priest would not eat consecrated unblemished animals without the temple walls, I might not have applied the principle. The mouth which bound is the mouth which loosens. He therefore informs us that he is believed. For if this were really so, he would have inflicted on it a recognizable blemish and have eaten it. Then Marbi Rab Ashi demurred to this ruling. Why should this be different from the following case? Once someone hired out and asked to a person, and he said to him, Do not go the way of Nihar Pekad, where there is water, go the way of Narish, where there is no water. But he went the way of Nihar Pekad, and the Astide he then came before Rabbah and said to him, Indeed, I went the way of Nihar Pekad, but there was no water. And still the Astide said, Rabbah, why should he lie if he wished he could say, I went the way of Narish? And Abay explained, We do not apply the principle, why should he lie where there are witnesses? But is the analogy correct? There we are witnesses that there certainly was water on the way of Nihar Pekad, but here in connection with the first ling, is it certain that he caused the blemish? It is only a fear, and where there is only a question of a fear, we do say, Why should he lie? Rabbah said, Lecturing and reported this tradition without mentioning the authority, said Rabbah Jr. to Rabbah, We learned this in the name of our Ella Arzadak had a first ling, he set down barley for it in wicker baskets of peeled willow twigs as it was eating its lip was slit, he Came before our Joshua, he said to him, Have we made any difference between a priest who is a Haber and a priest who is an Amhir? As our Joshua replied, Yes, he thereupon came before Rabban Gamaliel, he said to him, Have we made any difference between a priest who is a Haber and a priest who is an Amhir? As Rabban Gamaliel replied, No, Arzadak said to him, But our Joshua told me, Yes, he said, Wait until the great debaters enter the Beth Hamidrash. When they entered the Beth Hamidrash, the questioner arose and asked, Have we made any difference between a priest who is a Haber and one who is an Amhir? As our Joshua replied, No, thereupon Rabban Gamaliel said, Was not the answer, Yes, reported to me in your name, Joshua, stand on your feet and let them testify against you. Our Joshua stood up on his feet and said, How shall I act if indeed I were alive and he were dead? The living can contradict the dead, but since both he and I are alive, how can the living contradict the living? And Rabban Gamaliel was. Sitting and discoursing while our Joshua stood on his feet until all the people murmured and said to Husbeth the interpreter silence and he was silent Mishnah priest's word is taken if he says I have shown this firstling and it is blemished Gemara Rab Judah said that Rab said a priest's word is taken if he says to an expert an Israelite gave me this firstling with a blemish on it what is the reason people are not presumed to tell a lie which is likely to be found out said Rabba we have also learned this a priest's word is taken if he says I have shown this firstling and it is blemished now what is the reason is it not because we say people are not presumed to tell a lie which is likely to be found out no there where it is a case of consecrated animals without the temple precincts he will not eat but here since priests are suspected they are suspected are by raised an objection he who says to one who is not trustworthy with reference to tithing purchase on my behalf produce from one who is trustworthy or from one who tithes he is not believed now why is this so let us adopt the principle that people are not presumed to tell a lie which is likely to be found out the case is different there Talmud, Mosbek or for he can excuse himself by some subterfuge saying as far as I am concerned his word is taken the second clause however of the mission just cited certainly supports Rab Judah's view for it says from that man then he is believed there again. Since there is an inquirer he is afraid said our Jeremiah B. Abba once does our Judah know this it is my own ruling I taught it to Giddle and Giddle taught it to our Judah and this is how I imparted it to him an Israelite's word is taken when he says this first ling I gave to a priest with a blemish on it if it refers to an Israelite surely this is obvious no the statement is required for the case where the animal was small when he gave it to the priest and it grew up you might have it. Impression that the Israelite cannot now establish the identity of the animal, he therefore teaches us that it is not so in Surah. They reported this in the last version, whereas in Pamadiva they reported this in the former version. The law is decided in accordance even with the first version. Raphram of Pamadiva possessed the firstling which he gave to a priest without a blemish. The latter made it blemish. One day his eyes were affected. The priest brought the same animal before him and said to him, This firstling an Israelite gave to me with a blemish on it. He forcefully opened his eyes wide and perceived his fraud. He said to him, Was it not I who gave it to you? Nevertheless, the incident
explained thus if he wished he could have caused a blemish to the whole herd of animals before tithing Mishnah a firstling whose eye was blinded or whose forefoot was cut off or whose hind leg was broken may be slaughtered with the approval of three persons of the synagogue but our Jose says even if a high priest were present a firstling must not be slaughtered except with the approval of an expert tomorrow both Arsimlay and Arjuna the prince reported in the name of Arjashu be Levi another. Version is Arsimlay and Arjashu be Levi both reported in the name of Arjuna the prince the permitting of a firstling abroad is by three persons of the synagogue said Rabba this is so even in the case of prominent blemishes what does he teach us we have learned this a firstling whose eye was blinded or whose forefoot was cut off or whose hind leg was broken may be slaughtered with the approval of three persons of the synagogue from the Mishnah I might have thought that blemishes which are not prominent are also permitted abroad and the reason why the mission speaks of prominent blemishes is for the purpose of showing to what a length our Jose is prepared to go insisting that even so an expert is required he therefore informs us that it is not so Rab Judah said that he was in doubt whether our Jeremiah reported in the name of Rab or in the name of Samuel the following ruling three ordinary persons are required to permit a firstling to be slaughtered when blemished in a place where there is no expert what does it teach us we have learned this the animal may be slaughtered with the approval of three persons of the synagogue from the mission I might have said that even where an expert is available three ordinary persons are required to permit it he therefore informs us that in a place where there is no expert it is as the mission states but in a place where there is an expert it is not so our high Bob reported that Aram said three persons are necessary to permit a firstling to be slaughtered in a place where there is no expert, three persons are required to in all vows where there is no sage, three persons are necessary to permit a firstling in a place where there is no expert. Talmud, Mosbek wrote that this excludes the ruling of our Jose in the mission. Three persons are required to in all vows in a place where there is no sage, this excludes the ruling of our Judah for it has been taught the element of vows requires three persons are Judah rules. One of them must be a sage in the place where there is no sage who, for example, said Arnaman, for example, myself, our Judah rules. One of them must be a sage. Does this imply, therefore, that the rest can be people of any kind? Said Rabbana, they are explained to them and they understand, but our Jose says, even if a high priest were present, etc., our Hanan reported in the name of Rab the Halachat is not in accordance with our Jose. Surely this is obvious for where a single opinion is opposed to the opinion of. More than one the law follows the latter you might have thought that we must adopt our Jose's opinion because he is known to have deep reasons for his rulings he therefore informs us that it is not so you may now infer from this that the former ruling was stated in the name of Samuel for if it were in the name of Rab what need is there for the repetition one ruling was derived by implication from the other mission if one slaughtered a firstling and it became known that he had not shown it. To a scholar as regards what the purchasers have eaten there is no remedy and he must return the money to them as regards however what they have not yet eaten the flesh must be buried and he must return the money to them and likewise if one slaughtered a cow and sold it and it became known that it was true as regards what the purchasers have eaten there is no remedy and as regards what they have not eaten they return the flesh to him and he must return the money to them if it Purchasers in their turn sold it to heathens or cast it to dogs they must pay him the price of Trifigamara or rabbis taught if one sells flesh to another which turned out to be flesh of the firstling or if one sells produce and it turns out to be untithed or if one sells wine and it turns out to be forbidden wine what the purchasers have eaten cannot be remedied and he must return the money to them are Simeon B. Eliezer however says in the case of objects for which a man has a loathing he must return the money to them as there was no benefit to them after knowing whereas in the case of objects for which a man has not a loathing he deducts from the price what had been eaten and the following are the objects for which a person has a loathing carcasses trifes forbidden animals and reptiles and the following are objects for which a person has no loathing firstlings untithed products and forbidden wine do you therefore say that in the case of a firstling he deducts but why? Should not the buyer say to the seller what loss have I caused you know the statement is required for the case where he sold him the flesh from the place where the blemish was for he says to him had you not eaten it I would have shown it to a scholar and he might have permitted it in accordance with the ruling of our Judah as regards untithed things he can say I might have prepared them ritually and eaten them with reference to forbidden wine one can explain that he sold it to him mixed with permitted wine and had he not consumed it he would have been able to benefit by it according to the ruling of our Simeon B. Gamaliel for we have learned if forbidden wine falls into a vat of permitted wine it is forbidden to profit from the whole of it our Simeon B. Gamaliel however says he can sell the whole of it to a heathen except for the value of the forbidden wine in a chapter 6 mission these are the blemishes in consequence of which a firstborn animal may be slaughtered if it's here. Has become defective being cut or bored through from the cartilages inward, but not if the defect is in the ear lap. If it is slit, although there was no loss of substance, if it is perforated with a hole as large as a carshina, or if the ear has become dry, what is called becoming dry. If it is perforated, no drop of blood would issue. Our Jose B. Hamishalam says, It is called dry when it is liable to crumble tomorrow. Why is this so? Does not scripture say lame or blind? It also writes, And if there be any blemish therein, but why not argue that the text, and if there be any blemish therein, is a general statement, while lame or blind is a specification, and where a general statement is followed by a specification, the scope of the general statement is limited by the things specified, so that only lameness or blindness in a firstling are legal blemishes, but other defects are not legal blemishes. The text, any old blemishes whatsoever, is another general statement we have, therefore. A general statement followed by the enumeration of specifications which are in turn followed by a general statement and in such a case we include only such things as are similar to those specified hence just as the specifications are exposed blemishes which cannot become sound again so all legal blemishes must be exposed and unable to become sound again but why not reason as the specifications are exposed blemishes which render the animal incapable of carrying out its normal functions and cannot become sound again so all legal blemishes must be exposed rendering the animal incapable of carrying out its normal functions and unable to become sound again why then have we learned if the ear is defective from the cartilages but not if the defect is in the ear lap the text any old blemish whatsoever is a widening of the scope of what constitutes a blemish if this be so why not also slaughter a firstling in consequence of hidden blemishes why then have we learned if the incisors are broken off or leveled to the gum where the molars are torn out completely Talmud, Mosbek or Opi thus implying that when torn out completely they are blemishes but not where they are broken off or leveled to the gum we require that it should appear an old blemish which is not the case where it is not torn out if this be so why should not a firstling be slaughtered in consequence of a transitory blemish why have we learned but not if the defect is in the ear lap there is a logical reason why we do not slaughter a firstling in consequence of a transitory blemish for seeing that we do not redeem a consecrated animal in consequence of a transitory blemish shall we slaughter in consequence of it for it has been taught scripture says and if it be any unclean beast of which they may not bring an offering unto the Lord the text deals here with sacrifices rendered unfit which were redeemed you say sacrifices rendered unfit perhaps it is really not so but it Speaks actually of an unclean animal since it says, and if it be of an unclean beast, then he shall ransom it according to thy valuation. The case of an unclean animal is already stated. How then do I interpret the text of which they may not bring an offering unto the Lord? You must say that it refers to sacrifices rendered unfit, which were redeemed. I might, however, conclude that one may redeem in consequence of a transitory blemish. Hence, Scripture explicitly states of which they may not bring an offering unto the Lord, thus intimating that it refers to a sacrifice which is completely unfit for the altar, but excluding this case of a transitory blemish, which although unfit for sacrifice today is fit tomorrow. And if you prefer another solution, I may say, if this be a fact that a transitory defect is a legal blemish, then of what avail is the text lame and blind, which implies only permanent blemishes if it was slit, although there was not any loss of substance or rabbis taught a Slit may be as small as you please a defect a cut may be either through the agency of man or by nature does this imply that a slit has not the same ruling when brought about by nature rather stated thus a slit may be as small as you please and both a slit and a cut may be either through the agency of man or by nature and how large is a cut a not
Text says in all we infer that as in all is exclusively of metal so anything used must be of metal and it is stated in the following clause said R. L. Azerjudin the son of rabbis used to expound as follows the boring is only done through the earlap the sages however rule a Hebrew slave who is a priest must not have his ear bored because he becomes blemished now if you maintain that the boring was done through the earlap then a Hebrew slave who is a priest cannot become blemished hence we only bore through the top part of the ear said Rabhan of Bikatna this offers no difficulty here for the purpose of slaughtering the size of a lentil is required but there in the case of causing a disqualification even a needle can render the animal blemished for the altar what is Karshina said Arsharabia Indian Vetch Arashai inquired from Arhuna the great must the whole be of a size so that the Karshina may enter and come out with ease or as to contain the Karshina only with Difficulty he replied to him I have not heard the answer to this particular query but I have heard a solution of a similar query for we have learned the spinal column and a skull which have shrunk do not cause uncleanness and how great must be the shrinkage in the spinal column in order not to cause uncleanness Beth Shammai say two vertebrae whereas Beth Hillel say one vertebrae and as regards the skull Beth Shammai say the amount of the shrinkage must be equal to a burr and Beth Hillel say as much as is required to be taken away from a living person in order to prove fatal now are his das at discoursing and inquired you say as much as is required to be taken from a living person so as to prove fatal and how much would this be our talafa be said to him thus did Samuel say as much as a seller and it was stated our Safra said our talafa reported to our his ruling in the name of Samuel whereas Rab Samuel B. Judah says our talafa quoted to Rab his Reported by Samuel and the way to remember this is by the sentence our Samuel B. Judah reported a very said our his to him our talafa if so then you have made the views of Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel identical for we have learned in a light hole which was not made by the agency of man the size required is as large as a big fist such as the fist of Ben Badia said our Jose and this fist is as large as a big head of a man if the light hole however was made by the agency of man the sages. Fix the size to be as large as a hole made with the large carpenters or kept in the temple cell which is as large as an Italian Dupontium or as large as a Neuronian cell and it has Talmud, Mos Pecoro a size as large as a hole of a yoke he was silent said Arhista to him perhaps what we have learned refers to the burr and the removal of what stopped up the hole thereupon our Talafa said to him you should not say perhaps it certainly refers to the burr and the removal of what stopped up the hole and you can confidently accept this explanation as we accept the evidence of Hezekiah the father of Akish for it has been taught this which follows is the evidence given by Hezekiah the father of Akish before Rabban Gamaliel in Jabna which he reported in the name of Rabban Gamaliel the elder wherever an earthen vessel has no inside it is not regarded as having an independent back if then the inside becomes unclean the back becomes unclean and if the back becomes unclean the inside becomes unclean but did not the divine law teach that the uncleanness of an earthen vessel depends on the inside if it has an inside receiving uncleanness then the vessel becomes unclean but if it has no inside then it does not become unclean said our Isaac B. Abin this is what is meant wherever an earthen vessel has no inside in a corresponding case with a rinsing vessel it has no back which is treated independently if then its inside becomes unclean its back outside becomes unclean and if its back becomes unclean then its inside is unclean what need however is there to make it depend on an earthen vessel let him say as follows wherever in the case of a rinsing vessel there is no inside there is no back which is treated independently he informs us of this very thing that if it has an inside then it is like an earthen vessel as much as to say as in the case of an earthen vessel if the inside becomes unclean then the back becomes unclean and if the back becomes Unclean the inside does not become unclean so it is in the case of a rinsing vessel if the inside becomes unclean then the back becomes unclean and if the back becomes unclean the inside does not become unclean now we may readily grant this in the case of an earthen vessel the divine law having revealed explicitly in that connection that uncleanness depends on the inside receiving uncleanness but as regards a rinsing vessel did the divine law reveal explicitly that uncleanness depends on it. Inside receiving uncleanness if we were referring to a case of biblical uncleanness it would indeed be so we are dealing here however with unclean liquids which have come in contact with the rinsing vessel the resulting uncleanness being due to a rapid enactment for we have learned if the back outside of a vessel has been defiled by unclean liquids its back becomes unclean but its inside its edge its handle and its projectors remain clean if its inside however becomes unclean the whole vessel becomes unclean for according to the biblical law food cannot make a vessel unclean nor can unclean liquid make a vessel unclean and only the rabbis have declared uncleanness on account of the liquid of azab and azab the rabbis consequently declared it to have uncleanness of an earthen vessel but they did not declare it in this particular instance to be biblically unclean on its own account the rabbis differentiating in order that terima and holy objects might not be burnt on its account but if this be so where there is no inside let there also be a distinction made since where there is an inside the rabbis differentiated it will indeed be known that where there is no inside the uncleanness is a rabbinic enactment and that therefore terima must not be burnt in consequence of it but with regard to a rinsing vessel where there is no inside is it susceptible of becoming unclean according to the biblical law for we do not require in order that a vessel may become Unclean that it should resemble a sack that is to say as a sack is handled either fully or empty so anything in order to receive uncleanness must be in a condition to be handled either full or empty it refers to those articles which are fit to be used as seeds if this be so then why not also declare an earthen vessel unclean rabbinically madras is not employed with an earthen vessel for fear of breaking it our papa says the mission above states distinctly a large borer from which we can deduce that an ordinary borer is smaller than a cell of this would indeed hold good according to the view of our Meir, but according to the view of the rabbis what answer would you give for we have learned to what kind of borer did Beth Shammai refer to a small one belonging to doctors the sages said however they refer to the large carpenter's borer kept in the temple cell but is it satisfactory even according to the view of our Meir, would this not then be a case where the ruling of Beth Shammai would be easier and the ruling of Beth Hillel severe and as regards examples of this kind of ruling what we have learned we accept and what we have not learned in the Mishnah we do not accept said our nominee Neuronian cell is distinctly mentioned above a Neuronian cell is as large as a large borer but an ordinary cell is even smaller than an ordinary borer Mishnah one whose RIS eyelid is perforated nipped or slit or if it has a cataract or a tibolial hell is on snail shaped nahash snake shaped and a berry shaped growth on the IIS disqualified what does tibolial mean the white of the eye breaking through the ring and encroaching on the black but if the black breaks through the ring and invades the white it is not a disqualifying blemish because there are no disqualifying blemishes as regards the white of the eye Talmud Mosbek wrote Bigamara what is the meaning of the RIS our papa said the eyelid or if it has a cataract or a tibolial our rabbis taught a cataract which causes the eye to sink is a disqualifying blemish but if it is floating it is not a disqualifying blemish but has not the opposite been taught this offers no difficulty one statement refers to the black part of the eye and the other case to the white but surely blemishes in the white of the eye do not disqualify one statement then refers to a white spot and the other to a black spot for Rabbi Barhana said Arashai Abishah told me a black spot which causes the eye to sink is a disqualifying blemish but if it is floating it is not a disqualifying blemish a white spot if it causes the eye to sink is not a disqualifying blemish but if it is floating it is a disqualifying blemish and mnemonic for this is Barka Halazan Nahash and a growth in the eye a query was put forward does the mission mean that Halazan is the same thing as Nahash or does it mean Halazan or Nahash come and here for Rabbi Barhana said Aryohan and B. Eliezer told me a certain old man a priest Lived in our quarter whose name was Arsimian B. Jose B. Lacunia never had I passed in front of him once however I passed in front of him he said to me sit down my son sit this halazan is a permanent blemish in consequence of which the animal may be slaughtered and this is what the sages called Nahash and although the sages have said a man must not examine his own animals to discover their blemishes yet he is allowed to teach the rule to his pupils and the pupils are permitted to examine but surely it is not so for did not our Abba say that Arhuna reported in the name of Rab wherever a
How to test its permanency if it ate for a cure fresh fodder and dry fodder from a field sufficiently watered by rain or fresh fodder and dry fodder from a field requiring artificial irrigation IT is a permanent blemish if not cured if it ate dry fodder first and then fresh fodder IT is not a blemish unless it eats dry fodder after the fresh tomorrow what opinion does our mission represent it is that of our Judah for it has been taught a permanent aware war must remain for 40 days and water constantly dripping from the eye must remain so for 80 days this is a view of our mayor but our Judah says a permanent aware war must remain for 80 days and the following are cases of permanent aware war and how to test their permanency if it ate fresh fodder with dry fodder from a field sufficiently watered by rain but not fresh fodder and dry from a field requiring irrigation or if it ate dry fodder followed by fresh it is not a blemish unless it ate dry fodder. After fresh and this treatment must last for three months but have we not learned both kinds of fields if it ate fresh fodder and dry fodder from a field sufficiently watered by rain of if it ate fresh fodder and dry fodder from a field requiring irrigation there is a lacuna in the mission and it should read thus if it ate the fresh fodder and dry fodder from a field sufficiently watered by rain it is a blemish if it ate from a field requiring irrigation it is not a blemish. Even if it did not become cured and even in the case of a field watered by rain if it ate dry fodder and afterwards fresh it is not a blemish unless it ate dry fodder after fresh and this treatment must last for three months but surely this is not so has not our EDB have been reported in the name of our Isaac B. Ashian in Adar and Nissan it is given fresh fodder in Elul and Tishri dry fodder read rather as follows in Adar and a half of Nissan fresh fodder in Elul and half of Tishri. Dry the following query was put forward does the mission mean that the fresh fodder given to the firstling to eat for a cure must be in the period of fresh fodder and similarly the dry in the period of dry or does the mission mean that we give it to eat fresh fodder together with dry in the period of fresh fodder come and here for our EDB have been reported in the name of our Isaac B. Ashian in Adar and Nissan it is given fresh fodder and in Elul and Tishri dry it may be however. That this passage means that the dry produce of Elul and Tishri is given to the animal to eat in Adar and Nissan and how much of this do we give it to eat daily are Yohan and reported in the name of our Fine Hasbi the size of a dry fix Elul in the Palestinian colleges it was asked does the amount mentioned refer only to the animal's first meal Talmud, Mos or to every single meal if you say that the first meal is meant then the question arises has it to be given before the meal or after the meal the treatment before a meal certainly does the animal good like medicine but suppose it is given after the meal what then also do we give it the treatment before drinking or after drinking it certainly does it more good before drinking like barley but suppose it is given after drinking when it is given the treatment should it be tied or must it be unloosened it certainly does it more good when it is unloosened but suppose it is given when it is tied also do we Give it the treatment when it is by itself or together with another animal it certainly does it more good when it is together with another but suppose it is given when it is by itself further do we give it the treatment in the city or in the field it certainly does it more good in the field but suppose it is given in the city our Ashi inquired if you will say that it is preferable in a field what is the ruling as regards a garden adjacent to a field let all this stand undecided our Hanana. B. Antigona says etc. said Arnam and B. Isaac provided that the cure is administered at three intervals during the 80 days Phinehas the brother of Mar Samuel inquired of Samuel if the firstling ate this for a cure and did not get better is it considered a blemish retrospectively or is it considered a blemish only from then onwards what is the practical difference for deciding whether the law of sacrilege applies to redemption money if it is redeemed within the three months if you say. Therefore that it is a disqualifying blemish retrospectively then he commits sacrilege but if it counts as a blemish only from then onwards there is no sacrilege what is the ruling Samuel applied to our Phinehas the verse the lame take the premission if its nose is perforated nipped or slit or its upper lip perforated mutilated or slit these are disqualifying blemishes Gemara our rabbis have taught if the partitions of the nostrils are perforated right through from the outside this is a disqualifying blemish if the perforation is inside it is not considered a blemish if its upper lip which is perforated mutilated or slit set our papa the outer line edge of its lip is meant mission if the incisors are broken off or leveled to the gum or the molars are torn out completely these are disqualifying blemishes in the first link but our Hanan of B. Antigona said we do not examine behind the molars nor the molars themselves Gemara our rabbis have taught which are the molars inside. From the molars the molars themselves being considered like the inside our Joshua B. Kapuze says we are permitted to slaughter the firstling in consequence only of a defect in the incisors our Hanan B. Antigona says we pay no attention whatever to the molars what does it mean moreover is not the view of our Joshua B. Kapuze the same as that of the first tanner quoted above there is a lacuna in the very and it should read thus which are regarded as the inside teeth inside from the molars. And the molars themselves are all regarded as the inside teeth when does this rule apply when they were broken off or leveled to the gum but if they were torn away completely we may slaughter the firstling as a consequence our Joshua B. Kapuze says we must not slaughter the firstling except in consequence of the incisors becoming defective but if the molars were torn away completely we must not in consequence of this slaughter the firstling though they do disqualify our Hanan B. Antigonus, however, says we do not pay any attention whatever to the molar teeth and they do not even disqualify our ahid boy BM. I ask, does the law of the loss of a limb apply to what is inside an animal or does the law of the loss of a limb not apply to the inside of an animal? To what does this query refer if to a firstling does not scripture right lame or blind if to a sacrificial animal does not scripture right blind or broken? I am not inquiring as regards slaughtering or redeeming a sacrificial offering. My inquiry relates to disqualifying the animal from the altar. What is the ruling? The divine law says it shall be perfect to be accepted. This implies that if it is perfect, then it is valid as a sacrifice. But if there is anything missing even inside the animal, then it is not so. Or shall I say, while the text it shall be perfect to be accepted is inclusive, the text there shall be no blemishes therein informs us that as a blemish is from the outside, so anything must be. Missing from the outside in order to disqualify the animal come and here scripture says and the two kidneys implying that an animal with one kidney or with three kidneys is not offered up and another buried the taught scripture says he shall remove it which includes a sacrificial animal possessing one kidney only as fit for the altar now all the authorities concerned here hold that a living creature is not created with one kidney only and in the case here there was a definite loss of a kidney shall it therefore be said that this is the point at issue that one master holds that a deficiency inside the animal is considered a loss which can disqualify whereas the other master holds that a deficiency inside the animal is not considered a deficiency to disqualify said our high B. Joseph all the authorities agree that a living creature can be created with one kidney only and the deficiency inside is considered a deficiency and still there is no difficulty in one case we are dealing with an animal which was created with two kidneys and there was a loss of a kidney whereas in the other case it speaks of where it was created originally with one kidney only and therefore the animal was not disqualified from the altar but is not the case of one kidney stated to be similar to the case of three kidneys consequently as three kidneys were created originally so one kidney was created originally rather the point at issue here is whether a living creature can be created with one kidney only one master holds that a living creature can be created with one kidney only and therefore an animal with one kidney is permitted for the altar whereas the other holds that a living creature cannot be created with one kidney only are Yohanan however said all agree that a living creature cannot be created with one kidney only and that the deficiency of a limb inside an animal is considered a deficiency and still there is no difficulty as regards the two Buried this above in one case the loss took place before it was slaughtered and in the other after the slaughtering but even if the loss took place after the slaughtering only before the blood was received in a vessel is it permitted to offer a Talmud? Mosbek or OP has not our ZEIRA said in the name of Rab if one makes a slit in the ear of the bull and subsequently receives its blood it is disqualified as it is written in the scriptures and he shall take of the blood of the bullock. Implying the bullock as it had been before rather the explanation is that in one case the loss took place before the blood was received and in the other after the blood was received but is a defect in the sacrifice after the blood was received but before the sprinkling permitted has it not been taught scripture says
View of Arjuna, do you say in the stones but not in the member mural red? Then also in the stones, this is the view of Arjuna. Our Eliezer B. Jacob says all these blemishes must be in the member mar. Jose, however, says bruised or crushed can be in the stones also, whereas torn or cut in the member is a blemish, but in the stones is not a blemish. What does it mean? Does it not mean that the point at issue is that one master holds that a deficiency inside the animal is considered a deficiency? Whereas the other master holds that a deficiency inside the animal is not considered a deficiency, but do you consider this as reasonable? But in this case, does our Jose hold if he holds a deficiency inside an animal is considered a deficiency, then torn or cut should apply to all parts, and if he holds a deficiency inside an animal is not considered a deficiency, then even bruised or crushed should not apply to all parts. Rather, explain that the point at issue here is whether they are. Open blemishes are Judah holds bruised or crushed are blemishes because the stones or member shrink afterwards torn or cut are blemishes because they are hanging our LA's or B Jacob however holds bruised or crushed are not blemishes for originally when the animal is well they also sometimes shrink torn or cut are not blemishes for originally when the animal is well they sometimes also hang and our Jose holds bruised or crushed are blemishes for they are not in existence now torn or cut. However are not blemishes because they are still in existence mission other blemishes are if the bag is mutilated or the genitals of a female animal in the case of sacrificial offerings if the tail is mutilated from the bone but not from the joint or if the top end root of the tail divides the bone or if there is flesh between one joint and another in the tail to the amount of a finger's breadth Imara said our LA's or the mission particularly means a bag which is mutilated but not if it is removed the mutilation also only applies to the bag but not to the member itself it has been taught likewise if the bag was mutilated it is a blemish but not if it was removed the mutilation applies to the bag and not to the member said our Jose B. Hamishalam it happened at Enbol that a wolf took the whole bag of one and it returned to its normal condition if the tail is mutilated from the bone etc. A tanda taught the measurement of a finger's breadth mentioned by the sages is one fourth of any man's hand breadth i.e. a thumb's breadth what is the legal import of the said rabba it is in connection with the subject of purple blue for it has been taught how many threads does he put into the hole of the corner for fringes bet I say four whereas beth say three and how far must the threads of the show fringes hang down beyond the border bet I say four finger breadths whereas beth say three finger breadths and the three finger breadths Mentioned by Bethilel are each equal to one of the four finger breadths of any man's hand. Arhuna son of our Joshua says the measurement of a finger breadth here mentioned has reference to the two standard cubits as we have learned two standard cubits were deposited Talmud, Mosbeck wrote in the gate called the castle of Shushan one in the northeast corner and the other in the southeast corner that in the northeast corner was larger than the mosaic cubit by half a finger's breadth and that of the southeast corner was larger than its companion by half a finger's breadth consequently the latter was a finger's breadth larger than the mosaic cubit and why were there large and small standard cubits so that while the workmen used to undertake their tasks according to the smaller cubit of Moses but executed in accordance with the large in order that it should not come to commit sacrilege and what need was there for two standard cubits one standard cubit which was half a Finger's breadth larger than that of Moses was used for measuring gold and silver, and the other, which was a whole finger's breadth larger, was used for building the wall. Arnaman B. Isaac, or you may say Arhuna B. Nathan, said the exact measurement of a finger's breadth mentioned above has reference to what we have learned, or if there is flesh between one joint and another to the amount of a finger's breadth mission. If a firstling has no stones, or if it only has one stone, it is a blemish. R. Ishmael says if it has two bags, then it has two stones, but if it only has one bag, then it only has one stone. R. Akiba says the animal I has placed on its buttock and he rubs the bag. If a testicle is there inside the bag, it will eventually come out. It happened that one rubbed it and the stone did not come out, but when it was slaughtered, the stone was found attached to the loins, and R. Akiba permitted the animal while Arhuna and Binuri prohibited it. Kamar, if in a case where it only has one. Stone you say in the Mishnah that it is a blemish in a case where it has no stones at all is there any question something is omitted and it must read thus if the firstling has not the two stones in two bags only in one bag or if it has two bags containing only one stone it is a blemish our Ishmael says if it has two bags it certainly has two stones if however it has only one bag it is as if it has only one stone whereupon our Akiba says we do not say it certainly has but we place the animal on its buttock and rub the bag and if there is a stone inside then it comes out eventually it happened that he rubbed it and the stone did not come out etc it has been taught said our Jose it happened at Purim in the house of Menahem that he rubbed the bag and the stone did not come out when however it was slaughtered the stone was found attached to the loins and our Akiba permitted the animal to be eaten whereas our Yohan and Binuri prohibited it said our Akiba to our Yohan and Binuri how long will you waste the money of Israel said Aryohan and Binuri to our Akiba how long will you allow Israel to eat nibbles but do we not ritually cut it rather Aryohan and must have said trefez but it is not a case here of the prohibition of trefez then this is what he said to our Akiba how long will you allow Israel to eat consecrated sacrifices without the wall of Jerusalem Mishnah if a firstling has five feet or if it has only three feet or if its feet are close like that of an ass or a shahul or a casual these are blemishes what is meant by shahul an animal with a dislocated hip without the sinews being severed what is meant by casual an animal one of whose hips is higher than the other Gemara said Rabhuna this is meant only when the animal has one foot too few or one too many in front but if behind it is also trefez for every addition is considered equal to the entire absence of the respective limb or whose feet are close like that of an ass our Papa you should not say that they are round as well as not cloven, but even if their feet are only round like that of an ass, although they are not cloven, it is a blemish, a shahul or a casual, etc. Our rabbis taught what is meant by casual and what is meant by shahul. Shahul means an animal whose hip became dislocated without the severing of the sinews. Casual means an animal one of whose legs is fixed in the loin and the other over the loin. A tanda taught what is meant by a serra or a kalat. Serra means an animal one of whose legs is longer than the other kalat means one whose feet are uncloven like that of an ass or a horse. Mishnah, if the bone of the forefoot of a firstling or of its hind foot is broken, even though it is not noticeable, this is a blemish. These blemishes Isla enumerated in Jebna and the sages agreed with him. He also added another three cases of blemishes they thereupon said to him, We have only heard these already mentioned previously, one which has its eyeball round like that of a man or a mouth like that of a swine or one which has lost the greater part of the anterior of the tongue these are the additional blemishes a subsequent theft in ruled however each of these cases is a disqualifying blemish Kamara you say even though it was not noticeable but is it then a blemish said our papa the break is not noticeable in itself but it is noticeable owing to the animal's inability to carry out its normal functions these blemishes I'll record it etc does this mean to say that this is not a usual thing the following was cited in contradiction if a woman gives birth to a kind of animal beast or bird whether clean or unclean if it is a male she must observe the regulations relating to the birth of a male and if it is a female she must observe the regulations relating to the birth of a female if the sex however is not known then she must keep the regulations relating both to a male and a female these are the words of our mayor and Rabbi Barhan reported in the Name of our Yohan and what is the reason of our Meir since its eyeball is round like that of a man said our Joseph this offers no difficulty in one case the shape of the black of the eye is meant and in the other the slit in which the eye is seated is meant or has a mouth like that of a swan said our Papa you should not say that the mouth must be pointed besides the lip being parted but if the lip is parted even though the mouth is not pointed or one which had the greater part of the anterior of the tongue removed whose opinion does this represent it is that of our Judah for it has been taught in one which has the greater part of the tongue removed our Judah however says the greater part of the anterior of the tongue mission and it happened that the lower jaw of the firstling was larger than the upper jaw our Simeon B. Gamaliel asked the sages for a ruling and they said this is a blemish Gamara what has he taught that he cites an incident since we have learned in the previous mission or its mouth was like that of a swine and the rabbis differ from our Isla and it is with reference to this that we are now told that the
Blemish double ears with one system of cartilages constitute a blemish, but with two systems of cartilages are not a blemish. Argamaliel says the tail of a kid which was like that of a swine said our papa do not say that it must be round as well as very thin enough if it is round even though it is thick or if the tail does not possess three vertebrae etc. said Arhu not in a kid two vertebrae and the tail constitute a blemish but three are not a blemish but in a lamb three vertebrae constitute a blemish whereas four are not a blemish an objection was raised in a kid one vertebrae in the tail is a blemish whereas two are not a blemish but in a lamb two vertebrae are a blemish while three are not a blemish is not this a refutation of Arhu not how then does Arhu not explain his position our mission misled him he was under the impression that just as the first part of the mission referred to a kid similarly the second part referred to a kid it is not so however the first part refers to a Kid, whereas the second part refers to a lamb mission, our hand of the sun or Antigona says if a firstling has a yabalet in its eye or if a bone of its forefoot or hind leg is defective or if the bone of the mouth split or one eye is abnormally large and the other small or one ear abnormally large and the other small being visibly so and not merely an actual measurement, all these are disqualifying blemishes. Our Judah says if one stone is as large as two of the other, this is a blemish. The sages, however, did not concur with our Judah's ruling. Gamara does this mean to say that a yabalet is a disqualifying blemish against this? I quote the following We must not slaughter a firstling either in the temple or in the country in consequence of the following blemishes, one affected with Arab or yabalet, but do you consider it reasonable that yabalet should not be a real blemish? Is there not a text or yabalet in scripture? There is no contradiction in the one case the body is referred. To end in the other armish of the eye, but let us see now. Holy writ makes no distinction. What difference then does it make whether the blemish is in the eye or on the body? Rather say that there is no difficulty for the following reason. In one case it has a bone, and in the other it has no bone. The yabalet of the text refers to where it has a bone. The yabalet of our mission, however, refers to where it has no bone. Therefore, if it is in its eye, it is considered a disqualifying blemish. But on its body, it is not a disqualifying blemish. But if there is no bone on the body, does it really disqualify from the altar? Is it not then a mere word? For it has been taught. Our Eliezer says those with words of human beings are unfit for the altar. If beasts, they are fit for the altar. Rather explain as follows. In one case as well as in the other, it refers to the eye, and yet there is no difficulty. In one case it refers to the black part of the eye, and in the other it refers to the White but surely blemishes do not disqualify in the white part of the eye rather explain this as follows in one case as well as in the other we are dealing with the white part of the eye nevertheless said Rashley Hishit offers no difficulty in one case the yabalet has hair on it in the other it has no hair on it its one eye was abnormally large etc a tan taught large means as large as that of a calf and small means as small as that of a goose its one ear was abnormally large etc and the rabbis what is there limited was taught others say even if the second stone is only the size of a bean it is permitted mission if the tail of a firstborn calf does not reach the arkab it is a blemish the sages said the growth of all calves is in this manner as long as the animals grow the tails also extend below which arkab mentioned is meant our hand of the antigona says the arkab in the thigh talmud mosbekor agmar it has been taught the upper joint the inner part of it Knee not the lower joint knuckle and the corresponding part in a camel is easily recognized mission in consequence of these blemishes we may slaughter a firstborn animal and consecrated animals rendered unfit for the altar in consequence of these blemishes may be redeemed tomorrow what need is there to state this again has not the tana stated this in the previous part as follows in consequence of these blemishes we may slaughter the firstborn animal there was need for the tana to state this on account of the second clause in our mission consecrated animals rendered unfit for the altar in consequence of these blemishes may be redeemed but surely this too is obvious for if we may slaughter the animal in consequence of these blemishes is there any question about redeeming it rather the explanation is as follows since it stated in the previous mission I also added three cases of blemishes and the sages said to him we have only heard of these already mentioned the Tana then proceeds in subsequent Mishnahs to give the opinions of individual teachers therefore he states without mentioning names in reference to all these individual rulings in consequence of these blemishes we may slaughter a firstborn animal and consecrated animals rendered unfit for the altar in consequence of these blemishes may be redeemed Mishnah and in consequence of the following blemishes we must not slaughter a firstling either in the temple or without the temple white spots on the cornea and water dripping from the eye when not permanent features or molars which have been broken but not torn out completely or an animal affected with care of or husses is an old animal or a sick one an animal of offensive smell or appearance or an animal which with a transgression has been committed or an animal which is known to have killed a human being on the testimony of one witness or of the owner's a tumtum or other can be slaughtered neither in the temple nor without the temple our Ishmael however says there is no greater blemish than that of a hermaphrodite but the sages say it has not the law of the firstborn and may be shorn and worked with Gemara and is not Arab a blemish is it not written in the scriptures or Arab and also is not Hasid a blemish is it not written in the scriptures or Yalfet for it has been taught Arab is the same as Haris Yalfet is the same as the Egyptian Hasid and Reshlakish. Explained why is it called Yalfet because it continues to cling to the body to the day of death now there is no difficulty as regards different meanings of the Hasid of the text and the Hasid of our mission as here the text refers to Egyptian Hasid and the mission refers to a general Hasid but does not the interpretation of Arab in the text and Arab of the mission present a contradiction the different interpretations of Arab of the text and Arab of our Mission also offer no difficulty for in one case it refers to where it is moist and in the other to where it is dry the moist healing whereas the dry does not heal and therefore it is a blemish but does the moist Arab heal is it not written the Lord will smite thee with the boil of Egypt and with the Emirates and with the Garab scab and with Harry's and since it says and with Harry's a dry eruption and the Garab scab must be moist and the text continues whereof thou canst not be healed rather explain that there are three kinds of Garab the Garab of the text refers to a scab which is dry both inside and outside the Garab of our mission refers to where it is moist both inside and outside the Garab of Egypt is where it is dry inside and moist outside for our Joshua believe I said the boil which the Holy One blessed be he brought upon the Egyptians was moist outside and dry inside for it is written and it became a boil breaking forth with plains upon man and upon beast Old animal or a sick one or an animal of offensive smell or sight once is it proven our rabbis taught scripture says of the flock or of the sheep or of the goats intimating the exclusion of an old animal a sick one and one with an offensive smell or appearance and all the three restrictive texts are necessary for if the divine law had only written one restrictive text I would say it is to exclude the case of an old animal from temple sacrifice I might have thought that this was because it cannot recover its former strength but as regards a sick animal since it may recover its health I might have said that it is not so or if the divine law had only written one restrictive text I would say it is to exclude the case of a sick animal I might have thought that the reason was because it is not usual for an animal to be healed but in regard to an old animal since it is a usual thing I might have said it is not so and if the divine law had written two restrictive texts I might have thought that they only excluded the two cases where the animals are weak but as regards an animal with an offensive smell or sight but which is not physically weak I might have said that it was not so and even if a scriptural text had been written to exclude the case of an animal with an offensive smell or appearance I might have thought that the reason was because it was repulsive but in the case of the other animals which are not repulsive I might have said that it was not. So there is need therefore for the three restrictive texts or an animal with which a transgression had been committed etc. Once is it proven that we must not slaughter it in the temple our rabbis taught scripture says of the cattle intimating the exclusion of an animal which covered a woman and the animal that was covered by a man even of the herd intimates the exclusion of an animal which was worshipped as an idol of the flock intimates the exclusion of one designated for. Idolatry's purposes the text or of the flock intimates one which has gored a person to death but are not these liable to the penalty of death the reference here is to cases where there is only one witness or where the owners confess a tumtum or other maphrodite now we quite understand the tumtum being disqualified for the temple the reason being in case it is a female it is also disqualified without the temple
Scripture write Harris and then there would be no need to write Arab for I would argue if Harris in the fleshy part which is not repulsive is yet regarded as a blemish how much more so ought this to be the case with Arab which is repulsive the divine law therefore mentions Arab intimating that a depression in the fleshy part is not a blemish or Ishmael says there is no greater blemish than that of a hermaphrodite he does not hold the opinion of Abbe for we do not draw the analogy between Harris to broken he also does not hold the opinion of Rabba for it may be that a depression in the fleshy part is not a blemish where the Harris is not distinguishable but where it is distinguishable we apply the scriptural text ill blemish Talmud Mosbek or Oti Rabba inquired what is the reason of our Ishmael is he convinced that a hermaphrodite is a firstling male with a blemish or is it because he has a doubt as to its sex and he means to permit it to be slaughtered by using an argument of the form if you assume as follows if you assume that it is a firstling it should be permitted since it has a blemish what is the practical difference the difference is as regards liability to the punishment of lashes in consequence of shearing it or working with it or indeed as regards giving it to the priest come and here I reported in the name of our Ishmael a hermaphrodite is a firstling with a blemish deduced and from this that our Ishmael is convinced that it is a firstling but perhaps he permits it by using the argument if you assume though in reality he has a doubt concerning its sex come and here scripture says a male implying but not a female when it however repeats later the words a male which were not necessary it intimates the exclusion of a tum-tum and a hermaphrodite now whose opinion does this represent shall I say it is that of the first ten of our mission but since he holds that a hermaphrodite is a doubtful case as regards its sex is there any need for a scriptural text for the exclusion of a case of doubt again if it is the opinion of the last rabbis quoted in the Mishnah, but why not infer this from a single scriptural text for in connection with the law of the firstling there is only one scriptural text a male and yet we derive all therefrom why then is there need for the latter text a male plainly then the above passage represents the opinion of our Ishmael in the Mishnah. now this is quite intelligible if you say that our Ishmael was convinced that our hermaphrodite is a firstling for that reason there was need for the scriptural text to exclude the case of our hermaphrodite but if you say that our Ishmael had a doubt as to its sex is there any need for the exclusion of a case where there exists a doubt the above passage may still represent the view of the last rabbis and with reference to the law of the firstling also scripture has two texts the male and the male shall be the lords but the sages say it has not the law of the firstling etc. said our histah the difference of opinion relates only to a hermaphrodite but as regards a tum-tum all agree that there is a doubt as to its sex and therefore it is hallowed by reason of this uncertainty its shearing and slaughtering being therefore prohibited said Rabbah to him according to this the law of valuation should apply to a tum-tum Talmud. Mosbek or Oto why then is it taught scripture says of the male intimating the exclusion of a tum-tum and a hermaphrodite delete tum-tum from this very come and here you might think that the case of a tum-tum or that of a hermaphrodite is not included in the law of valuation relating to a man but is included in the law of valuation of a woman there are two texts therefore of the male and if it be a female intimating the exclusion of tum-tum and hermaphrodite delete tum-tum from this very come and here scripture says whether it be a male or a female intimating the exclusion of a Tum tum and other hermaphrodite delete tum tum from this very the come and here scripture says a male intimating but not a female when therefore scripture repeats below a male which there is no need to say it intimates the exclusion of a tum tum and other hermaphrodite delete tum tum from the very the come and here dubs worshipped as an idol or assigned to idolatrous purposes or a harlot's hire as an offering or the price obtaining by selling a harlot and brought as an offering or a tum tum or other hermaphrodite all these make garments unclean by contact with one's ease of because our Eliezer says tum tum and other hermaphrodite do not make the garments unclean of one who eats them for our Eliezer used to say wherever you find in the scriptures male or female you exclude the case of a tum tum or other hermaphrodite therefrom but in the case of a bird since scripture does not in that connection mention male or female you do not exclude the case of a tum tum or other hermaphrodite delete tum tum from this very the come and here our Eliezer said Trificulium of Oedus extracted by means of the Caesarean section Tumtum and Hermaphrodite cannot become consecrated nor can they cause consecration and Samuel explained this as follows they do not become consecrated in substitution nor do they cause consecration by effecting substitution delete Tumtum from this passage come and here our Eliezer says there are five instances where animals do not become consecrated nor cause consecration. And there are these Trificulium of Oedus extracted by means of the Caesarean section Tumtum and Hermaphrodite and were you to assume that here also the answer is delete Tumtum from here then our Eliezer has only brought four instances omit Tumtum and include the case of an orphaned animal may we say that Tanaim differ on this point for it was taught early reported in the name of our Ishmael Hermaphrodite is considered a firstling with a blemish whereas the sages say holiness cannot. Attached to it, our Simeon Bijuda reported in the name of our Simeon scripture says that the male and wherever the text says a male its object is to exclude tum-tum and hermaphrodite and should you say delete tum-tum from this passage then the view of our Simeon Bijuda would be identical with that of the rabbis must you not therefore say that the difference between them lies in the case of a tum-tum the first tana quoted above the sages maintaining that the ruling holiness cannot attach to it refers to a hermaphrodite whereas a tum-tum is considered a doubtful animal as regards sex and therefore it can be holy owing to this uncertainty thereupon comes our Simeon Talmud Mosbek wrote Bijuda and says a tum-tum is a creature apart and therefore it cannot be holy no all the authorities agree that there is no doubt that a tum-tum should be considered a creature apart the doubt is only whether it is to be regarded as a male or a female now if it urinates in the male part then all Agree that it is a male, the doubt arises, however, if it urinates in the female part, one teacher holds we fear lest his male sex may have changed into a female sex, whereas the other teacher holds we have no apprehension of such a thing. This agrees with what is told of Arlay, who gave a decision that a tum-tum animal which urinates in the female part is Hullan, and our Yohanan was thereupon astonished and exclaimed which authority is it which does not take into consideration the first tana quoted in our mission above and our Ishmael, but let our Yohanan also say who is the authority that does not take into consideration the view of the last rabbis in the mission for Arhista said the difference of opinion in the mission relates only to a hermaphrodite, but as regards a tum-tum all agree that it is a case of a doubtful animal as to sex our Yohanan does not hold Arhista's opinion, but if our Yohanan does not hold Arhista's opinion, why does he not explain that he lay follows the view of the last? Rabbis mentioned in the mission of this is precisely what Aryohanan means who is the authority that ignores the views of two teachers and follows the view of a single teacher and as regards Arlay whose view does he follow it is that of Reshlakish as follows the ruling that a tum-tum is a doubtful case as regards sex relates only to a human being since his male and female parts are in the same place but in the case of an animal if it urinates in the male part then it is a male whereas if it urinates in the female part it is a female to this Arashai demurred and why not apprehend lest its male sex may have changed to female said Abbe to him whose view will this question represent will it be Armayers who takes into consideration the minority both Abbe Abin and Arhanani Abbe Abin said you may even say that this question arises also on the view of the rabbis the disputants of Armayer for since its condition has changed there is a different animal the question can be met. In this way one authority the first tana quoted in the above very the whole since its condition has changed it is a different animal and therefore it possesses holiness whereas the other authority our simian holds we do not say with reference to an animal that since its condition has changed it is therefore a different animal may we say that the principle that the change of condition makes a different human being or animal is a matter in which tanaim differ for it has been taught if a tum-tum betrothed a woman his betrothal is valid if he was betrothed the betrothal is valid he submits to Eliza his wife must be released by Eliza and his brother may marry his wife and another very the taught the wife of a tum-tum must be released by Eliza but she must not marry her brother-in-law now it was assumed that all agree with our Akiba who said born saris does not submit to Eliza nor perform Levi marriage the point at issue will therefore be as follows according to the tana of the Beritha who holds that a tum-tum submits to Eliza that his wife must be released by Eliza and his brother
and it will be found that he is a female. Secondly, even if he is indeed a male, there is a possibility that he will be found to be a born Saris. What is the practical difference? Said Rabbi Talmud. Mosbek wrote the difference is with reference to disqualifying the woman where there are suitable brothers. There is also a difference as to whether halitha should be performed where there are no other brothers. C H A P T E R B I mission of these blemishes named above, whether permanent or transitory. Make human beings unfit to them must be added in the case of blemishes of human beings. Kill and lift and makabon, one whose head is angular and one whose occiput has the shape of sekafaz lintel. As regards humpback men, Arjuna considers them fit, whereas the sages consider them unfit. A bald-headed person is unfit for the priesthood. Bald-headed in the legal sense, I see who has not a line of hair from ear to ear. If however he has, then he is fit. Tomorrow, but why do these blemishes make a human being unfit? And is there not the case of Yagaleth, which is not written in the scriptures in connection with the blemishes of a human being? And moreover, Doc Antibalil mentioned above as blemishes in regard to a firstling are not mentioned in the law in connection with the blemishes of an animal. We infer one from the other, for it was taught in connection with a human being. Yagaleth is not stated as a blemish, and in connection with an animal, Doc Antibalil are not stated as blemishes. Whence do we infer that we apply the expressions used in connection with one to the other and vice versa? The text states Garab a dry scab in connection with a human being and repeats Garab in connection with an animal. Also Yalfeth like it is stated in connection with a human being and Yalfeth is repeated in connection with an animal in order to conclude his rasha Now these expressions are free for interpretation for if they were not free for interpretation it can be objected as follows. We cannot infer the blemishes in connection with a human being from those of an animal for in the latter case the animal itself is offered on the altar again. We cannot infer blemishes in connection with an animal from those in connection with a human being as the latter has many commands to carry out. Surely it is so these expressions are indeed free for interpretation for the divine law should say that Yalfeth is a blemish and there would be no need to state. Garab, as I would have argued as follows, if Yalfeth, which is not repulsive, is yet considered a disqualifying blemish, how much more so is this the case with reference to Garab, which is repulsive? What need is there therefore for the divine law to write Garab, Garab, they must consequently be free for interpretation, and why does not the divine law state all the blemishes in one connection, and Garab and Yalfeth both here in connection with a human being and there in connection with an animal, and then we would have inferred one section of blemishes from the other section in connection with which section of blemishes should the divine law have stated all the blemishes if it had stated them in connection with a human being? I might have thought that whatever blemish disqualifies a human being also disqualifies an animal, closed hoops and defective teeth, however, which do not apply to a human being do not make the animal unfit either, and if the divine law had stated all. The blemishes in connection with an animal I might have thought that whatever makes an animal unfit makes a human being unfit but the blemishes of a defective eyebrow or flat nose which do not apply to an animal do not make a human being unfit either and why does not the divine law state all the appropriate blemishes in connection with one section of blemishes and those blemishes which do not apply to a human being let the divine law mention in connection with the blemishes of an animal and let those blemishes which do not apply to an animal be stated in connection with human blemishes together with Garab and Yalfeth written both here among the blemishes of a human being and there among the blemishes of an animal so that one may be inferred from the other rather the explanation is as a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught wherever a section of the law is taught and afterwards repeated the section is repeated for the Sake of a new point added said Rabba what need is there for the divine law to state blemishes in connection with a human being a priest consecrated sacrifices and a firstborn animal it was necessary to state all these sections of blemishes for if the divine law had only stated the section of blemishes in connection with a human being we might have thought that the reason was because he carries out many commands we cannot again infer the blemishes of a human being from those of a first born animal as we might have thought that the reason in the latter case was because the animal itself was offered up on the altar you cannot either infer the blemishes of consecrated animals from those of a firstborn animal as we might have thought that the reason in the latter case was because it was consecrated from the womb nor can you infer the blemishes of a human being from those of consecrated animals as we might have thought that the reason in the case of the latter was that they themselves are sacrificed neither can you infer the blemishes of a firstborn animal from those of consecrated animals for we might have thought that the reason in the case of the latter was because the holiness of a consecrated animal has a wider scope we cannot therefore infer one section of blemishes from another single section of blemishes why not however infer one section of blemishes from the other two which section should the divine law have omitted should the divine law have omitted the section relating to blemishes of the firstborn animal leaving it to be inferred from the other two sections of blemishes we might then have thought that the other two sections are different seeing that their holiness has a wider scope and that they also apply to plain non-firstborn should the divine law have omitted the section of blemishes relating to consecrated animals leaving me to infer it from the other two sections we might then have thought that the reason in the latter case was because they are holy on their own accord should the divine law have omitted the section of blemishes relating to a human being which we would then have inferred from the other two sections I might have thought that the reason in the latter case was because they themselves are sacrificed on the altar hence it was necessary to state the three sections of blemishes to these must be added in connection with blemishes of human beings whence is this proven said are Yohanan. Scripture says no man of the seed of Aaron the priest that hath a blemish intimating that a man who is like the seed of Aaron is rendered unfit by a blemish Talmud. Mosbek wrote what is the practical difference between a priest with a blemish and one who is not like the seed of Aaron the difference is whether the temple service is profaned if it is an actual blemish the service is profaned for it is written because he hath a blemish that he profaned not if however it is a case of not. Being like the seed of Aaron, then the temple service is not profaned. What is also the difference between the case of one who is not like the seed of Aaron and of a priest who is unfit for appearance sake? The difference is as regards the transgression of a positive precept. Kilin is one whose head has the shape of a basket. Kalilin is one whose head resembles a slice of turnip. Lipta Atana taught where the neck stands in the center of the head. Makabon is one whose head resembles a mallet. Makabon, one whose head is angular, means in the front of the head. Sekafaz means the hinder part of the head. Atana taught one whose head is angular, means in the front, whereas Sekafaz means to the hinder part. As people say, a piece is taken off. Atana taught one whose neck is shakut or shamat shakut is one whose neck is sunk and shamat is one whose neck is long and thin as to humpback men are etc. If he has a hump in which there is a bone, all the authorities concerned agree. That he is unfit for priestly service. The dispute arises with a hump in which there is no bone. One master holds this is a case where he is not like the seed of Aaron, and the other master Arjuna holds it is merely an elevation of the flesh swelling. A bald headed person is unfit, said Rabba. This is meant only where he has not a line of hair from ear to ear in the hinder part, but he has it in the front, but where he has this both in the hinder and in the front parts, he is fit for temple service. And this is certainly the case where he has a line of hair in the hinder part and not in the front part. Some there are who refer Rabba's explanation to the second clause. If he has, then he is fit, said Rabba. This is meant only where he has a line of hair in the hinder part, but not in the front part, but where he has this both in the hinder and front parts, he is unfit. And this is certainly the case where he has a line of hair in the front part and not in the hinder part, and this is also. Certainly the case where he has no line of hair at all that he is unfit said Aryohan and bald heads dwarfs and the blearite are unfit for the priesthood because they are not like the seed of Aaron but have we not already learned both the cases of bald heads and dwarfs in the mission Aryohan needs to teach us the case of the blearite not mentioned in the mission and even with regard to the rest you might have thought that their unfitness was for appearance sake but does not the tana already state explicitly wherever it is a case for appearance sake for it says if his eyelids are hairless he is unfit for appearance sake you might however have assumed that he states one case but the same applies to the rest but does not the tana wher ever there is an example of unfitness for appearance sake repeat this as in the following one whose teeth were removed is unfit for the priesthood for appearance sake rather the explanation is that the purpose of Aryohan is to exclude what has been taught bald heads dwar
can paint both of his eyes with one movement one whose two eyes are above or whose two eyes are below a person whose one eye sees above and another below one who takes in the room and the ceiling in one glance one who covers his eyes from the sun a's and desire and all these are unfit for the priesthood one whose eyelids have fallen off is unfit for the priesthood for appearance sake tomorrow our rabbis taught harem is one whose nose is sunk above between the eyes whence do we know that one whose nose is turned up snub-nosed or obstructed or whose nose overhangs his lips is unfit for the priesthood. There is a scriptural text or a harem. Our Jose says harem only refers to one who paints both his eyes with one movement. The rabbi said to him, You have exaggerated Talmud, Mos Bekorota, for although he cannot paint both his eyes with one movement, he is still a harem, one whose two eyes are above or whose two eyes are below. What does the Mishnah mean by the expression? Both eyes above and both eyes below. Shall I say both eyes above mean that they continuously see above the expression both eyes below that they see below and one eye above and one eye below means that one eye sees below and the other above and the latter case would be identical with the case one who takes in the room and the ceiling in one glance mentioned later in the Mishnah. Rather, this is the explanation. The expression both eyes above means that they stand above the expression both. Eyes below means that they stand below the expression one eye above and one eye below means that one eye stands above and one eye below and even where the eyes are in their normal places there is a case of unfitness where one takes in the room and the ceiling in one glance once do we prove this our rabbis taught scripture says in his eye every defect in connection with the eye hence the sages say one who has both eyes below or both eyes above or one eye above and one eye below or one who takes in the room and the ceiling in one glance or one who speaks with his friend and another says he is looking at me all these defects render a priest unfit for the priesthood our rabbis taught the text blind means blind in both eyes or in one eye once do we derive the case of white spots on the cornea and eyes dripping with water both defects being of a permanent character there is a scriptural text a blind man said rabba what need is there for the divine law to write blind man Dr. Bilal in his eye it is necessary to state all these cases for if the divine law had only said blind we might have thought that the reason was because the eyes were not there but in the cases of white spots on the cornea and of dripping eyes both defects being of a permanent character where the eyes are there this is not so therefore scripture says blind man and if the divine law had said man we might have thought that the reason was because the eyes cannot see at all although they are there but where however there was only defective vision it is not so therefore the divine law says doc and if the divine law had said only doc we might have thought that the reason was because there was defective vision but where there was confusion of the colors in the eye it is not so therefore the divine law says Bilal and if the divine law had only said Tabal we might have thought that the reason was because of the confusion of the colors in the eye but where it was a case of a different location of the eyes it is not so therefore the divine law says in his eye said Rabbi consequently every case of blindness we derive from the text man every case of defective vision we derive from the text doc every case of confusion of colors in the eye we derive from the text te below and every case of a different location in the two eyes we derive from the text in his eye one who covers his eyes from the sun are Joseph taught one who hates the sun of blinkered. Zagnar who now showed by gestures one eye like ours and the other like theirs Rab Judah was annoyed an objection was raised Shukbona is one whose eyebrows overshadow his eyes Zagn is one who has one black and one white eyebrow a tanda taught any pair of eyes which is not properly matched is called Zagn's iron it has been taught one whose eyes are bleared and granulated weeping dripping and running a tanda taught to Erlefine and Tamir are blemishes Zuer is one whose eyes are unsteady. Mazawar Lafine is one having thick and connected eyebrows and Tamir is one whose eyebrows are done and is the latter defect reckoned among disqualifying blemishes have we not learned one whose eyelids are hairless is unfit for the priesthood for appearance sake this offers no difficulty in the one case the root remains in the other it does not remain Mishnah one whose eyes are as large as a calf's or as small as those of a goose or whose body is unduly large for his limbs unduly small for his limbs or whose nose is unduly large for his limbs or whose nose is unduly small for his limbs so mem and zomi what is zomi one whose oracles are very small what is zomem one whose oracles resemble a sponge if the upper lip overlaps the lower or the lower lip overlaps the upper this is a blemish one whose teeth have fallen out is unfit for the priesthood for appearance sake Amara said Rab Moses our teacher was ten cubits in high for it is said and he spread abroad the tent. Over the tabernacle now who spread it Moses our teacher and scripture says ten cubits shall be the length of the board said Arshai my behai to rab if so you have made out that Moses was a blemished person for we have learned one whose body is unduly large for his limbs or unduly small for his limbs he replied to him are you the Shai my fame for your wisdom I refer to the cubit of the tabernacle one whose nose was unduly large etc a tanda taught as the width of a small finger zomem and zomi. A tanda taught in addition to the blemishes mentioned Ksimia is also a blemish the rabbis did not know what Ksimia was they heard an Arab trader call out who wanted Ksimia and it was found to be a shaggy goat said are his a goat which has no horns and a you which has horns are fit for the altar so indeed it has been taught there are some defects in the first ling which appear like blemishes but are not actually blemishes and in consequence of which we slaughter the animal in the temple but not without the temple and there the following a goat which has no horns and a new which has horns of simia zomium and zomi are his star reported in the name of abami if its horns together with the bony inside of the horns have been removed the animal is unfit for the altar but may not be redeemed by reason of it if its hooves together with the bony inside of the hooves have been removed the animal is unfit and may be redeemed by reason of it an objection was raised if the horns and hooves together with their bony insides were removed the animal is unfit and may be redeemed by reason of it this presence no difficulty in the one case the horns were uprooted and in the other the horns were leveled but if the horns were only leveled is it even unfit for the altar the following was cited in contradiction if a red heifer has horns and hooves which are black let him lop off the black top of the horns and hooves explain this as follows the lopping off is from the top Part of their bony inside Talmud, Mos Bekorot B Mishnah if one has large breasts like those of a woman one whose belly is swollen one whose navel projects owing to illness one who is subject to epileptic spells even at infrequent intervals one who is subject to asthmatic spells Ami Ushban and Bal Jibar all these are unfit for the priesthood Gemara Ar Abu Bar Hai B Ab reported in the name of Ar Yohan and it is permitted to urinate in public whereas it is not permitted to drink water in public so indeed it has been taught it is permitted to urinate in public whereas it is not permitted to drink water in public and it once happened that someone wanted to urinate and forewent it and it was found that his belly was swollen Samuel needed to urinate on a Sabbath preceding a festival he spread his cloak as a screen between his audience and himself he came before his father and reported this to him he the latter then said to him I will give you four hundred zoos to Retract this ruling for you were able to spread a cloak but one who is not able to do so shall he delay and expose himself to the danger. Our son of Arashi was walking on the junction of a landing bridge when he needed to ease himself. They said to him your mother-in-law comes he replied to them even in her ear but may I not assume that the swelling of his belly arose from swallowing a leech. We are dealing here in a case when he discharged urine laxly our rabbis taught two channels are in. The membrane of a human being one of which discharges urine and the other semen and the distance between them is no more than the peel of garlic if then a person needs to ease himself and one channel interferes with the other he is found to be impotent said Rush Lakish what is the interpretation of the scriptural text there shall not be male and female barren among you or among your cattle it is as follows when will there not be a male barren among you if you put yourself on a level with it. Animal said, Our Joshua be Levi. The words there shall not be male barren mean that your house shall not be deprived of scholars. The words or female barren mean that your prayers shall not be fruitless before the Lord. And when will this be the case if you place yourself on a level with an animal said, Our Papa, one must not urinate in an earthen tub nor in a hard spot. For Rab said, The drains of Babylon carry water to an etam said, Of a woman must not stand actually before a child and urinate if she urinates sideways. However, there is no objection. We have learned in the Beritha Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says, A suppressed discharge produces dropsy to force back the urine in the urinary duct produces jaundice. Our Katna
Gemara R. Ishmael, who differs from the opinion of the first Tana in the Mishnah, found this opinion difficult to accept, for if so, it ought to read Hasar Ashek, therefore he teaches if he has his testicles crushed, Ar Akiba also, who in turn differs from R. Ishmael, found this opinion difficult to accept, for if so, it ought to read Memor Ashek, he therefore teaches if one has wind in his testicles, Ar Hanan also, who differs from the opinion of Ar Akiba, found this opinion difficult to accept. For if so, it ought to read Ruhashek, he therefore teaches if he has a black complexion, for he maintains we may take away one letter from one word of the text and add to another and thus interpret the law, but then is this not according to Arhan in the case of one who is like an Ethiopian Arhan of B. Antigonus does not teach the case of one abnormally dark complexion mission if one knocks his ankles against each other in walking or rubs his legs against each other. Talmud, Moss. Bekorot A. A. B. A. L. Hapine and Nickel. All these defects render a priest unfit. What is a Nickel? One whose legs do not touch each other when he puts his feet together bandy legged if he has a lump projecting from his thumb or if his heel projects behind or if his feet are wide like those of a goose or if his fingers lie one above the other or if they are grown together up to the root of the middle joint he is fit for the priesthood if below the root if he cuts it he is also fit if he has an additional finger and he cut it off if there was a bone in it he is unfit but if not he is fit if he has additional fingers and additional toes on each hand and foot six fingers and six toes making altogether twenty four fingers and toes are Judah declares such a priest fit for the priesthood whereas the sages declare him unfit if one has equal strength in both hands rabbi declares him unfit whereas the sages declare him fit Tomorrow, our rabbi's taught scripture says broken footed eye have you mentioned only the case of broken footed as making a priest unfit for the priesthood once do we deduce the inclusion of one who knocks his ankles against each other or one who is bandy or one who is club footed the text states or broken footed attended top bal hapikin and shunner are high bab reported in the name of our yohanan bal hapikin is one who has many calves and shunner is one without calves if he has a lump projecting from the thumb or if his heel projects Behind said our Eliezer this latter defect means a leg coming out in the middle of the foot or if his feet were as wide as those of a goose said our Papa you should not say that the feet must be thin as well as not separated even if they are only thin although separated they make a priest unfit for the priesthood or if his fingers lie one above the other or are grown together our rabbis taught scripture says broken handed I have here mentioned only the case of broken handed as making a priest unfit once do we deduce that if his fingers lie one above the other or are grown together above the root and he cut them that he is unfit but did you not say in the mission that in the latter instance he is fit rather read he did not cut them once then do we derive these cases the text states or broken handed if he has an additional finger and he cut it off if there was a bone in it he is unfit but if not he is fit Rabbi Barhan reported in the name of our Yohan and provided the Additional finger is counted with the others. Our rabbis taught an additional finger if it has a bone in it, even without a nail, makes a person unclean by contact, and by carrying it, it also causes tent uncleanness and is counted in the number of 125 limbs. Rabbi Barhan reported in the name of our Yohan and provided the additional finger is counted with the others. Said our Hisda, the following ruling was taught by our great master Rab, may the Lord be his support. An additional finger, if there is a bone in it, even without a nail, makes a person unclean by contact, and by carrying it, but it does not cause tent uncleanness. Said Rabbi Barhan provided the additional finger is not counted with the others. Said Arhan, they have put their teaching on the level with prophecy, for in either case, the ruling just quoted is difficult to understand. If the additional finger is considered a limb legally, then it should even cause tent uncleanness, and if it is not a Limb legally then it should not even make a person unclean by contact and by carrying it said Arhu Nabi in the name of Araha Bik the rabbis applied here the rule of a bone which is the size of a barley corn our papa says we declare him unclean in the case where the additional finger was not counted with the others on account of the case where the additional finger is counted with the others but if this be so then in the case where the additional finger is not counted with the others it should also cause tent uncleanness the rabbis made a distinction in order that terima and consecrated objects might not be burnt unnecessarily on account of it we have learned elsewhere the greater portion of a corpse as measured by size of limbs and the larger number of joints and limbs even though there is not among them one quarter of a calf of bones convey tent uncleanness our rabbis taught what is the greater part of a corpse two legs and a thigh since this is the greater part of it Height of a tall person, what is the larger number of joints and limbs? 125 limbs said Rabbanit Rabba, is it the object of the Tana to teach us calculation? He replied to him, he informs us of the following as it was taught if a person is defective in the number of joints having only 200 or if one has additional limbs having 281, all these joints are counted in the number of 125, what is the reason? Follow the majority. A people who have only 248 joints and limbs are Judah related in the name of Samuel. The disciples of Ar Ishmael once dissected the body of a prostitute who had been condemned to be burnt by the king. They examined and found 252 joints and limbs. They came and inquired of Ar Ishmael how many joints has a human body. He replied to them 248. Thereupon they said to him, but we have examined and found 252. He Replied to them, perhaps you made the postmortem examination on a woman in whose case scripture adds two hinges in her sexual organ and two doors of the woman was taught. Our Eliezer said, as a house has hinges, so a woman's body has hinges in her sexual organ. As it is written in the scriptures, she bowed herself and brought forth for her pains. Sir came suddenly upon her. Our Joshua says, as a house has doors, so a woman's womb has doors. As it is said in the scriptures, because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb. Our Akiva says, as a house has a key, so a woman has a key. The womb, as it is written in the scriptures, and opened her womb. According to the opinion of our Akiva, is there not a difficulty in connection with what our Ishmael's disciples discovered? It may be that since it is small, it was dissolved in the course of dissecting said rab, and all these do not cause tent uncleanness. For it is said in the scriptures, this is a law when a man dieth in a tent, implying a thing which. Is common to all human beings causes tent uncleanness said Abay to him and has not a man also some of these additional limbs does not scripture say pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth these are hinges of flesh but does not scripture say O oh my lord by reason of the vision my pains are have come upon me here again the verse refers to hinges of flesh it also stands to reason for if you will not say so to whom then will you apply the accepted statement that there exists 248 limbs in the human body for it can apply neither to a man nor to a woman Talmud Mosbek or OP if he has additional fingers and additional toes on his hands and feet etc said our Isaac and both derive their views from the interpretation of the same verse and there was yet a battle in Gath where there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes four and twenty and number one master holds that Scripture means to disparage him while the other master Arjuna holds that scripture means to praise him said Rabbi why does scripture say 6 6 and 24 in number it was necessary to state all these numbers for if the divine law had only said 6 fingers and 6 toes I might have thought that the one word 6 referred to one hand and the other 6 referred to one leg therefore the divine law says 24 and if the divine law had said only 24 I might have thought that it meant 5 fingers on one hand and 7 fingers on the other the same applying to the feet therefore the divine law says 6 6 in number teaching us that the case here is one where the additional fingers are counted with the others it has been taught Arjuna says a man once came before our Tarfan with additional fingers and toes 6 on each making altogether 24 he said to him may the like of you increase in Israel said our Jose to him do you bring a proof from this incident this is really what our Tarfan said to him may through people like you bastards and Nathanim diminish in Israel if one has equal strength in both hands our rabbis taught if one is left-handed or left-legged rabbi declares him unfit for the priesthood whereas the sages declare him fit one master holds that it is due to an unusual weakness which has befallen the right hand and the other master holds that it is due to unusual strength which has accrued to the left-hand mission if one is like an Ethiopian age here a lapkin aka or a deaf mute and imbecile intoxicated or afflicted with plague marks which are clean these defects disqualify in human beings but not in animals our Simeon B. Gamaliel
Woman lest their offspring be like a masked male dwarf should not marry a female dwarf lest their offspring be a dwarf of the smallest size a man abnormally white complexion should not marry an equally white complexion woman lest their offspring be excessively white complexion a very dark complexion man should not marry an equally very dark complexion woman lest their offspring may be pitch black a deaf mute person an imbecile an intoxicated person but does not an intoxicated priest Profane the temple service should not this defect then be mentioned in connection with the disqualifying blemishes of a priest. The mission refers to other things from which one can become intoxicated and this will not be in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Judah for it was taught a priest who ate preserved figs from Gila and drank milk and fermented honey if he entered the temple incurs liability to excision mission of the following are fit in the case of human beings but unfit in the case of animals a father with its son a trophy an animal extracted by means of the caesarean section a priest who contracts an illegal marriage is unfit for the priesthood until he vows not to derive any benefit from the woman also one who makes himself unclean through contact with the dead is unfit until he undertakes that he will no longer make himself unclean through the dead tomorrow the following are fit in a human being etc what does the mission mean by the expression a father with its Son shall I say that it refers to Aaron and his son to which the corresponding case in an animal would be a he goat and its young but does this law apply in such circumstances has it not been taught the law prohibiting the killing of an animal and its young on the same day applies only to females and their young but not to males and their young rather the mission refers to a she goat and its young would not then a parallel case in human beings be a priestess and her son but is a priestess. Suitable for temple service one may still say that the mission refers to Aaron and his son and that the corresponding case here is a he goat and its young for it was explained in the West in the name of our Jose B. Avin as follows this proves that Hananiah taught this mission for we have learned in the very that the law prohibiting the killing of an animal and its young on the same day refers only to females and their young but not to males and their young but Hananiah says it applies to males and they're young as well as to females, a priest who contracts an illegal marriage, etc. A tanned taught he vows performs the temple services even before divorce and then leaves the temple service to divorce her. But why do we not fear lest he may go to a sage and obtain release from his vow? He holds the opinion a vow must be specified in detail before it can be invalidated. This is no difficulty according to him who says that a vow is required to be specified before it can be invalidated. But according to him who says that there is no need to specify in detail a vow before it can be invalidated, what answer would you give? We make him interdict himself by vow in public. This is no difficulty according to him who holds that an interdiction by vow imposed on a person in public cannot be invalidated. But according to him who holds that an interdiction by vow imposed on a person in public can be invalidated, what answer would you give? We impose an interdiction by vow Talmud, Moss. Beck wrote on him and make it dependent on the wishes of the public said Amimar the law is as follows even according to him who holds that an interdict by vow imposed on a person in public can be invalidated a vow made dependent on the wishes of the public cannot be invalidated but this is only the case with a vow made for a secular purpose whereas if made for a religious purpose it can be invalidated a case in point being that of a teacher whom Araha prohibited by vow from teaching any longer because he maltreated the children but whom Rabbin reinstated as there was not to be found one who taught so efficiently and one who makes himself unclean through the dead etc what is the difference between the case here where merely an undertaking suffices and there where a priest contracts an illegal marriage that we impose a votary prohibition on him there in the latter case his passion overpowers him chapter 8 mission there is one who is counted as a firstborn with respect to Inheritance but not with respect to redemption from a priest, a firstborn with respect to redemption from a priest but not a firstborn with respect to inheritance, a firstborn with respect both to inheritance and to redemption from a priest and as a firstborn in respect neither to inheritance nor redemption from a priest which is a firstborn in respect of inheritance but not of redemption from a priest one which follows an untimely birth whose head came forth alive or one born in the ninth month whose head came forth dead or when a woman discharges something like an animal beast or bird these are the words of our mayor but the sages say it is not considered an opening of the womb until the discharge has the form of a human being if a woman discharges a sandal like photos or a placenta or a photos having an articulated shape or if an embryo came out by pieces of infant which follows after them is a firstborn with respect to inheritance but not a firstborn to Redemption from a priest if one who never had children previously married a woman who had already given birth even if she had given birth when she was a bond woman but is free now or had born a child when she was a heathen but has since become a proselyte if after coming to the Israelite she bears to him the infant is also considered a firstborn with respect to inheritance but not a firstborn to redemption from a priest our Jose the Galilean says however the infant is a firstborn with respect to inheritance and also one who must be redeemed from a priest because it is said in the scriptures open at the womb among the children of Israel intimating until the opening of the womb is of the children of Israel if one had children already and married a woman who had never given birth previously or if she became a proselyte when pregnant or if she was freed when pregnant and she gave birth if there was some confusion between her and a priestess between her and a Levite's daughter between her and a woman who had already given birth and likewise if a woman who did not wait three months after her husband's death married and gave birth and it is not known if the infant was born in the ninth month since the death of the first husband or in the seventh month since she married the second it is a firstborn to redemption from a priest but not a firstborn with respect to inheritance Talmud. Mosbeck wrote Gemara said Samuel the putting forth of it. Head of an untimely birth does not release the offspring which follows from redemption from a priest what is the reason scripture says all in whose nostrils was the breath of life intimating that wherever there is the breath of life in the nostrils the head is of importance exempting the successor from redemption but otherwise the head is not considered of importance we have learned one who follows an untimely birth whose head came forth alive or one born in the ninth month whose head came forth dead at all events the Mishnah says whose head whose head means its greater part why then not say its greater part by rights the tana of our Mishnah should have stated its greater part but as he had to state in the second clause or one born in the ninth month whose head came forth dead and he wishes to argue that the reason is because its head was dead but that if its head was alive the one who follows is not even a firstborn with the privileges of inheritance he therefore also states in the first clause whose head now what then does the Mishnah inform us that since he put forth his head it is considered a birth but have we not learned this already if the embryo put forth its head although he withdrew it again it is considered a birth and should you reply that the tana teaches us this ruling separately both for the case of an animal and for that of a human being because we do not infer the case of a human being from that of an animal as the latter has no for part of female genitals, and again, we do not infer the case of an animal from that of a human being as the latter's full face is important. Have we not learned this too in a mission? If an infant came forth in the natural way, it is not considered a birth till the greater part of its head comes forth. And what is the greater part of its head when its forehead comes forth? Shall we then say that the CONFU Samuel it is indeed a refutation set? Our Simeon Belikish, the emergence of forehead is regarded as birth in all cases except in that of inheritance. What is the reason? But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, says the divine law. But our Yohanan says, even as regards inheritance, what does in all cases imply? It implies what our rabbis have taught as follows in the case of a proselyte woman. If the forehead of her infant came forth from the womb when she was a heathen and she subsequently became a proselyte, we do not subject her to periods of impurity and purity, and she does not bring. The offering for confinement and objection was raised. Scripture says, but he shall acknowledge this intimates the recognition of the face and what is a recognizable face. The full face with the nose red unto the nose come and your evidence may not be given in identification of a corpse save by proof afforded by the face with the nose red unto the nose come and your no evidence may be given by identification of the forehead without the face or the face without the forehead. It must be by both together with the nose and a base or as some say are kahana where is the scriptural authority for the scripture says the show of their countenance doth witness against them. It is different with regard to testimony on behalf of a woman as the rabbis made the law stringent in her case but have the rabbis indeed made it stringent have we not learned if they were generally presumed established to permit a woman to remarry on the evidence of a witness testifying to what he heard from an eyewitness or from a woman from a slave or a bond woman the rabbis were only len
A prose like Aryohanan says he has already fulfilled the command of propagation, whereas Arsimian Belagish says he has not fulfilled the command. Aryohanan says he has fulfilled the command since it is written, He God hath created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited, whereas Arsimian Belagish says he has not fulfilled the command of propagation for a stranger who became a prose is like a newly born child, and it is necessary to state both these instances where Aryohanan and Arsimian differ. For if the difference of opinion between them had been stated only in the first case, we might have said that only there does Arsimian Belagish hold that he can have a firstborn as regards inheritance because heathens are not legal heirs, but here we might have thought that he agrees with Aryohanan that we apply he hath created it not in vain, he formed it to inhabit it, for he has helped to people the earth by the children he had previously, and if the difference of opinion between them had been stated only in the second case we might have said that only in that case does Aryohanan hold this opinion but with reference to the first case of inheritance we might have thought that he agreed with Arsimian Belagish it was therefore necessary to mention that they differ in both instances we have learned if one who never had children before married a woman who had already given birth previously or one who had given birth when she was a bond woman but is now freed or one who gave birth when she was a heathen and has since become a proselyte and if when she came to the Israelite she bore a firstborn the infant is considered a firstborn with respect to inheritance but not a firstborn to be redeemed from a priest now from whom did she give birth shall I say from an Israelite who had no children why then should the mission mention a proselyte and a bond woman since this would be the case even with the daughter of Israel then you must say that she gave birth from a Stranger who had children and became a proselyte, and yet it says the infant is a firstborn with respect to inheritance, which CONF are Yohanan's opinion. No, I may still say that the Mishnah means that she gave birth from an Israelite who had no children, and it has to inform us that the infant is not a firstborn to be released by redemption to exclude the ruling of our Jose the Galilean, who said the infant is both a firstborn with respect to inheritance and also one who must be redeemed from a priest, because it is said in the scriptures, Openeth the womb among the children of Israel, implying until the opening of the womb is of the children of Israel. The Mishnah therefore informs us that it is not so common here if he had children when he was a heathen and he became a proselyte, the infant has the status of a firstborn with respect to inheritance, said Rabbanah, or as some say, Arahabi Rabbah, this is certainly the opinion of our Jose the Galilean who holds scripture says. Whosoever openeth the womb until the opening of the womb is of the children of Israel, and we infer the case of the husband from that of the woman. Our Adabi Ahabah said, If a Levite's daughter gave birth, her son is not subject to the law of redemption from a priest with five cells. Now, from whom did she conceive? Shall I say that she conceived from a priest or a Levite? Why then mention a Levite's daughter? Since this is the case, even with an Israelite's daughter, again you should say that she conceived from an Israelite. But is it not written after their families by house of their father said, Our Papa, the case here then is where she conceived from a Gentile, and you should not say that this holds good only for him who maintains that the child is not rejected as the child of a Gentile. But even according to him who holds that the child is rejected, the son of a Levite's daughter is exempted, for it is called an unfit Levite. Mar son of our Joseph reported in the name of Rabbi I may say. Still that the Levite's daughter conceived from an Israelite and the case is different there with reference to redemption from a priest as scripture says whatsoever openeth the womb the law makes it depend on the opening of the womb we have learned if one had children already and married a woman who had never given birth previously or if she became a proselyte when pregnant or was freed when pregnant and she gave birth or if confusion arose between her and a priestess between her and a Levite's daughter between her and a woman who had already given birth and likewise if a woman who did not wait three months after her husband's death married and gave birth and it is not known if the infant was born in the ninth month after the death of the first husband or in the seventh month since she married the second the child is a firstborn to be redeemed by a priest but not a firstborn with respect to inheritance we infer from this that the priestess and the Levite's daughter are not subject to the law of redemption now from whom did she conceive shall I say that she conceived from a priest or a Levite why mention in the mission of the cases of a priestess and a Levite's daughter since the case is the same with the daughter of an Israelite again you should say that she conceived from a Gentile but is a priestess in such circumstances exempt from redeeming her son has not our Papa said Rabbah examined us in laws as follows if a priestess conceived from a Gentile what is the ruling and I answered him is this not analogous to the ruling of our Adabi Ahabah who said if a Levite's daughter gave birth her son is not subject to the law of redemption with five cellars and he said to me but is the analogy correct this is no difficulty as regards the case of a Levite's daughter for she retains her sacred status for it has been taught if a Levite's daughter was made a captive or if she had intercourse of a licentious character we nevertheless give her of a tithe and she May eat, but in the case of a priestess, as soon as she has intercourse with a Gentile, she becomes a stranger. This might be right according to Marson of our Joseph, who said that the Levite's daughter conceived from an Israelite. We can then explain that the mission also refers to a case where the priestess conceived from an Israelite. But according to our Papa, how will you explain the mission? I may still say that she conceived from a priest, she herself, however, being a daughter of an Israelite. And the reason why the mission describes her as a priestess is because her son is a priest. Talmud, Mosbek or Obi, it was stated if a priest dies and leaves a son who is a halal or his da said the son is obliged to redeem himself. But Rabbi son of Arhuna said the son is not obliged to redeem himself wherever the father dies after 30 days from the son's birth. All agree that the son is not obliged to redeem himself, for his father has acquired possession of his redemption money. The point at issue. However, is where the father dies within the thirty days. Arhista says the son is obliged to redeem himself, since the father did not acquire possession of his redemption. But Rabbi son of Arhuna said the son is not obliged to redeem himself, for he can say to the priest, "I come on the strength of a man with whom you cannot go to law." We have learned, or if she became a proselyte when pregnant, the infant is a firstborn to be redeemed from a priest. But why so? Why cannot the son say to the priest, "Who claims I come on the strength of a man a gentile with whom you cannot go to law?" The case of a heathen is different because he has no legal relationship. It has been stated, Arsimian Yasini reported in the name of Arsimian Belagish, if a priest dies within thirty days of the birth of his child and leaves a son who is a halal, the son is obliged to redeem himself, for the father did not acquire possession of his redemption. If he dies, however, after thirty days from the son's birth, the son is not obliged to redeem himself for the father acquired possession of his redemption and the son inherited the redemption money and likewise a woman who did not wait three months after her husband's death etc. The Mishnah says that he is not a firstborn inheritance implying however that he takes his share as a plain son i.e. a non-firstborn but why should this be so let him go to the sons of this one and they can reject his claim and let him go to the sons of the other and they too can reject his claim said our Jeremiah it would not have been necessary for the Mishnah to mention this except for the case of the one who follows him the meaning being as follows he is a firstborn to be redeemed from a priest and the one who follows him is not a firstborn for inheritance but let both the doubtful son and the one who follows him write out the power of attorney to one another and should you say that the Mishnah which says that he is not a firstborn of inheritance refers to a Case where no power of attorney was given is not the mission explained later in this chapter as referring to a case where a power of attorney was written out thus proving that the power of attorney here does not help at all the mission supports the opinion of Arjane for Arjane says if the children belonging to two women and two husbands were identified in the beginning but in the end became mixed they can write out a power of attorney to each other but if they were not identified in the beginning and in the end became mixed they cannot write out a power of attorney to each other mission which is a firstborn both in respect of inheritance and of redemption from a priest if a woman discharges a sack full of water or full of blood or an abortion consisting of a bag full of many colored substance if a woman discharges something like fish or locusts or reptiles or creeping things or if she discharges on the 40th day of conception the infant which follows after these discharges is a firstborn both in respect of inheritance and of redemption from a priest neither a foetus extracted by means of the caesarean section nor the infant which follows is either a firstborn for inheritance or a firstborn to be redeemed from a priest our simeon however says the first is a firstborn of inheritance and the second is
Mosbek wrote a Mishnah if a man's wife had never before given birth and she gave birth to two males, he gives five cellars to the priest if one of them dies within 30 days of birth, the father is exempt if the father dies and the son survive. Armadir says if they gave the five cellars before the property was divided up, it is irrecoverable, but if not, they are exempt. But Arjuna says there is a claim on the property if she gave birth to a male and a female, the priest receives nothing. Gamara. When did the father die? Shall I say that he died after 30 days from the offspring's birth? Would Armadir say in this case that when they have divided up the property, they are exempt from the five cellars? How can this be seeing that the property is mortgaged to the priest for the five cellars? Then you must say that he died within the 30 days. What then is the reason why where they have divided up the property, the sons are exempt, presumably because if he, the priest goes to one. His claim can be rejected, and if he goes to the other, his claim can again be rejected. Why then should not the same apply to the case where they did not divide up the property? For if the priest goes to one, his claim can be rejected, and if he goes to the other, his claim can be rejected. Said our Jeremiah, this proves that if there were two men of the name of Joseph B. Simeon in one city and they purchased a field in partnership, the creditor can claim it from them, for he can say to either if my claim is against you, I am taking your mina, and if my claim is against your friend, I am taking the mina of your friend. Said Rabba, let us see a man's property is surety for him. Can there be a case where one is not able to claim against a man himself and can yet make a claim on his surety? Have we not learned if one loans money to his neighbor through a surety, he cannot collect from the surety, and it was established by us that the expression he cannot collect meant that he cannot collect first from it. Surety, but no, said Rabbi. I may still say that he, the father, died after 30 days, and if there is much property, then indeed the priest takes his due. The case before us, however, is one in which, e.g., there are only five cellars. Now, all the authorities concerned agree with the ruling of R.C. For R.C. said, after the brothers' heirs have divided up the estate with regards to a half of it, they are considered as heirs, and with regards to the other half, they are considered purchasers from one another. Moreover, all agree that a pecuniary obligation arising from a rule of the Torah Talmud, Mosbek or OP, is not on a PAR with an obligation in a note. Again, all agree with the ruling of our Papa. For our Papa said, one can claim repayment of a verbal loan from the heirs, but not from the purchasers. And the point at issue here is whether the biblical five cellars rules out a half of five cellars as a redemption. Armadier holds scripture says five cellars, thus ruling out a half of five cellars as. Redemption whereas Arjuna holds five cellars and even a half of five cellars if this be the case why does the mission say Arjuna however says there is a claim on the property should it not read as follows there is a claim on the person and moreover it has been taught Arjuna says after the brothers the ears have divided up the property if there are ten zoos for one and ten zoos for the other they must be redeemed from the priest but if not they are exempt now what does Arjuna mean by the expression ten zoos for one and ten zoos for the other shall I say that he refers to both the portion that comes to them as inheritance and to that part in regard to which the ears are considered vendees if this be the case why does Arjuna mention ten zoos for the same also applies to less than ten zoos and he certainly means that there are ten zoos coming as inheritance to one and ten zoos coming as inheritance to the other consequently we see that he holds that the biblical five cellars Excludes redemption with half the five cellars rather explained thus all the authorities concerned agree that the five cellars of redemption excludes a redemption with half of five cellars and here they differ on the points raised by R.C. and our Papa some report this whole argument in connection with the latter clause in our mission as follows Arjuna says there is a claim on the property now when did the father die shall I say that he died after 30 days this would imply that Armadir holds that when the property is divided up they are exempt from redemption but is not the property pledged for redemption then we must say that he died within 30 days but why then does Arjuna make the survivor liable to redemption for if the priest goes to one his claim can be rejected and if he goes to the other his claim can again be rejected said our Jeremiah this proves that if there were two men of the name of Joseph B. Simeon in one city and one purchased a field from the other a Creditor can claim from him for he can say to him if my claim is against you I am taking your mina and if the claim is against your friend the property is pledged to me for the debt before your claim said Robin now a man's property is surety for him etc. As in the first version mission if two women had never before given birth and they gave birth to two males he the father gives ten cellars to the priest if one of the children dies within thirty days of its birth if he gave the redemption money to one priest alone he returns five cellars to him but if he gave it to two priests he cannot reclaim the money from them if they gave birth to a male and a female or to two males and a female he gives five cellars to the priest if they gave birth to two females and a male or to two males and two females the priest receives nothing if one woman had given birth before and the other had never given birth and they gave birth to two males he gives five cellars to the priest if one of it Children died within 30 days of its birth. The father is exempt if the father dies and the children survive. Armadir says if they gave the redemption money before the dividing up of the property, it is irrecoverable, but if not, they are exempt. But Arjuna says there is a claim on the property if they gave birth to a male and a female. The priest receives nothing if two women who had never before given birth married two men and gave birth to two males. The one father gives five cellars to the priest and the other gives five cellars to the priest. If one of the children died within 30 days of its birth, if they gave the redemption money to one priest alone, he returns five cellars to them. But if they gave the money to two priests, they are not able to claim it from them. If they gave birth to a male and a female, the fathers are exempt from the duty of redemption, whereas the son must redeem himself, as in any case he is a firstborn if they gave birth to two females and a male or two. Two females and two males, the priest receives nothing if one woman had given birth before and the other had never before given birth. The women belonging to two husbands and they gave birth to two males, the one whose wife had never before given birth gives five cellars to the priest if they gave birth to a male and a female, the priest receives nothing tomorrow. What is the reason that in the case of two priests the redemption money cannot be recovered, presumably because if he the father goes to one priest his claim can be rejected and if he goes to the other his claim can again be rejected. Why then should we not apply the same principle to the case of one priest so that if one father goes to the priest the latter can reject his demand to return the money and if the other goes to the priest the latter can also reject his demand, said Samuel Talmud. Mosbek wrote, we are dealing here with a case where the fathers wrote out a power of attorney but did not the Nihardi and say we do. Not write out a private authorization to take possession of movables. This is the case only where the debtor denies indebtedness to the creditor, but where there is no such denial, we do write a male and a female. The fathers are exempt, etc. Our who learned if they gave birth to two males and a female in a hiding place and the children became mixed, the priest receives nothing and our tana since this is the case only where there are two husbands, but not where there is only one husband and two women. He does not teach this mission. If the son dies within 30 days of his birth, although he the father gave the priest the five cellars, he must return them. If however he dies after 30 days, although he has not yet given the five cellars, he must give them. If he dies on the 30th day, it is as if he died on the previous day. But our Akibah says if he gave the five cellars, he cannot reclaim them. But if he had not yet given, he need not give tomorrow. What is the reason of the rabbis? We Draw an analogy between the expression month and month mentioned in the book of Numbers just as there in the latter case it says and upward so here also in the case of redemption it means and upward and what does our Akiva say to this he is in doubt for since it was necessary to write and upward in connection with the law of valuation and did not leave us to infer this from the expression and upward in the book of Numbers we have therefore two verses teaching the same thing and wherever we have two verses teaching the same thing they cannot serve as an illustration for other cases yet perhaps on the other hand we may say that the rule that the two verses which teach the same thing cannot serve as an illustration for other cases only applies to such cases as are totally different but where the same subject is dealt with the verses do serve as an illustration and consequently here Akiva is in doubt said our Ashi all the authorities concerned agree that as regards the laws of Morning the thirtieth day is counted as being like the previous day for Samuel said the law is in accordance with the authority who is lenient in matters of morning mission if the father dies within thirty days the infant is under the presumption of not having been redeemed until proof is brought that it has been redeemed if the father however dies after thirty days it is under the
Although the money was used is not the betrothal yet valid Talmud, Mas Bekorot B in this case too it is the same and Samuel he can answer thus there in the case of betrothal he can effect the betrothal from now whereas here in the case of redemption redemption cannot make it take effect from now and although we have an established rule that wherever Rab and Samuel differ in ritual law the ruling adopted is that of Rab and in civil cases the ruling adopted is that of Samuel here however. The ruling adopted is that of Samuel we have learned if the son dies within 30 days of his birth although he has given the priest redemption money the latter must return it the reason is because he dies but if he did not die the son is considered redeemed we are dealing here with the case where the money is still in existence come and here the infant is under the presumption of not having been redeemed until a proof is brought that it has been redeemed there too it is a case where the money is in existence a tanner recited in the presence of Rab Judah if one redeems his son within 30 days of its birth the son is considered redeemed he said to him but did not Samuel rule that the son is not redeemed and you say that the son is considered redeemed read the son is not redeemed and although we have an established rule that the ruling adopted is that of Rab in ritual matters and is like Samuel in civil matters here however the decision is in accordance with the ruling of Samuel if both the father and son require redemption as firstborn the father takes precedence of his son etc. Our rabbis taught if both the father and son require redemption as firstborn the father takes precedence of his son. Our Judah says his son comes first for the father's command is upon his father and the command of his son is upon him said our Jeremiah all the authorities concerned agree that where there are only five cellars the father takes precedence of the son the reason being because the command regarding himself is of more importance the difference arises however in the case where there are five cellars of encumbered property and five cellars of free property our Judah holds an obligation arising from a biblical law e.g. the duty of redeeming the firstborn is on a par with a loan against a note therefore the five cellars do for himself he the priest goes and seizes from the encumbered property and with the five cellars of the free property he redeems his son immediately. But the rabbis say an obligation arising from the biblical law is not on a par with a loan against a note, and therefore the command of redemption relating to himself takes precedence. Mission of the five cellars of the firstborn take the tyranny main as their standard as regards the thirty shekels of a slave, and likewise the fifty shekels of one who violates a woman, the indemnity for seduction, and the one hundred shekels of one who spreads an evil name. In all these cases, the holy shekel is meant. And take the tyranny main as their standard. All of these are redeemed with money or money's worth, with the exception of shekel payments. Gemara, what is a tyranny main? A set are ashi the main of the tyranny currency. Rmi said the tyranny main is an Arabian dinar. Arhanan said a Syriac is eight of which are bought for a gold dinar, and five of which are the amount for the redemption of the firstborn Talmud. Mas Bekorot Ar Yohanan says take a trigenic or hadrianic dinar which is robbed. Often bought for 25 zoos and deduct a sixth from it, and the remainder is the amount for the redemption of the firstborn, but is not this the sum of 21 zoos minus a dunker, rather deduct a sixth together with a zoos, and the remainder is the amount for the redemption of the firstborn, but even so the amount is 20 zoos minus a dunker, rather deduct first a zoos, and then a sixth, and the remainder is the amount for the redemption of the firstborn, which is 20 times the weight of a tyrian dinar, and which makes 28 and a half zoos and a half dunker, said Robert. The biblical cellar contains three and a third dinars, because scripture says a shekel is 20 gears, which the Targum renders 20 ma, and it has been taught six ma silver make one dinar, an objection was raised, does not the holy cellar contain 48 dupandia? What business has the extra dupandium here? The dupandium is an agio in addition to the units of barrier refers to the period. After the seller had been increased in value for it was taught in the Barith, the scripture says a shekel is twenty gears for thus we learn that a shekel contains twenty gears whence do we deduce that if he wished to increase the number of ma he is at liberty to do so the text states twenty gears shall be the shekel you might perhaps think that he can decrease the number of ma to guard against such an inference the text states the same as twenty gears are as he sent seventeen zoos to our Ahabi Rabba for the redemption of the firstborn he sent him word let the master return to me the extra third of a seller from the redemption money sent he replied to him let the master send me another three zoos which were added to the biblical seller said Arhanan every silver coinage Kezif mentioned in the Pentateuch without any qualification means a seller in the prophet's literary and the hagiographer centenary except the silver coinage mentioned in the transaction of Ephraim for although it is mentioned in the Bible without qualification it means centenary because scripture says 400 shekels of silver current money with the merchant and there is a place where the shekels are called centenary said Arashai the rabbis proposed to hide all the silver and gold in the world on account of the silver and gold of Jerusalem until they found a text from the Torah which made their use permissible because scripture says for the robbers shall enter into it and profane it but is Jerusalem the greater portion of the world rather Abbe said the rabbis proposed hiding the Hadrianic and Trajanic dinars which were rubbed off on account of the sacred coinage of Jerusalem until they found a text from the Torah making their use permissible because it is said for the robbers shall enter into it and profane it Talmud Mosbek or Rab Judah reported in the name of R.C. every silver coinage mentioned in the Pentateuch without any qualification means interior currency in the teaching of the rabbis it means in the currency of the province an eighth of the silver coinage of the Pentateuch and is this a general rule have we not the case of one making a claim for it is written if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor silver coinage or stuff to keep and we have learned for an oath to be imposed by the judges the claim must amount to not less than two silver mile the reason is because the Torah says silver coinage or stuff just as stuff means two so. Silver coinage also means two coins and again a silver coinage means something of value so stuff means also something of value but is there not the case of tithing for it is written and bind up the silver coinage in thine hand and we have learned if one changes at the bankers a seller's worth from the monies of second tithes the threefold repetition of the word silver intimates an amplification but is there not the case of hitish of which it is written and he shall give the silver. Coinage and it shall be assured to him and Samuel ruled if Hippish worth a mana has been redeemed against the parotid it is a valid redemption in the case of Hippish too we draw an analogy between the ex praise sign holy used in this connection and holy used in connection with the second tides but is there not the case of a woman's betrothal for it is written and she shall go out free without silver coinage and we have learned in a mission of Betcham I say betrothal must take place with a dinar and the worth of a dinar whereas Beth Hillel say with a parotid and the worth of a parotid must it then be said that R.C. agrees with the opinion of Betcham I rather we must say that if it has been stated it was stated thus Rab Judah reported in the name of R.C. every silver coinage mentioned in the Pentateuch in connection with defined payments means in the Tyrian currency and that mentioned in the teaching of the rabbis means in the currency of the province what does he teach? Us thereby have we not learned this already five sellers of the firstborn etc. He needed to teach us that the silver coinage mentioned by the rabbis meant according to the provincial standard for we have learned if one boxes his neighbor's ear he must compensate him with a seller think not therefore that it means a seller of four zoos but it means half a zoos for people call half a zoos a seller the ruffian Hanan boxed a man's ear he was brought before Arunah the latter said to him give him half a zoos as compensation he possessed Talmud, Mosbek wrote a battered zoos which could not be passed he wanted to give him half a zoos from it the other had no change so he gave him another box on the ear and handed to him the whole zoos the thirty shekels of a slave likewise the fifty shekels of one who violates a woman and the indemnity of fifty shekels for seduction etc. Why does he mention this again has he not mentioned this in an earlier clause the repetition is needed on account of the cases of one who violates a woman and one who spreads an evil name I might have thought that since Shekalim is not written in connection with these cases I might say that mere zoos are sufficient the Tana therefore informs us that we infer one from the other with the exception of Shekel payments a Tana taught with the exception of Shekel payments second tithes and the pilgrims burnt offering Shekel payments as we have learned you may exchange Shekels for Derek's on account of the burden of the journey. Second tithes as it is written and bind up the money in thine hand and the pilgrims burnt offering are Joseph learned in order that one may not bring base metal to the temple mission we must not redeem a firstborn
on the lines of generalizations and specifications thus and those that are to be redeemed is a general statement according to the estimation of the money is a specification shall thou redeem again is a general statement we have therefore here a general statement and a specification and again a generalization in which case we include in the general statement only such things as are similar to those specified as therefore the specification explicitly mentions a movable object and that which is itself money so everything with which we may redeem must be a movable object and that which is itself money immovable properties are therefore excluded as being proper to redeem with because they are not movable slaves are also excluded as they are compared with immovable properties and notes of indebtedness are excluded because although they are movables they are not in themselves money said Rabbi Ajamir Mar but does Rabbi interpret Bible text on the lines of amplifications and Limitations does not rabbi interpret Bible text on the lines of generalizations followed by specifications in connection with the law of boring a slave's ear with an offer it was taught scripture says in all I have here mentioned only and all wherewith to bore a slave's ear once do we include a prick or needle borer or stylus the text states and thou shalt take thus including every object which can be taken in the hand this is a view of our Jose son of our Judah rabbi however says in all just as in all is exclusively of metal so anything used for boring a slave's ear must be of metal and we stated elsewhere wherein do they differ rabbi interprets the biblical text on the lines of generalizations and specifications whereas our Jose son of our Judah interprets on the lines of amplifications and limitations yes elsewhere rabbi interprets biblical text on the lines of generalizations and specifications the case however is different here as a tana of the school of R. Ishmael taught for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught scripture says in the waters in the waters the repetition is not to be interpreted as a general statement followed by a specification but as an amplification and a limitation and the rabbis they say it was explained in the West Palestinian colleges wherever you find two general statements in proximity place the specification between them and interpret them on the lines of generalizations and specifications nor with objects of Hippish surely this is obvious since they do not belong to him Red Talmud, Mosbek or Opi and objects of Hippish cannot be redeemed with all these if one writes out to a priest that he owes him five cellars he is bound to give them to him etc. said well according to the biblical law his son is redeemed after payment why then does the Mishnah say that his son is not redeemed it is a precaution in case people might say that it is permissible to redeem with notes of indebtedness and rab. She's hate ruled likewise his son is redeemed after payment. The Tanner recited before our and his son is redeemed after payment. Our and said to him, This is the teaching of our Jose, son of our Judah, whose opinion has been reported anonymously. Some say this is the teaching of our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, whose opinion has been reported anonymously. But the sages say his son is not redeemed, and the law is that his son is not redeemed. Therefore, if the priest wishes to give him the note of indebtedness, say, If he is permitted to do so, the Mishnah here teaches what our rabbis have taught elsewhere. If one gave the five cellars to ten priests simultaneously, he has discharged his duty of redemption. If he gave the five cellars one after the other, he has discharged his duty. If the priest took the redemption money and returned it to him, he has discharged his duty. And this was the custom of our Tarfan. He used to take the five cellars and then return them. When the sages heard of this, they said this. Teacher has observed this law and did he only observe this law and no other this teacher observed even this law our Hanano was in the habit of taking the five cellars and returning them once he saw a man who after giving him the five cellars kept on coming before him he said to him you have not given genuinely you did something wrong consequently your son is not redeemed if one set aside the redemption money for his son and it became lost he is responsible for it how do we know said R. Simeon Belakish we draw an analogy between the term valuation used in connection with the redemption of the firstborn and the word valuation used in connection with the law of valuations are deemed reported in the name of our Yohan and scripture says and all the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem and none shall appear before me empty and we draw an analogy between the word empty and the word empty used in connection with the burnt offering of appearance before the Lord thus just as one. Is responsible for the burnt offering of appearance, so one is responsible for the redemption money of the firstborn to this our Papa demurred. Is there need for a biblical verse to support another biblical verse? No, said our Papa. The reason why he is responsible is as stated, scripture says, shall be thine, shalt thou surely redeem. And when the explanation of Reshlakish was stated, it was stated in connection with an earlier clause in the Mishnah. If the son died after 30 days, although he has not yet given the redemption money, he is bound to give it. How do we know, said our Simeon Belakish? We draw an analogy between the word valuation used in connection with the redemption of the firstborn and the word valuation used in connection with the law of valuations are deemed reported in the name of our Yohan. And scripture says, all the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty, say just as their ears are responsible for the burnt offering it being. Obligatory burnt offering so here the heirs are responsible for the redemption money if the father and son die mission the firstborn takes a double share of the father's estate but he does not take a double share of the mother's estate he also does not take a double share of the improvement in the value of the estate nor does he take a double share of what will fall due to the estate as he does of what is held in possession Talmud, Mosbeck wrote nor can a woman claim with her ketubah. From these nor can daughters claim their support nor can a lover claim none of these take from the improvement in the value of the estate nor of what will fall to the estate as they do of what is now held in possession tomorrow what is the reason scripture say the right of the firstborn is his intimating that the right of the firstborn is conferred by a man but not by a woman he does not take double share of the increase in value because scripture says of all that he hath nor does he take. A double share of what will fall due to the estate as he does of what is held in possession because scripture says of all that he hath nor can a woman claim with her ketuba is it really so has not Samuel said a creditor can claim also the improvement in the value of the estate said our Abba they have taught here one of the concessions made in connection with the ketuba nor the obligations of supporting the daughters what is the reason stipulations in a ketuba are like the ketuba nor a lover what is the reason scripture calls him a firstborn said Abba they have taught this only with regard to the improvement in the value of the estate between the death of the brother and the performance of the Levirate marriage but he does take a double share of the improvement of the value of the estate which took place between the period of the performance of the Levirate marriage and the division of the estate what is the reason the divine law says shall succeed in the name of his brother that is dead but here is a case of one who succeeded Rabbah however says he does not take the improvement in the brother's share even between the period of the performance of the Levirate marriage and the dividing up of the estate what is the reason he has the same law as a firstborn as a firstborn does not take a double share of the improvement in the value of the estate before the division so a lover also does not take a double share of the improvement before the division none of these take from the improvement in the value of the estate Talmud, Mosbeck or Opi this implies even an improvement in the value of the estate which comes of itself if e.g. on the father's death what was available of the products of the ground was classed under Hafra and now it is Shevelers or on the father's death they were Shalpiv and afterwards became full-grown dates not what will fall due to the estate as they do of what is held in possession this brings as under the rule that Grandfather's estate mission of the following do not return to their owners in Jubilee the share of the firstborn the inheritance of one who inherits his wife's estate and of one who marries his sister-in-law in a present these are the words of our Meir but the sages say a present has the law of a sale of land our Eliezer says however all these return in Jubilee our Yohanan B. Baraka says if one inherits his wife's estate he returns it to the members of the family and allows them a deduction from the purchase money tomorrow what is the reason of our Meir only in the case of a sale of land does the divine long join that it must return in the year of Jubilee to its original owners but not with regard to a present or an inheritance and the cases enumerated in the mission as not returning in Jubilee are either cases of inheritance or such as come under the category of a present with reference to a firstborn it says by giving him a double portion the divine law thus describing his portion as a present and he who inherits his wife's estate a man's inheritance of his wife's estate is a biblical law and therefore it is a genuine inheritance he who marries his sister-in-law the reason being because the divine law describes him the lover as a firstborn but the sages say a present has the law of a sale of land what is the reason of the rabbi scripture says ye shall return intimating the inclusion of the case of a present but all the other cases are those of inheritance
Yohanan, after the years have divided up the estate, they are considered as purchasers from one another and return their portions one to another in the year of Jubilee to this Arashai demurred the following do not return in Jubilee the share of the firstborn Ar Eliezer replied to him the expression do not return here means that the return in Jubilee does not make the privileges of the firstborn of no account to this Arshis hate does this imply that the one Ar Eliezer who said all of these return in Jubilee means that the return in Jubilee makes the privilege of the firstborn of no account thereupon Rami Biham applied to Arshis hate the verse wisdom is good with an inheritance for has he not heard the following when Rabin came he reported in the name of Ar Yohanan another version is that when Rabin came he reported that Ar Eliezer said in the name of Ar Eliezer Bishamu returning in Jubilee here means that it makes the privileges of the firstborn of no account are Yohanan Bibarica says if one inherits his wife's estate he returns it to the members of the family etc. What is his view if he holds that a man's inheritance of his wife's estate is a biblical law then why should he return it to the family in Jubilee and if he holds that a man's inheritance of his wife's estate is only a rabbinical law what claim is there to the money one may still maintain that a man's inheritance of his wife's estate is a biblical law and we are dealing here with a case where e.g. his wife bequeathed him a cemetery and for fear of casting a reflection on the family the rabbis ruled that he should take from them the money for the cemetery and return it to them in Jubilee and so it has been taught if one sells his grave and the road to his grave or his halting place and the place for lamentation the members of his family come and bury him perforce so as not to cast any reflection on the family and what the Mishnah means by he allows them a deduction is with reference. To the cost of his wife's grave as this is an obligation which devolves on him. Chapter 9 Talmud, Mosbek wrote a mission of the law concerning the tithe of cattle is in force in Palestine and outside Palestine in the days when the temple exists and when it does not exist. It applies to Holland only but not to consecrated animals. It applies both to large cattle and sheep though none can be tithed for the other to lambs and to goats and one can be tithed for the other to the new breed and it. Old though none can be tithed for the other now it might be rightly argued seeing that new and old animals which are not treated as diverse kinds in regard to one another are yet not tithed one for the other lambs and goats which are treated as diverse kinds in regard to one another all the more should not be tithed one for the other the text therefore states and of the flock intimating that all kinds of flock are considered one for purposes of tithing tomorrow may we say that our mission is not in accordance with our Akiva, for it was taught our Akiva says you might think that a man may take up an animal set aside as tithe from outside Palestine and offer it to guard against this inference the text states and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithe scripture speaks of two kinds of tithes one the tithing of animals and the other the tithe of grain and I draw an analogy thus from the place from which you can bring up the tithe of grain you can bring up an animal set aside as tithe but from a place from which you cannot bring up the tithe of grain you cannot bring up an animal set aside as tithe to be sacrificed no you can even say that the mission is in accordance with our Akiva. the one statement refers to offering the animal up the other to the consecration thereof this is also indicated by the fact that here Akiva derives his teaching from the text and thither ye shall bring thus referring distinctly to offering up this proves it but since the animal is not offered up for what purpose is it consecrated to be eaten by the owners when it becomes blemished in the days when the temple exists and when it does not exist if this be the case then the law of tithe as regards animals should apply even nowadays it is as Arhuna says elsewhere for Arhuna said it is prohibited as a prevention against an animal whose mother died during or soon after childbirth being brought into the shed if this be the case. The same prohibition should have applied originally when the temple was standing what you must therefore reply is that it is possible for an announcement to be made by the Beth Din this being so here too it is possible to have all announcement made by the Beth Din rather said Rabbi the reason is that one might be led to commit an offense and whence will you prove that we take into account the possibility of one committing an offense for it was taught we are not permitted to. Consecrate an animal nor to make valuation nor to set aside as devoted nowadays but if one did consecrate an animal or make a valuation or set aside as devoted the animal is to be destroyed fruits garments and vessels shall be allowed to rot and as for money and metal vessels let him cast them into the salt sea and what is meant by destroying he locks the door on the animal and it dies of itself from hunger if this be the case then a firstborn of an animal should also not become holy. Nowadays is then the sanctity of the firstborn dependent on us is it not holy from the time it leaves the womb this is what is meant by the question let him make over to a heathen the ears of the mothers of the prospective offspring so that they shall not be sanctified from the beginning Talmud. Mosbek wrote it is possible to adopt the remedy of Rab Judah for Rab Judah said one may maim a firstborn before it is born but here also it is possible to cause a blemish from the beginning. Who knows which animal will come out the tent and should you say that he brings it out as tent scripture says he shall not search whether it be good or bad and should you say that it is possible to cause a blemish in the whole herd of animals the temple may be speedily rebuilt and we shall require an animal for a sacrifice and there will be none but does this not also apply to a firstborn that the temple may speedily be rebuilt and we shall require an animal for sacrifice and there will be none it is possible in the latter case to use plain non-firstborn animals there too in the case of the tithing of animals it is possible to sacrifice animals but since he causes a blemish in the entire herd of animals and blemishes which disqualify consecrated animals are frequent for even a cataract disqualifies animals for sacrifice are not easy to obtain it applies to holland only but not to consecrated animals but is it not obvious that the law of tithing animals does not apply to consecrated animals seeing that they are not as the statement refers to sacrifices of a minor grade and is in accordance with the opinion of our Jose the Galilean who said sacrifices of a minor grade are considered the property of the owners for it has been taught and committed trespass against the Lord this includes sacrifices of a minor grade which are considered the owner's property these are the words of our Jose the Galilean you might therefore think that they should be tithed. The mission consequently informs us that it is not so and why not say that this is so the divine law says the tenth shall be holy implying but not what is already holy now the reason of this is because the divine law says shall be holy but otherwise the holiness of an animal set aside for tithe would have applied to consecrated animals but if a major grade of holiness is not superimposed on a minor grade is there any question of a minor grade being superimposed on a minor grade what is? Referred to as we have learned neither objects dedicated for sacrifices nor offerings for temple repair may be changed from one holiness to the other but it is permitted to dedicate for temple repair the value one receives for obliging somebody in connection with dedicated sacrifices or we may declare the benefit received for obliging somebody as devoted for the altar you might have said that there the reason is that every animal is not designated for a burnt offering but here since every animal must be tithed therefore although he dedicated it for a peace offering he does not exempt it from the prohibition applying to an animal tithe and what would be the practical difference that he is liable of transgressing on their account the negative precepts of it shall not be sold and it shall not be redeemed the text therefore shall be wholly intimates that this is not so it also applies both to large cattle and sheep but they cannot be tithed one for the other to lambs and Goats, etc. And why should not we derive a rule that the new animals born after Elul and the old born before Elul be tithed one for the other? A minority thus if lambs and goats which are treated as diverse kinds in regard to one another are tithed one for the other, does it not stand to reason that new and old animals which are not treated as diverse kinds in regard to one another should be tithed one for the other? Scripture, however, states thou shalt truly tithe. Scripture speaks of two kinds of tithes one the tithing of animals and the other the tithing of grain, and it compares the case of an animal tithe with that of the tithing of grain, just as in the case of the tithing of grain it is forbidden to tithe the new for the old, so in the case of the tithing of animals it is also forbidden to tithe the new for the old. If this be the fact, the same should apply to the case of lambs and goats. Why not say that we compare the tithing of animals to the tithing of grain so that just as in the case of the tithing of grain you must not tithe one kind of grain for the other so in the case of the tithing of animals you must not tithe one kind of animal for the other the divine law includes all by stating flock if this be so then include also new and old animal scripture says thou shalt truly tithe and why do you see fit said rab scripture says
to the opinion of Arjosea who said the law of diverse kinds does not apply until one has sowed a wheat seed, a barley seed, and a great kernel with one and the same throw. How can you adduce this argument? He adduces it as follows: If in the case of wine and oil which are not counted as diverse kinds in regard to one another, even through the sowing of another seed, you must not tithe one for the other. All the more must wine and grain or grain and grain which are counted as diverse kinds in regard to one another through the sowing of another seed not be tithed one for the other. And whence do we know that you must not tithe generally any two other kinds one for the other? The tithing of these is a rabbinical enactment, and all the enactments of the rabbis have the same scope as the corresponding biblical enactment. Hence, just as two kinds which are ordained biblically must not be tithed one for the other, so also two kinds which are ordained rabbinically must not be tithed one. For the other said our Abba to RMI according to this in the case of the tithing of animals since scripture does not say and concerning the tithe of the herd and the tithe of the flock Talmud, Mosbek or OP it should be permitted to tithe one for the other he replied to him scripture says the tenth intimating that you must give a tenth of this kind of animal and the tenth of the other if this be the case lambs and goats should also not be tithed one for the other scripture. Says end of the flock implying that all kinds of flock are considered one here too let us say that the text end of the wheat implies that all kinds of grain are considered one said of a scripture says the first fruits of them and RLL likewise it is the text the first fruits of them Rabbi said even without the text the first fruits of them we could not say that the text end of the wheat implies that all kinds of grain are considered one for it is quite intelligible that we should. Say there that end of the flock implies that all kinds of flock are considered one for if you should be inclined to think that scripture intended that lambs and goats are also not to be tithed one for the other then let scripture say and concerning the tithe of animal and should you object that if it had written and concerning the tithe of animal I might have assumed that it included even a beast of chase the answer is that we have an analogy between the expressions under and under and we could have derived the minority from new and old that you must not tithe one kind of animal for another and why therefore does scripture state of the herd and of the flock it must be too intimate that only as regards the herd large cattle and the flock you must not tithe one for the other but as regards lambs and goats you may tithe one for the other but your scripture could not avoid saying of the wheat in order to exclude other kinds to this are who not be Nathan Demard why not say that the Text of the herd and of the flock intimates that you may tithe large cattle for flock Marzitra son of Arnaman replied to him Rabbah also holds a derivation from the text the tenth some there are who say said Rabbah even without the text the tenth you could not say that large cattle and sheep are tithed one for the other for the tithing of animals is compared to the tithing of grain just as in the case of the tithing of grain you must not tithe one kind of grain for the other so in the case of tithing of animals you must not tithe one for the other but was it not Rabbah who said scripture says year by year implying thus I scripture have compared the tithing of animals with the tithing of grain only with regard to the year but not with regard to any other matter Rabbah went back on this former teaching or if you wish I can say one of these statements was made by our Papa mission animals are combined for purposes of tithing so long as they can still pasture within it distance that cattle wander and what is the distance over which they can wander while pasturing 16 mils if there was between two groups of animals a distance of 32 mils they do not combine for the purpose of tithing if however there was a herd in the middle of a distance of 32 mils he brings them into one shed and tithes them at some point in the middle our mayor says the river jordan is regarded as forming a division as regards the tithing of animals Gemara. whence is this proof said rabbi bishila because scripture says shall the flocks pass again under the hands of him that telleth them and it was certain to the rabbis that the eye of a shepherd can exercise control for a distance of 16 mils if there was between two groups of animals a distance of 32 mils they do not combine etc you say that where the distance is 32 mils the animals do not combine for the law of tithing thus implying that unless of this distance they do Combined, but does not the mission state previously that the distance for combining the animals is 16 mils, implying but not a greater distance. The mission mentions 32 mils because it wishes to report in a later clause. If, however, there was a herd in the middle of the 32 mils, he brings them into a shed and ties them in the middle. And how many said rap five on this side and five on the other and five in the middle for the animals in the middle are fit to be combined, either with those on the one side or with those on the other. But Samuel says even if there are five animals on one side and five on the other and one in the middle, they combine for tithing. For we regard the shepherd as standing in the middle, and we therefore apply here the text of him that tell Talmud, Mosbek wrote an objection was raised if he had five animals in far and I and five in far up. A distance of 32 mils, the animals do not combine for tithing until he has. One animal in separates shall we say that the CONF youths Rab Samuel explained on the view of Rab as follows the case here is one where e.g. there were nine on one side and nine on the other and one in the middle the middle animal being fit to be combined either with the one group or with the other our papa said according to the opinion of Samuel even the shepherd himself can combine the animals for tithing and even the implements of the shepherd are as she inquired what of the shepherd's dog do. We say that since when he calls it it comes therefore it the dog cannot help to combine the animals for tithing or since the dog does not always come at his bidding he requires to go and fetch it and therefore it does help to combine the animals for tithing let the stand undecided our mayor says the river Jordan is regarded as forming a division with reference to the tithing of animals said RMI this is the case only where there is no bridge but where there is a bridge the bridge combines the animals for the purpose of tithing we see consequently that the reason is because they are not in contact with each other an objection was raised if he had animals on both sides of the Jordan or in two autonomous cities as e.g. Namor and memory the animals are not combined for the purpose of tithing and needless to say that animals outside the land of Israel and animals in the land of Israel do not combine for tithing purposes now is not outside the land of Israel and in the land of Israel on a PAR with a place where there is a bridge and yet the bury the states that they do not combine rather said our high in the name of our Yohan and the following is the reason of our Meir scripture says and the Jordan was the border of it on the east side scripture thus makes it a separate border boundary on its own but on this reasoning where it says and the border was drawn there and the border went up will you also say that the text makes it a separate border on its own the case is different there because scripture says this shall be unto you the land according to the borders round about intimating that the whole of the land of Israel is regarded as possessing one border if this be the case then is not the Jordan to a part of the land of Israel scripture says according to the border etc with reference to the land but not with reference to the Jordan there is no difficulty on the view of our high Abba for this reason the Misha specially mentions the Jordan but on the view of RMI why does it not mention all the rivers this is indeed a difficulty may it be said that Tanaim differ on these points scripture says when you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan implying that the land is the land of Canaan but that the Jordan is not the land of Canaan these are the words of our Judah but there are Simeon Bio he says behold scripture says on the side the Jordan near Jericho eastwards towards the sun rising implying that just as Jericho is part of the land of Canaan, so is the Jordan part of the land of Canaan. Said Rabbi Barhana, the real Jordan is only from Jericho and below. What is the legal bearing of this remark? Shall I say it is with reference to one who vows why not be guided by the common parlance of men, so that wherever men call it Jordan, it should be forbidden to him. Rather, it must be with reference to the tithing of animals. So indeed, it has been taught in the very that the Jordan issues from the cavern of Panias flows through the lake of Subkay, the lake of Tiberias, and the lake of Sodom, and proceeds to run into the Mediterranean Ocean. And the real Jordan is from Jericho and below. Our high Abba reported in the name of our Yohan. And why is it called Garden Jordan? Because it comes from Dan. Said our Abba to our Ashi, you learned this is from the name. We learned it from here, and they called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan, their father, expounding which our Isaac said Leshem is Panias, and it has been. Taught the Jordan issues from the cavern of Panias and Rabkahana the chief supply of the Jordan comes from the cavern of Panias where a person says I will not drink waters from the cavern of Panias the water of the entire Jordan is forbidden to him the liver is the fountain head of the blood as our Isaac said for our Isaac said a mashed liver causes tent defilement with a quarter of a log the chief source of all waters is the Euph
has reigned in Palestine. The father of Samuel made amikwe for his daughters in the days of Nisan and had mats laid for them in the days of Tishri. He made amikwe in the days of Nisan because he agreed with Rab for RMI reported in the name of Rab. The rise of the Euphrates is a weighty witness indication that it has reigned in Palestine. We fear therefore lest the dripping water will be more than the flowing water and thus the greater part will consist of rainwater and had mats laid for them in the days of Tishri and there is a discrepancy between two opinions held by him for Samuel said waters do not ritually cleanse in a running condition except the river Euphrates in the days of Tishri Mishnah an animal bought or given as a present is exempt from the law of cattle tithe tomorrow whence is this proof said Arkahana because scripture says the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt give unto me likewise thou shalt do with thine oxen and with thy sheep Talmud, Mas Bekoro the just. As the law of the firstborn of thy sons does not apply to a case of bought or presented so the law referring to thine oxen and thy sheep does not apply to the bought or given as a present but does not this text refer to a firstborn scripture says thus thou shalt do if the text has no bearing on the subject of the firstborn to which doing i.e. the act of consecration does not apply since a firstborn is holy from birth and apply it to the subject of the tithing of animals but why not? Say apply it to the case of a sin offering or trespass offering the inference to be made must resemble the case of thy firstborn son just as thy firstborn son is not brought to atone for a sin so thine oxen and with thy sheep must be such as are not brought to atone for a sin but why not say apply the text to a burnt offering or peace offering the inference to be made must resemble the case of thy firstborn son just as the case of thy firstborn son is obligatory and he cannot be brought to the altar as a result of a vow or free will offering so in the case of thine oxen and with thy sheep but why not say apply the text to the case of a pilgrim's burnt offering of appearance before the Lord the rule must resemble the case of thy firstborn son just as in the case of thy firstborn son there is no fixed time for him to become holy so in the case of thine oxen and with thy sheep no time is fixed for their holiness I might have said however that just as the rule of thy firstborn son does not apply at all to where he is bought, similarly the rule of thine oxen and with thy sheep does not apply at all to where they are bought. Why then did RSC report in the name of Rabbi Hanan if one bought ten embryos which were in the insides of their mothers, they all entered the shed to be tithed? Said Rabbi Scripture says thou shalt do, intimating that only when doing, i.e., the act of consecration is possible, does Scripture impose restrictions to revert to the above text. RSC reported in the name of Yohanan if one bought ten embryos which were in the insides of their mothers, all of them entered the shed to be tithed. But have we not learned an animal bought or given as a present is exempt from the law of cattle tithe? Said R. Eliezer, R. Yohanan appeared last night to me in a dream. Therefore I know that I will say a good thing today. As follows, Scripture says thou shalt do, intimating that only where the act of consecration is possible. Does scripture impose restrictions? Our Simeon Beliakim raised an objection against the opinion of R. Eliezer. The law of an animal bought applies also to an animal too young for sacrifice. He replied to him, This is not a recognized teaching, and if you will say that it is a recognized teaching, then it must be the opinion of R. Simeon B. Judah, for it has been taught. R. Simeon B. Judah says in the name of R. Simeon, an animal too young for sacrifice may enter the shed to be tithed, and it is on a PAR. With a firstborn, just as a firstborn is holy before its time and is sacrificed after its time, i.e., after waiting seven days. Similarly, an animal too young for sacrifice becomes holy before its time and is sacrificed after its time. A tanner recited before Rab what kind of hire may enter the shed to be tithed wherever it is given to her and then bought back from her, but is not the animal disqualified because it is bought. The questioner failed to notice that which R. C. reported in the name of R. Yohanan if one bought ten embryos which were in the insides of their mothers all of them entered the shed to be tithed Talmud, Mosbek or OP and why should not the harlot herself tithe it the reference is to a heathen harlot but does not the Beritha deal with an Israelitish harlot and let her tithe it herself this is what the Beritha informs us by implication that in the case of an Israelitish harlot the animal has not the law of hire as Abbe taught for Abbe said the hire of a heathen harlot is forbidden for the altar and a priest who has sexual relations with her is not liable to lashes for transgressing the negative precept neither shall he profane a seed among his people but the hire of an Israelitish harlot is permitted for the altar and a priest who has sexual relations with her is liable to lashes for transgressing the negative precept neither shall he profane a seed among his people the hire of a heathen harlot is forbidden for the altar because we Form an analogy between the expressions abomination mentioned in connection with a harlot and abomination mentioned in connection with forbidden relatives just as in the case of forbidden relations betrothal takes no effect so a harlot whose offering is forbidden is one in whose case betrothal takes no effect and the priest who has sexual relations with her is not liable to lashes because scripture says neither shall he profane a seed among his people the divine law says he must not profane a seed but in this case it is not his seed mission if brothers became partners though they are still bound to pay agio they are exempt from the tithe of cattle and when they become liable to tithe of cattle they are exempt from paying agio if they acquired animals the cattle from the estate they are bound to tithe them but if not they are exempt from tithing if they first divided up the estate and then again became partners they are bound to pay agio and are exempt from tithe of Cattle Gemara our rabbis taught scripture says shall be thine intimating but not that is held in partnership you might have thought that exemption applies even if one acquired the animals from the paternal estate therefore the text states shall be but is not this written in connection with the case of the firstborn if it has no bearing on the case of the firstborn since the law of the firstborn applies even in the case of the partnership because it is written and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks then apply it to the case of tithing animals said our Jeremiah sometimes they are bound to tithe and to pay agio and sometimes they are exempt from both sometimes they are bound to pay agio and are exempt from tithing the animals and sometimes they are bound to tithe the animals and are exempt from paying agio they are bound to tithe the animals and pay agio in the case where they divided the monies but not the animals they are exempt from both where they divided the Animals but not the monies they are bound to pay agio and are exempt from tithing animals where both animals and monies were divided they are bound to tithe and are exempt from paying agio where neither monies nor animals were divided is not all this obvious here Jeremiah needed to inform us of the case where the animals were divided but not the monies you might have thought that since they divided the animals they have thus shown their intention of dividing the rest and therefore they should be bound to pay agio he therefore informs us that this is not so said Arain and this is meant only when they divided kids against he goats in accordance with their value and he goats against kids in accordance with their value but where they divided kids against kids and he goats against he goats one can say this is the portion which was his from the outset but Arnaman says even if they divided kids against kids and he goats against he goats we do not say this was the part which was is at the outset and our Eliezer also says this is meant only when they divided nine large animals against ten small ones according to their value or ten small animals against nine large ones but if they divided nine animals against nine or ten animals against ten one can say this is the part which was his from the outset but our Yohanan says even if they divided nine animals against nine or ten animals against ten one does not say this is the part which was his at the outset Talmud, Mas. Bekorot A and our Yohanan follows the opinion he expressed elsewhere for RC reported in the name of our Yohanan brothers who divide an estate are considered as purchasers and return their respective parts to each other in Jubilee and it was necessary for our Yohanan to state both rulings for if he had stated only this ruling I might have said that our Yohanan only holds his view in this case because the tithing of animals is compared with thy firstborn son just as the text thy firstborn son deals with the case where you are certain so the text thine oxen and with thy sheep deals with the case where you are certain but with respect to a field only in case of a sale does the divine law say that it should return to its original owner in jubilee but not in the case of an inheritance or a present and if our Yohanan had stated his ruling with reference only to a field I might have said that in that case our Yohanan holds this opinion because it makes for greater stringency or indeed a field returns in jubilee because after returning it is like at the beginning before the division but here I might have said it is not so therefore both rulings by our Yohanan are necessary and objection was raised
Days excludes the case of an animal too young for sacrifice under the dam excludes the case of an orphan Arish male son of Aryohan and Bibarak says here it says under the rod and there it says under the dam just as there all the categories are excluded similarly here all the categories are excluded and just as here atrufa is excluded so there atrufa is excluded what is the word all meant to include in addition it includes what our rabbis taught an animal which covered a woman that was covered by a man were designated for idolatrous purposes and one actually so used or given as higher or as price of a dog a tumtum and other maphrodite all of these enter the shed to be tithed but our simian bijuda said in the name of our simian a tumtum and other maphrodite do not enter the shed to be tithed and our tana if he draws an analogy between under and under mentioned in connection with consecrated objects these also should not be tithed and if he does not infer from a case of Consecrated objects whence does he infer these one may still say that he does draw the analogy but the divine law included these because it is written because their corruption is in them and blemishes be in them they shall not be accepted for you and are Ishmael taught wherever corruption is mentioned the act of lewdness and idolatry is meant an act of lewdness because it is written in the scriptures for all flesh hath corrupted his way on the earth and idolatry because it is written lest yet corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure the likeness of a male or female and wherever a blemish disqualifies the act of lewdness and idolatry also disqualify and wherever a blemish does not disqualify the act of lewdness and idolatry do not disqualify and in the case of tithing an animal since a blemish does not disqualify because scripture writes he shall not search whether it be good or bad neither shall he change it the act of lewdness and idolatry also do not disqualify an animal for tithing the case of an animal which covers a woman or that was covered by a man come under the head of lewdness an animal designated for idolatrous purposes and one so used are cases of idolatry and one given as higher comes under the category of an act of lewdness and the price of a dog is compared with the case of the higher as regards a tumtum and other he holds that there exists a doubt in each case our simian bijuda says etc he holds that a tumtum and other maphrodite are of doubtful sex now in the case of consecrated objects the divine law restricted the offering to an undisputed male and an undisputed female prohibiting a tumtum or other maphrodite and with regard also to the tithing of animals we form an analogy between under and under mentioned in connection with consecrated objects our rabbis have taught all lambs enter the shed to be tithed except kilayim and trifa. these are the words of our Eliezer bijuda a man of far Part Otha who reported this in the name of our Joshua said our Akiba I have heard from him that this applies also to offspring which came forth through the Caesarean section an animal too young for sacrifice and an orphan and the first ten our Joshua quoted above if he draws the analogy between under and under mentioned in connection with consecrated objects these two which are added by our Akiba should not be tithed and if he does not make the analogy we can indeed understand why Trifa is not tithed because scripture says all that shall pass under the rod thus excluding the case of Trifa which does not pass but with regard to Kilim whence does he prove this one may still say that the first ten draws the analogy mentioned and in respect of offspring brought forth by means of the Caesarean section Talmud Mosbek or he holds with the view of our Simeon who said offspring brought forth by means of the Caesarean section is a genuine offspring and not with the opinion of our Yohanan with respect to an animal too young to sacrifice he agrees with the view of our Simeon Bijuda as regards an orphan he assumes e.g. that the hide is still intact and our Joshua follows the opinion he expressed elsewhere even if the mother has been killed but the hide is still intact it is not an orphan animal our Ishmael B. Sathriel of Arkath Lubna testified before Rabbi in our place we stripped the hide from the dead dam and put it on the living offspring said Rabbi the reason of our mission is now revealed he further testified the lettuces in our place have 600,000 peelings of small leaves around their core once a certain cedar tree fell in our place and 16 wagons alongside each other passed its width once the egg of the bar Yohani fell and its contents swamped 16 cities and destroyed 300 cedar trees but does it actually throw the egg is it not written the wing of the ostrich beat joyously the egg which it smashed was a rotten one. Mishnah, there are three periods for the tithe of cattle in the prayers of Passover, in the prayers of Pentecost, and in the prayers of Tabernacles. These are the words of our Akiba Ben says on the 29th of Adar, on the 1st of Sivan, and on the 29th of Bar Eliezer, and our Simeon say on the 1st of Nisan, on the 1st of Sivan, and on the 29th of Elul. And why did they say the 29th of Elul and not the 1st of Tishri? Because it is a holy day and you cannot tithe on a holy day. Consequently, the rabbis fixed it earlier for the 29th of Elul. Our Meir says the 1st of Elul is the new year for the tithe of cattle. Ben Ezay says those born in Elul are tithed by themselves. All those born from the 1st of Tishri until the 29th of Elul combine to enter into one shed. Five lambs born before Rosh Hashanah and five born after Rosh Hashanah do not combine, but five lambs born before the period of tithing and five after the period of tithing do combine to. Enter one shed for tithing. If so, why did they speak of three periods for the tithe of cattle? It is for the purpose of informing us that until the arrival of the tithing period, it is permitted to sell and kill the animals. But when the period has arrived, he must not kill. Though if he killed, he is not culpable. Gemara, what reason is there for these three periods? Said Rabbi Bishila, corresponding to the three periods when animals give birth, some give birth early in the season, some late in the season, and some in the summer. And why are the lambs tithed in these particular times? Said Artanham, son of Arhaya, man of Farako Talmud, Mosbek wrote in order that animals may be easily obtained by the pilgrims. And although we have learned in the mission until the arrival of the tithing period, it is permitted to sell and kill animal for food. A man likes to perform a religious duty with his money first, and only then to proceed to sell or eat the animals. And why does? The Mishnah called the cattle tithing period threshing floor because the approach of the tithing period makes the animals table according to a rabbinical enactment like the period of the threshing floor and what is the period of Paris mentioned in the Mishnah our Jose B. Judah explained Paris is a period of no less than 15 days how is this implied said our Abbe Paris means a half half of what half of the period of instruction in the laws of the Passover in accordance with what was taught the laws of the Passover are discussed and expounded 30 days before Passover our Simeon B. Gamaliel says the period is two weeks Ben Eze says in the 29th of Adar in the first of Sivan wherein do our Akiva and Ben Eze differ our Akiva holds that the month of Adar which is next to Nisan is sometimes full i.e. 30 days sometimes defective i.e. 29 days so that sometimes the Paris of Passover falls on the 30th of Adar and sometimes it falls on the 29th. Of Adar and for this reason he does not fix the time for the Paris but Ben Eze holds that the month of Adar which is next to Nisan is always defective consequently he fixes the time for the Paris on the 29th of Adar and the reason why he fixes the first of Sivan is that since animals are not plentiful if you therefore say that he should tithe earlier by the time the festival arrives he will have finished eating them the animals on the 29th day of Abed, etc. Ben Eze follows the opinion he expresses when he says those born in Elul are tithed by themselves and why not tithe them on the 30th of Abed, sometimes the month of Abed is defective i.e. 29 days and we need to make a distinction between the new and the old our Eliezer and our Simeon say on the first of Nisan on the first of Sivan etc. on the first of Nisan in accordance with the opinion of our Simeon B. Gamaliel who said two weeks on the first of Sivan as we have explained above on the 29th of Elul. Because our Eliezer and our Simeon follow the opinion they express elsewhere where they say the first of Tishri is the new year for the tithing of animals and why did the rabbis say the 29th of Elul and not the first of Tishri because it is a holy day etc. And why not say that the reason is because we need to make a distinction between the new and the old the Mishnah gives one reason and yet another one reason is because we need to make a distinction between the new and the old and yet another reason is because it is a holy day and you cannot tithe on a holy day on account of the required marking of the tenth animal with paint. Our Meir says the first of Elul is the new year for the tithing of animals. Ben Eze says etc. It has been taught said Ben Eze since some hold the one opinion and others the other therefore the animals born in Elul are tithed by themselves and why not see which authority holds the more reasonable opinion and should you say that he Ben E
before the tithing period and five after the tithing period do combine Sanraba according to the opinion of Ben Azay if five were born to him in a five in Elul and five in Tishri he brings them into a shed to be tithed Talmud, Mas Bek or Opi, he can also take one from those born in Elul and the rest are exempt in any case for if the first of Elul is the new year for cattle tithe the animals of Elul and Tishri combine to enter one shed and those of Ab are exempt and if the first of Tishri is the new year the animals of Ab and Elul combine and those of Tishri are exempt you will perhaps argue against this that those five of Tishri should be combined with those born in a subsequent tithing period the divine law however refers to a sure tent and not to a doubtful tent but is not this obvious you might have said that we ought to enact a prohibition lest he should come to take from these Rabba therefore informs us that we have no such fear of this mission how do we Tithe animals we bring them to a shed and make for them a small opening so that two shall not be able to go out at the same time and we count with the rod 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and he marks every tenth lamb that goes out and says this is a tithe if he failed to mark it did not count them the lambs with the rod or if he counted them while they were crouching or standing they are still considered tithe if he had 100 lambs and he took 10 or if he had 10. And he took one this is not valid tithe but our Jose B. Judah says this is valid tithe if one of the lambs already counted leaped among the flock in the shed they are all exempt if one of them that was marked as tithe leaped among the flock in the shed they all go to pasture until they become unfit for sacrifice and the owners may eat them in their unfit state tomorrow our rabbis taught how does he tithe animals he brings them into a shed and makes for them a small opening so that two may not go out at the same time he also places their mothers outside the shed while the offspring are inside so that the mothers low and the offspring go out to meet their mothers but let him bring them out himself scripture says shall pass intimating that he must not cause them to pass but let him throw them some green herb outside so as to induce them to go out said our this was prohibited on account of an animal bought or orphaned our rabbis taught scripture says even of whatsoever pass it under the rod this excludes a trifle which is unable physically to pass under the rod it is a duty to count them with the rod if however he did not count them with the rod or if he counted them while they were crouching or standing once do we infer that the tithing is valid the text states the tenth shall be holy in any case i have here mentioned only that the tenth animal is holy when he calls it the tenth whence is it derived that it is holy even if he did not call it the tenth Scripture says it shall be holy intimating that it is holy in any case you might think that if he had a hundred lambs and he took ten at the same time as the tithe or if he had ten lambs and he took one as the tithe they are redeemed the text states the tenth and this is not the tenth but our Jose son of our Judah says such is valid tithe what is the reason of our Jose son of our Judah he agrees with Abba Eliezer Begomel for it was taught Abba Eliezer Begomel says scripture says and this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor scripture speaks of two kinds of teramah one that of teramah gadola and the other the teramah of the tithe just as teramah gadola may be set apart for the priest by estimating without measuring the quantity and by merely mentally planning the separation talmud mas bekorot the talmud mas bekorot similarly the teramah of the tithe may be set apart by estimating without measuring the Quantity and by merely mentally planning the separation and we find that tithe is called by the divine law Teramah because it is written but the tithes of the children of Israel which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord I have given to the Levites to inherit and the tithing of animals is also compared to the tithing of grain just as the tithe of grain is set apart by estimating without measuring the quantity and by merely planning the separation similarly the tithing of animals may be set aside by estimating and by merely planning the separation said Rabbah the tenth is holy of its own accord whence does Rabbah know this shall I say from what was taught I have here mentioned only that the tenth animal is holy when he calls it the tenth whence is it derived that it is holy even if he did not call it the tenth the text states it shall be holy intimating that in any case it is holy but perhaps it means that he did not call it the tenth but still called it Holy rather Rabbah derives his ruling from what has been taught if he called the ninth the tenth and when the tenth came out he said nothing the ninth is eaten only if blemished and the tenth is the tithe perhaps it is different here for it was made quite clear that it was the tenth or indeed the barrier refers to a case where he indicated that it should be the tithe rather he derives his ruling from what has been taught if he called the ninth the tenth and the tenth died in the shed. The ninth is eaten only if blemished and all are exempt now why are they all exempt is it not because the tenth is sacred perhaps the reason is because they became exempt by means of the interrupted count properly begun for Rabbah said account properly begun exempts rather Rabbah derives his ruling from what has been taught if he called the ninth the tenth and the tenth remained in the shed the ninth is eaten only if it is blemished and the tenth is the tithe but has it not been taught it? Ninth is Holland secular Tanner recited before our Shishay whose opinion is this it is that of Arsimian Bijuda for it was taught Arsimian Bijuda reported in the name of Arsimian Talmud, Mas Bekorot B the ninth also is not sacred except when the name of the tenth was eliminated therefrom and it is a proper conclusion for if the eleventh animal possesses sufficient holiness to be sacrificed and is yet not holy except when the name of the tenth has been eliminated therefrom it surely follows that in the case of the ninth which does not possess sufficient holiness to be sacrificed if the name of the tenth is eliminated therefrom it is holy but if not it is not holy at all but on the contrary it is thus that we should argue the eleventh is capable of becoming holy enough to be sacrificed if therefore the name of the tenth has been eliminated therefrom it should require this holiness but if not not but the ninth is not capable of becoming holy enough to be sacrificed. Hence it should become holy even if the name of the tenth has not been eliminated therefrom or perhaps we can argue seeing that the eleventh is not reached till the tenth has already established itself as the tithe and if the name of the tenth was eliminated therefrom the eleventh becomes holy but if not not whereas the ninth which comes before the tenth has established itself as the tithe is holy even if the tenth has not been eliminated therefrom and there is nothing more to be said. Against it said Rabbi account properly begun redeems whence does Rabbi derive this shall I say from what we have learned if one of the lambs already counted leaped in among the flock in the shed they are all exempt now how are the lambs already counted exempt is it not by means of the count properly begun but perhaps they had been already tithed this you cannot say for does it not state if one of those already tithed leaped in among the flock but perhaps the phrase one of those already Tithe refers to one actually set aside as tithe I can also prove it for it says let them go to pasture Rabbah thereupon said my proof is as follows scripture says shall pass intimating but not that which has already passed now what does but not that which has already passed mean if it means those already tithe is there any need to say this it must refer to those exempted because of account properly begun it stands proved it has been taught in accordance with the ruling of Rabbah if he had ten lambs and he led them into a shed and after he had counted five one of them died if the one which died was of those already counted he counts and combines them with others but if the one which died was not of those yet counted the counted ones are exempt but those not yet counted combine with others born in a later tithing period Rabbah further said if he had fourteen lambs and he led them into a shed six first passing through one door four through another door and four remaining therein the shed if these four eventually pass through the same door as the six he takes one of them as tithe and the rest combine in one shed with those born in a later tithing period but if not the six are exempt and the four together with the other four combine with those born in a later tithing period if four pass through this door first and six through another door four remaining there in the shed if the four eventually pass through the same door which the six had passed through he takes one as tithe and the rest are exempt and if not the first four and the six are exempt and the last four combine with those born in a later tithing period if four pass through this door and four through another door six remaining there in the shed if the remaining six pass through the door of one of them he takes one as tithe and the rest are exempt and if not the first four and the second four are exempt and the remaining six combine with those born in a later tithing Period what does he Rabbah teach us that accounting properly begun exempts but has not Rabbah already taught us this ruling you might have said that we apply the principle that accounting properly begun exempts where it is certain that there is a proper number but where it is uncertain whether there is a proper number seeing that it is possible to combine the six either here or there we do not apply this ruling he Rabbah
rendered holy by the actual number of the animals Arnaman B. Isaac said the mother of Arhuna B. Sihara was privileged to have a son who explained Rabba's ruling on the Sabbath previous to a festival in line with Rabba's teaching Mishnah. If two lambs came forth at the same time, he counts them in peers. If he counted the two as one, the ninth and the tenth are spoiled. If the ninth and the tenth came out at the same time, the ninth and the tenth are spoiled. If he called the ninth, the tenth, the tenth, the ninth, and the eleventh, the tenth, the three are holy. The ninth is eaten while blemished. The tenth is the tithe, and the eleventh is sacrificed as a peace offering, and it can effect a substitute. These are the words of Armaiyur said Arjuna can that one substitute effect another substitute. They said in the name of Armaiyur, if it were a substitute, it would not have been sacrificed. If he called the ninth, the tenth, the tenth, the tenth, and the eleventh, the tenth, the eleventh is not consecrated. The following is the rule wherever the name of the tenth animal has not been eliminated therefrom the eleventh is not consecrated Gamara said Aryuhan and if he counted the lambs in peers or in hundreds the tenth in his counting becomes holy and what counting Armari says the holiness of the tenth is determined by his counting whereas Arkahana says the holiness of the tenth is determined by the actual number of animals we have learned if two came out at the same time he counts them in peers if he counted the two as one the ninth and the tenth are spoiled now there is no difficulty according to him who holds the holiness of the tenth is determined by his counting for this reason the ninth and the tenth are spoiled and he calls the tenth the ninth and the eleventh the tenth but according to him who holds that the holiness of the tenth is determined by the actual number of the animals it is as if he called the certain ninth the ninth and the certain tenth the tenth Aryuhan and can. Reply thus I only say that the holiness of the tenth is determined by the counting of the animals where he planned to bring them out in peers but whereas in the mission they came out of the shed of themselves it is not so common here if he counted them backwards the tenth of the counting is holy now I grant that according to him who holds that the holiness of the tenth is determined by the actual number of the animals there would be no difficulty but according to him who holds that the holiness of the tenth is determined by his counting then he calls the tenth the first said Rabba the reason is because it so happens that in the Persian system of counting that they call ten one Talmud, Mosbek wrote B if he called the ninth the tenth the tenth the ninth and the eleventh the tenth etc our rabbis taught once do we know that if he called the ninth the tenth the tenth the ninth and the eleventh the tenth the three are consecrated the text states and concerning the tithe of it. Heard or of the flock even of whatsoever passeth under the rod the tenth shall be holy thus including all one might have thought that I include also the eighth and the twelfth against this you can argue thus since the tenth is holy and the animal he by mistake called the tenth is consecrated just as the tenth is only consecrated when it is next to it similarly the animals he by mistake called the tenth must be next to it but has it not been taught just as the tenth can only be one similarly the animal called by mistake the tenth can only be one eight and recited before our Yohanan this very though will represent the opinion of our Eliezer B. Simeon for it has been taught our Eliezer B. Simeon says the eleventh is holy only when he is silent at the ninth calls the tenth the ninth and the eleventh the tenth here Eliezer concurs with Arjuta who said a mistake in counting the animal for tithes renders the animal style tenth as a substitute and he also holds the opinion of his father Arsimian who said no substitute can affect another substitute said Rabbi if two came out of the shed at the ninth and he called them the ninth the tenth and Holland are mixed together the tenth is sacred on its own accord and the ninth is Holland because he called it the ninth if he called them the tenth the tenth and the ninth are mixed together what is the reason because he called them both the tenth if two came out of the shed at the tenth and he called them the tenth the tenth and the eleventh are mixed together if he called them the eleventh the tenth and Holland are mixed together what need is there for Rabbi to give this additional ruling is it not the same he informs us of this that wherever they came out at the same time and he called them the tenth they are consecrated although the name of the tenth was not eliminated therefom Arkahana sat and was stating this tradition said Arashi to Arkahana but the name of the tenth has not been eliminated therefrom. And we have learned the following is the rule wherever the name of the tenth has not been eliminated therefrom the eleventh is not consecrated this is the case only when the lambs came out one after the other but where they came out simultaneously both are holy but is not the case where he called the tenth and the eleventh one after the other the tenth explicitly stated if he called the ninth the tenth the tenth the tenth and the eleventh the tenth the eleventh is not consecrated now what does the statement the following is the rule include does it not include the case where he called the tenth and the eleventh simultaneously the tenth no it includes the case where the tenth came out and he did not say anything for here the name of the tenth was not eliminated therefrom for if you will not agree to this one of this which has been taught if two came out at the tenth one not preceding the other and he called them the tenth the tenth and eleventh are mixed together his tithe and a peace offering now why is the seeing that the name of the tenth has not been here eliminated therefrom must not we say therefore that wherever both came out of the shed at the same time they are consecrated were it only for this there would be no proof because the case here is where one put forth its head before the other and he called it the eleventh and subsequently it mixed with the others and two animals came out together and he called them the tenth the name of the tenth having thus been eliminated therefrom but does not the very the state above one not preceding the other the phrase one not preceding the other means that it afterwards mixed with the others and whose opinion does this represent not that of rabbi for if that of rabbi does he not say the calling of the eleventh before the tenth is not considered as eliminating the name of the tenth you may even say that this represents the opinion of rabbi for rabbi's ruling refers only to a case where he has Many animals to tie for then we say that he means one group of ten but here we are referring to a case where he has no more animals what is this ruling of rabbi as it has been taught if he called the tenth the eleventh and the eleventh the tenth the eleventh is not sacred there are the words of rabbi our Jose son of Arjuna says the eleventh is sacred rabbi stated a rule so long as the name of the tenth has not been eliminated therefrom the eleventh is not holy but has not the name of it. Tenth been eliminated said rabbi what are the circumstances here where he has many animals and we say that he means one tenth it has been said if two came out at the tenth one bury the teachers let them pasture and another bury the teachers let them be offered up and yet another teachers let them be left to die there is no contradiction here the one which says let them pasture gives the opinion of the rabbis who say we must not willingly cause sacred flesh to be brought to the place where the unfit are burnt Talmud, Mosbek or A and the one who says let them be offered up represents the opinion of our Simeon who says we may cause sacred flesh to be brought to the place where the unfit are burnt the one who says let them be left to die gives the opinion of Arjuna who says a mistake in counting four tithes renders the tenth animal as a substitute and Arjuna further holds that which has been made a substitute for an animal set aside as tithe must be allowed to perish. But does Arjuna hold that that which is made a substitute for an animal set aside as tithe must be allowed to perish have we not learned they said in the name of Armaiyur if it were a substitute it would not have been sacrificed thus implying that Arjuna holds that it is sacrificed and should you say that Armaiyur says this in accordance with his own opinion has it not been taught the only difference between the eleventh called by mistake the tenth and an actual peace offering is that the Latter confers the degree of consecration required for an offering whereas the former does not confer the degree of consecration required for an offering these are the words of Arjuna thus it cannot affect a consecration for another animal to be offered up but as far as the animal itself is concerned the eleventh called by mistake the tenth can be offered up according to Arjuna moreover it has been taught scripture says if he offer it of the herd this includes the eleventh as a peace offering you might think that I include also the ninth as a peace offering against this argue thus does it is consecrated an unblemished animal of Holland which comes before it or the one which comes after it you must admit that it consecrates only the one coming after it now whose opinion does an anonymous view and cipher represent is it not that of Arjuna and yet it says if he offer of the herd includes the eleventh as a peace offering rather explained our Simeon B.R. Abel before our Yohanan it refers to tithing in our days and for fear that an offense might be committed if this be the case why does the Beritha speak of two since the same ruling applies also to one the Beritha above gives a particularly strong instance not only in the case of one where there is not much loss but even in the case of two lambs where I might have said that since there is much loss we should keep them